Babushka by Adelaide Skeel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Babushka If you were a Russian child, you would not watch to see Santa Claus come down the chimney, but you would stand by the windows to catch a peep at poor Babushka as she hurries by. Who is Babushka? Is she Santa Claus's wife? No, indeed. She is only a poor little crooked, wrinkled old woman who comes at Christmas time into everybody's house, who peeps into every cradle, turns back every coverlid, drops a tear on the baby's white pillow, and goes away very sorrowful. And not only at Christmas time, but through all the cold winter, and especially in March when the wind blows loud and whistles and howls and dies away like a sigh, the Russian children hear the rustling step of the babushka. She's always in a hurry. One hears her running fast along crowded streets and over quiet country fields. She seems to be out of breath and tired, and yet she hurries on. Whom is she trying to overtake? She scarcely looks at the little children as they press their rosy faces against the window pane and whisper to each other, Is the babushka looking for us? No, she will not stop. Only on Christmas Eve will she come upstairs into the nursery and give each little one a present. You must not think she leaves handsome gifts such as Santa Claus brings for you. She does not bring bicycles to the boys or French dolls to the girls. She does not come in a gay little sleigh drawn by reindeer, but hobbling along on foot, and she leans on a crutch. She has her old apron filled with candy and cheap toys, and the children all love her dearly. They watch to see her come, and when one hears a rustling, he cries, Lou, the babushka, then all the others look but one must turn one's head very quickly, or she vanishes. I never saw her myself. Best of all, she loves little babies, and often, when the tired mothers sleep, she bends over their cradles, puts her brown, wrinkled face down close to the pillow, and looks very sharply. What is she looking for? Ah, that you can't guess unless you know her sad story. Long, long ago, a great many yesterdays ago, the babushka, who was even then an old woman, was busy sweeping her little hut. She lived in the coldest corner of cold Russia, and she lived alone in a lonely place where four wide roads met. These roads were at this time white with snow, for it was winter time. In the summer, when the fields were full of flowers and the air full of sunshine and singing birds, Babushka's home did not seem so very quiet. But in the winter, with only the snowflakes and the shy snowbirds and the loud wind for company, the little old woman felt very cheerless. But she was a busy old woman, and as it was already twilight and her home but half swept, she felt in a great hurry to finish her work before bedtime. You must know the babushka was poor and could not afford to do her work by candlelight. Presently, down the widest and the lonesomest of the white roads, there appeared a long train of people coming. They were walking slowly and seemed to be asking each other questions as to which way they should take. As the procession came nearer and finally stopped outside her little hut, Babushka was frightened at the splendor. There were three kings, with crowns on their heads, and the jewels on the king's breastplates sparkled like sunlight. Their heavy fur cloaks were white with the falling snowflakes, and the queer humpy camels on which they rode looked white as milk in the snowstorm. The harness on the camels was decorated with gold, and plates of silver adorned the saddles. The saddle-cloths were of the richest eastern stuffs, and all the servants had the dark eyes and hair of an eastern people. The slaves carried heavy loads on their backs, and each of the three kings carried a present. 
one carried a beautiful transparent jar, and in the fading light Babushka could see in it a golden liquid, which she knew from its color must be myrrh. Another had in his hand a richly woven bag, and it seemed to be heavy, as indeed it was, for it was full of gold. The third had a stone vase in his hand, and from the rich perfume which filled the snowy air, one could guess that vase to have been filled with incense. Babushka was terribly frightened, so she hid herself in her hut, and let the servants knock a long time at her door before she dared to open it and answer their questions as to what road they should take to some faraway town. You know she had never studied a geography lesson in her life. She was old and stupid and scared. She knew the way across the fields to the nearest village, but she knew nothing else of all the wide world full of cities. The servants scolded, but the three kings spoke kindly to her, and asked her to accompany them on their journey, that she might show them the way as far as she knew it. They told her, in words so simple that she could not fail to understand, that they had seen a star in the sky, and they were following it to a little town where a young child lay. The snow was in the sky now, and the star was lost out of their sight. "'Who is the child?' asked the old woman. "'He is a king, and we go to worship him,' they answered. "'These presents of gold, frankincense, and myrrh are for him. "'When we find him, we will take the crowns off our heads and lay them at his feet. "'Come with us, Babushka.' What do you suppose? Shouldn't you have thought the poor little woman would have been glad to leave her desolate home on the plains to accompany these kings on their journey? But the foolish woman shook her head. No, the night was dark and cheerless, and her little home was warm and cozy. She looked up into the sky, and the star was nowhere to be seen. Besides, she wanted to put her hut in order. Perhaps she would be ready to go tomorrow. But the three kings could not wait. So when tomorrow's sun rose, they were far ahead on their journey. It seemed like a dream to poor Babushka, for even the tracks of the camel's feet were covered by the deep white snow. Everything was the same as usual. And to make sure that the night's visitors had not been a fancy, she found her old broom hanging on a peg behind the door, where she had put it when the servants knocked. Now that the sun was shining, and she remembered the glitter of the gold and the smell of the sweet gums and the myrrh, she wished she had gone with the travelers. And she thought a great deal about the little baby the three kings had gone to worship. She had no children of her own. Nobody loved her. Ah, uh, if only she had gone. The more she brooded on the thought, the more miserable she grew till the very sight of her home became hateful to her. It is a dreadful feeling to realize that one has lost a chance of happiness. There is a feeling called remorse that can gnaw like a sharp little tooth. Babushka felt this little tooth cut into her heart every time she remembered the visit of the three kings. After a while, the thought of that little child became her first thought at waking, and her last at night. One day she shut the door of her house forever, and set out on a long journey. She had no hope of overtaking the three kings, but she longed to find the child, that she too might love and worship him. She asked everyone she met, and some people thought her crazy, but others gave her kind answers. Have you perhaps guessed that the young child whom the three kings sought was our Lord himself? People told Babushka how he was born in a manger and many other things which you children have learned long ago. These answers puzzled the old dame mightily. She had but one idea in her ignorant head. The three kings had gone to seek a baby. She would, if not too late, seek him too. She'd forgot, I'm sure, how many long years had gone by. She looked in vain for the Christ-child in his manger cradle. 
she spent all her little savings on toys and candy, so as to make friends with little children that they might not run away when she came hobbling into their nurseries. Now you know for whom she is sadly seeking when she pushes back the bed curtains and bends down over each baby's pillow. Sometimes, when the old grandmother sits nodding by the fire and the bigger children sleep in their beds, old Babushka comes hobbling into the room and whispers softly, Is the young child here? Ah, no. She has come too late, too late. But the little children know and love her. Two thousand years ago she lost the chance of finding him. Crooked, wrinkled, old, sick, and sorry, she yet lives on, looking into each baby's face, always disappointed, always seeking. Will she find him at last? End of Babushka by Adelaide Skeel Recording by Maria Casper Barring Out at Schools Reprinted in A Right Merry Christmas The Story of Christtide by John Ashton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Michael Maggs Barring Out at Schools a curious custom used to obtain in some schools just before the Christmas holidays of barring out the master and keeping him out of the schoolroom until the boy's grievances had been listened to and promise of redress given. And the best account of this custom that I have ever met with is in the Gentleman's Magazine for 1828, volume 2, page 404, etc. It was a few days before the usual period of the Christmas holidays arrived, when the leading scholars of the head form determined on reviving the ancient but obsolete custom of barring out the master of the school. Many years had elapsed since the attempt had succeeded, and many times since that period it had been made in vain. The scholars had heard of glorious feats of their forefathers in their boyish years, when they had set the lash of the master at defiance for days together. Now, alas, all was changed. The master, in the opinion of the boys, reigned a despot absolute and uncontrolled. The merciless cruelty of his rod and the heaviness of his tasks were insupportable. The accustomed holidays had been rescinded, the usual Christmas feast reduced to a non-entity, and the chartered rights of the scholars were continually violated. These grievances were discussed seriatim, and we were all unanimously of opinion that our wrongs should, if possible, be redressed. But how the object should be effected was a momentous and weighty affair. The master was a clergyman of the old school, who for the last forty years had exercised an authority hitherto uncontrolled, and who had no idea of enforcing scholastic discipline without the exercise of the whip. The consequences of a failure were terrible to think upon, but then the anticipation of success and the glory attendant upon the enterprise, if successful, were sufficient to dispel every fear. At the head of the Greek class was one whose very soul seemed formed for the most daring attempts. He communicated his intentions to a chosen few, of which the writer was one, and offered to be the leader of the undertaking if we would promise him our support. We hesitated, but he represented the certainty of success with such feeling eloquence that he entirely subdued our opposition. He stated that Addison had acquired immortal fame by a similar enterprise, he told us that almost every effort in the sacred cause of freedom had succeeded. He appealed to our classical recollections. Epaminondas and Leonidas were worthy of our example. Tarquin and Caesar, as tyrants, had fallen before the united efforts of freedom. We only had to be unanimous, and the rod of this scholastic despot would be for ever broken. 
We then entered enthusiastically into his views. He observed that delays were dangerous. The barring out, he said, should take place the very next morning to prevent the possibility of being betrayed. On a previous occasion, he said, some officious little urchin had told the master the whole plot, several days having been allowed to intervene between the planning of the project and its execution, and, to the astonishment of the boys, it appeared they found the master at his desk two hours before his usual time, and had the mortification of being congratulated on their early attendance, with an order to be there every morning at the same hour. To prevent the occurrence of such a defeat, we determined on organising our plans that very night. The boys were accordingly told to assemble after school hours at a well-known tombstone in the neighbouring churchyard, as something of importance was under consideration. The place of meeting was an elevated parallelogram tombstone, which had always served as a kind of council table to settle our little disputes as well as parties of pleasure. Here we all assembled at the appointed time. Our leader took his stand at one end of the stone, with the head boys who were in the secret on each side of him. My boys, he laconically observed, tomorrow morning we are to bar out the flogging parson and make him promise that he will not flog us hereafter without a cause, nor set us long tasks or deprive us of our holidays. The boys of the Greek form will be your captains, and I am to be your captain general. Those that are cowards are better retire and be satisfied with future floggings, but you, who have courage, and know what it is to have been flogged for nothing, come here and sign your names. He immediately pulled out a pen and sheet of paper, and, having tied some bits of thread round the finger ends of two or three boys, with a pin he drew blood to answer for ink, and to give more solemnity to the act. He signed first, the captains next, and the rest in succession. Many of the lesser boys slunk away during the ceremony, but on counting the names we mustered upwards of forty. Sufficient, it was imagined, even to carry the school by storm. The Captain General then addressed us. I have the keys of the school, and shall be there at seven o'clock. The old parson will arrive at nine, and every one of you must be there before eight to allow us one hour for barricading the doors and windows. Bring with you as much provision as you can, and tell your parents that you have to take your dinners in school. Let every one of you have some weapon of defence. Those who cannot obtain a sword, pistol, or poker must bring a stick or cudgel. Now, all go home directly and be sure to arrive early in the morning. Perhaps a more restless and anxious night was never passed by young recruits on the eve of a general battle. Many of us rose some hours before the time, and at seven o'clock, when the school door was opened, there was a tolerably numerous muster. Our captain immediately ordered candles to be lighted and a rousing fire to be made, for it was a dark December's morning. He then began to examine the store of provisions and the arms which each had brought. In the meantime, the arrival of every boy with additional material was announced by tremendous cheers. At length, the church clock struck eight. "'Proceed to barricade the doors and windows,' exclaimed the captain, "'or the old lion will be upon us before we are prepared to meet him.' In an instant the old oaken door rang on its heavy hinges. Some, with hammers, gimlets, and nails, were eagerly securing the windows, while others were dragging along the ponderous desks, forms, and everything portable to blockade, with certain security, every place which might admit of ingress. This operation being completed, the captain mounted the master's rostrum and called over the list of names, when he found only two or three missing. He then proceeded to classify them into divisions, or companies of six, and assigned to each its respective captain. 
he prescribed the duties of each company. Two were to guard the large casement windows, where it was expected the first attack would be made. This was considered a post of honour, and consequently the strongest boys with the most formidable weapons were selected, whom we called grenadiers. Another company, whom we considered as the light infantry, or sharpshooters, were ordered to mount a large desk at the centre of the school, and, armed with squibs, crackers, and various missiles, they were to attack the enemy over the heads of the combatants. The other divisions were to guard the back windows and door, and to act according to the emergency of the moment. Our leader then moved some resolutions, which, in imitation of Brutus, he had cogitated during the previous night, to the effect that each individual should implicitly obey his own captain, and that each captain should follow the orders of the captain-general, and that a corps de reserve should be stationed in the rear to enforce this obedience and prevent the competence from taking to flight. The resolutions were passed amid loud vociferations. We next commenced an examination of the various weapons, and found them to consist of one old blunderbuss, one pistol, two old swords, a few rusty pokers, and sticks, stones, squibs, and gunpowder in abundance. The firearms were immediately loaded with blank powder, the swords were sharpened, and the pokers heated in the fire. These weapons were assigned to the most daring company, who had to protect the principal window. The missiles were for the light infantry, and the rest were all armed with sticks. We now began to manoeuvre our companies by marching them into line and column, so that every one might know his own situation. In the midst of this preparation, the sentinel, whom we had placed at the window, loudly vociferated, The parson! The parson's coming! In an instant, all was confusion. Everyone ran he knew not where, as if eager to fly or screen himself from observation. Our captain immediately mounted to a form, and called to the captains of the two leading companies to take their stations. They immediately obeyed, and the other companies followed their example, though they found it much more difficult to manoeuvre when danger approached than they had a few minutes before. The well-known footstep, which had often struck on our ears with terror, was now heard to advance along the portico. The muttering of his stern voice sounded in our ears like a lion's growl. A death-like silence prevailed. We scarcely dared to breathe. The palpitations of our little hearts could, perhaps, alone be heard. The object of our dread then went round to the front window for the purpose of ascertaining whether any one was in the school. Every footstep struck us with awe. Not a word, not a whisper was heard. He approached close to the window, and with an astonished countenance stood gazing upon us, while we were ranged in battle array, motionless statues, and as silent as the tomb. "'What is the meaning of this?' he impatiently exclaimed. But no answer could he obtain, for who would then have dared to render himself conspicuous by a reply? Pallid countenances and livid lips betrayed our fears. The courage, which one hour before was ready to brave every danger, appeared to be fled. Every one seemed anxious to conceal himself from view, and there would certainly have been a general flight through the back windows had it not been for the prudent regulation of a corps de reserve, armed with cudgels, to prevent it. "'You young scoundrels, open the door instantly!' he again exclaimed, and, what added to our indescribable horror, in a fit of rage he dashed his hand through the window, which consisted of diamond-shaped panes, and appeared as if determined to force his way in. Fear and trepidation, attended by an increasing emotion, now possessed us all. 
At this critical moment, every eye turned to our captain, as if to reproach him for having brought us into this terrible dilemma. He alone stood unmoved, but he saw that none would have the courage to obey his commands. Some exciting stimulus was necessary. Suddenly, waving his hand, he exclaimed aloud, Three cheers for the barring out, and success to our cause! The cheers were tremendous. Our courage revived, the blood flushed in our cheeks, the parson was breaking in, the moment was critical. Our captain, undaunted, sprang to the fireplace, seized a heated poker in one hand and a blazing torch in the other. The latter he gave to the captain of the sharpshooters and told him to prepare a folly. When, with red-hot poker, he fearlessly advanced to the window seat and, daring the master to enter, he ordered an attack. And an attack indeed was made sufficiently tremendous to have repelled a more powerful assailant. The missiles flew at the ill-fated window from every quarter. The blunderbuss and the pistol were fired, squibs and crackers, inkstands and rulers, stones and even burning coals came in showers about the casement, and broke some of the panes into a thousand pieces, while blazing torches, heated pokers and sticks stood bristling under the window. The whole was scarcely the work of a minute. The astonished master reeled back in dumb amazement. He had, evidently, been struck with a missile or with the broken glass, and probably fancied that he had been wounded by the firearms. The schools now rang with shouts of victory and continued cheering. The enemy again approaches, cried the captain. Fire another folly! Stay! He seeks a parley! Hear him! What is the meaning, I say, of this horrid tumult? The barring out! The barring out! A dozen voices instantly exclaimed. For shame, says he, in a tone evidently subdued. What disgrace are you bringing upon yourselves and the schools? What will the trustees, what will your parents say? William, continued he, addressing the captain, open the door without further delay. I will, sir, he replied, on your promising to pardon us and give us our lawful holidays, of which we have lately been deprived, and not set us tasks during the holidays. Yes, yes, said several squealing voices, that is what we want, and not to be flogged for nothing. "'You insolent scoundrels, you consummate young villains!' he exclaimed, choking with rage, and at the same time making a furious effort to break through the already shattered window. "'Open the door instantly, or I'll break every bone in your hides!' "'Not on those conditions,' replied our captain, with provoking coolness. "'Come on, my boys, another volley!' no sooner said than done, and with even more fury than before. Like men driven to despair, who expect no quarter on surrendering, the little urchins daringly mounted the window-seat, which was a broad old-fashioned one, and pointed the firearms and heated poker at him, whilst others advanced with the squibs and missiles. "'Come on, my lads,' said the captain. "'Let this be a Thimopoli, and I will be all Leonidas.' and indeed so daring were they that each seemed ready to emulate the Spartans of old. A master, perceiving their determined obstinacy, turned round without further remonstrance and indignantly walked away. Relieved from our terrors, we now became intoxicated with joy. The walls rang with repeated hurrahs. In the madness of enthusiasm, some of the boys began to tear up the forms, throw the books about, break the slates, locks and cupboards, and act so outrageously that the captain called them to order. Not, however, before the master's desk and drawers had been broken open, and every plaything which had been taken from the scholars returned to its owner. 
we now began to think of provisions. They were all placed on one table and dealt out in rations by the captain of each company. In the meantime, we held a council of war, as we called it, to determine on what was to be done. In a recess at the east end of the school there stood a large oak desk, black with age, whose heavy hinges had become corroded with years of rust. It was known to contain the records and endowments of the school, and, as we presumed, the regulations for the treatment of the scholars. The oldest boy had never seen its inside. Attempts, dictated by insatiable curiosity, had often been made to open it, but it was deemed impregnable. It was guarded by three immense locks, and each lock was in the possession of different persons. The wood appeared to be nearly half a foot thick, and every corner was plaited with iron. All eyes were instinctively directed to this mysterious chest. Could any means be devised for effecting an entrance, was the natural question. We all proceeded to reconnoitre. We attempted to move it, but in vain. We made some feeble efforts to force the lid. It was as firm as a block of marble. At length, one daring urchin brought from the fireplace a red-hot poker and began to bore through its sides. A universal shout was given, other pokers were brought, and to work they went. The smoke and tremendous smell which the old wood sent forth rather alarmed us. We were apprehensive that we might burn the records instead of obtaining a copy of them. This arrested our progress for a few minutes. At this critical moment, a shout was set up that the parson and a constable was coming. Down went the pokers, and, as if conscience-stricken, we were all seized with consternation. The casement window was so shattered it could easily be entered by any resolute fellow. In the desperation of the moment, we seized the desks, forms, and stools to block it up, but, in some degree, our courage had evaporated we felt reluctant to act on the offensive. The old gentleman and his attendant deliberately inspected the windows and fastenings, but, without making any attempt to enter, they retreated, for the purpose, we presumed, of obtaining additional assistance. What was now to be done? The master appeared obdurate, and we had gone too far to recede. Some proposed to drill a hole in the window seat, fill it with gunpowder, and explode it if any one attempted to enter. Others thought we had better set fire to the school sooner than surrender unconditionally. But the majority advised what was, perhaps, the most prudent resolution, to wait for another attack, and, if we saw no hopes of sustaining a longer defence, to make the best retreat we could. The affair of the barring out had now become known, and persons began to assemble round the windows, calling out that the master was coming with assistance, and saying everything to intimidate us. Many of us were completely jaded with the over-excitement we had experienced since the previous evening. The school was hot, close, and full of smoke. Some were longing for liberty and fresh air, and most of us were of opinion that we had engaged in an affair which it was impossible to accomplish. In this state we received another visit from our dreaded master. With his stick he commenced a more furious attack than before, and, observing us less turbulent, he determined to force his way in, in spite of the barricados. The younger boys thought nothing but flight and self-preservation, and the rush to the back windows became general. In the midst of this consternation, our captain exclaims, Let us not fly like cowards. If we must surrender, let the gates of the citadel be thrown open. The day is against us, but let us bravely face the enemy and march out with the honours of war. Some few had already escaped, but the rest immediately arranged themselves on each side of the school, in two extended lines, with their weapons in hand. The door was thrown open, 
the master instantly entered and passed between the two lines denouncing vengeance on us all. But as he marched in, we marched out in military order, and, giving three cheers, we dispersed into the neighbouring fields. We shortly met again, and, after a little consultation, it was determined that none of the leaders should come to school until sent for, and a free pardon given. The defection, however, was so general that no corporal punishments took place. Many of the boys did not return until after the holidays, and several of the elder ones never entered the school again. End of Barring Out at Schools, reprinted by John Ashton. Bonhomme Noel by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Bonhomme Noel. In France, as well as in every country upon which Christianity has shed its holy light, the festival of Christmas is a source of great joy to childhood, and the season has here, as elsewhere, its customs hallowed in the lapse of ages. Among these is an old domestic tradition called the Bonhomme Noel. It consists in the belief that if a shoe be put in the chimney corner, the Papa Noel, if satisfied with the conduct of his children, will during the night fill the shoe with toys, so that, in the morning, there is a grand scramble to get to the treasures, and have the first of the presents, which, by the way, is a successful incitement to early rising. The shoe, however, is only a nominal feature in the affair, for it implies any receptacle for the toys. In the illustration, some of the children have secured several presents, and others are looking in the chimney for more. The Christmas Eve billet is common in France, and in some parts, at about six o'clock in the evening, an enormous log is placed upon the fire, the burning of which was once believed to keep away pestilence from all who were seated around it, this protection extending throughout the year. Among many pleasing festal customs in France are the following. When Christmas draws near, every family in easy circumstances sends for a cask of wine and lays in a stock of southern fruits, which, as they arrive, may be seen on the quay in large quantities. In the flower market, orange branches with fruit or blossoms in elegant tubs, as also all kinds of toys for children, and laurel trees hung with various kinds of southern fruits. Rose trees in beautiful pots, etc., are set out for sale. The Christmas evening is devoted to universal joy and festivity. Every booth, cellar, coffee-house, etc., is illuminated, and the table of the poor chestnut roaster has an additional lamp. The theatres give grand ballets, the gaming-houses, balls, and supers, and the streets are crowded during the whole night with people and bands of music. That which strangers most admire, and no provincial person ever forgets, even when at the greatest distance from his country, is a sort of sacred entertainment at which the whole family is present. The relations who have been absent from each other, perhaps during the whole year, are to meet on this evening. Those who have been the greatest enemies pardon each other at Christmas. Marriages are fixed. Married pairs who have been separated are at this time again united. The shyest lover becomes eloquent, and the most coy fair one becomes kind. Every heart dilates with goodwill, love, and tenderness on Christmas evening. End of Bonhomme Noel by Anonymous The Cave of Mystery, an anonymous article for the Illustrated London News of December 1866. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Max. The Cave of Mystery. Many a time Christmas has kept pleasant state in a certain house, 
as in ten thousand other houses, great and small. This dwelling is not, according to the stereotyped phrase, a baronial hall surrounded by gardens and park-like grounds, but a modest-looking, oddly formed house, situated in a part of the great metropolis tending westward, frowned upon and seemingly squeezed out of shape by the surrounding lordly mansions. Most irregularly built, it was designed more for the convenience of its inmates than for appearance, and sure, such roominess, joined with such cosy comfort, is nowhere else to be found. Hospitality also reigns in it supreme. So, uncouth exteriors are frequently tenanted by angels who carry heaven with them wherever they go, glorifying the meanest abodes. And if ever an angel of beneficence walked the earth, the presiding genius of this house was one. To such a mind, Christmas has, of course, especial charms, and Christmas time is always looked forward to, most eagerly, by those who have the privilege of his acquaintance. At the particular party illustrated on the next page, our host discontinued the Christmas tree, which, on previous occasions, had shone so resplendently and had borne such thick hanging clusters of rich and varied fruit, substituting for it a cave of mystery. Well filled, you may be sure, with all that delights the eye, pleases the ear, or tickles the fancy of children. And he was right, for in so doing he appealed to the most vivid part of youth's nature, at any rate, if not of human nature as a whole, the yearning after the vague and mysterious. A Christmas tree is, doubtless, captivatingly beautiful to children's eyes, as, the curtain drawn aside, or the folding doors thrown open, it stands confessed in blazing brilliancy. But all is seen at once, so there is no scope for imagination, and as the tapers wax dim, some of them perhaps going out sputteringly, the branches, despoiled of their goodly fruit, look gaunt and grim and scorched, whereas a sense of mystery haunts the cave even when it has yielded up its last trinket, and dim visions of the caves of Aladdin, not Adullam, or that open sesame robber's haunt with its glittering treasures, mentioned in the famous Ali Baba's tale, throw their glamour over the prosaic present. As may be seen, the cave, a deep recess in our host's library, is brimming over with its glittering and luscious treasures. How eagerly the young ones wait the coming presents! Expectation fairly stands on tiptoe, and each bosom throbs with tumultuous joy, dashed with a certain sense of awe, as, casting furtive glances towards the cave, they tremblingly await the decision of the improvised Father Christmas, with his flowing grey beard, long robe, and slender staff, apt representative, in heart at any rate, of the veritable Christmas, whom they half believe, and half doubt, to be their host. As has been stated, the cave's treasures seem exhaustless, and, for aught one knows, are so. This much is certain. After Father Christmas had, as he thought, gathered from it the last gift, another was found. As Charlie Onslow accompanied pretty demure Bessie Grant, to whom he was engaged, in an exploring expedition behind the curtain, a keen ear might have heard the chirrup of a kiss, if, indeed, Bessie's rosy red cheeks on her return had not betrayed the fact that he had found, or stolen, a certain delicious Christmas sweetmeat. In conclusion, let us express the hope that all good boys and girls may find, during the coming Christmas parties, well-stocked caves of mystery, or, failing them, trees gleaming with lights and laden with fruits, and that all may draw prizes that suit them best, if not what they desire most, at these lotteries, and also in the lottery of life. End of The Cave of Mystery
A Christmas Eve Suit by Edward P. Rowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Like Many Waters. A Christmas Eve Suit. The Christmas holidays had come, and with them a welcome vacation for Headley Marston. Although, as yet, a briefless young lawyer, he had a case in hand which absorbed many of his thoughts. The conflicting claims of two young women in his native village on the Hudson. It must not be imagined that the young women were pressing their claims, except as they did so unconsciously, by virtue of their sex and various charms. Nevertheless, Marsden was not the first lawyer who had clients over whom midnight oil was burned they remaining unaware of the fact if not yet a constitutional attorney he was at least constitutionally one falling helplessly in love with one girl simplifies matters there are no distracting pros and cons nothing required but a concentration of faculties to win the enslaver and so achieve mastery marsden did not appear amenable to the subtle influences which blind the eyes and dethrone reason inspiring in its place an overwhelming impulse to capture a fortuitous girl because to a heated imagination she surpasses all her sex indeed he was level-headed enough to believe that he would never capture any such girl but he hoped to secure one who promised to make as good a wife as he would try to be a husband and with a fair amount of self-esteem he was conscious of imperfections Therefore, instead of fancying that any of his fair acquaintances were angels, he had deliberately, and some may think in a very cold-blooded fashion, endeavored to discover what they actually were. He had observed that a good deal of prose followed the poetry of wooing and the lunacy of the honeymoon, and he thought it might be well to criticize a little before marriage as well as after it. There were a number of charming girls in the social circle of his native town, and he had during later years made himself quite impartially agreeable to them indeed without much effort on his part he had become what is known as a general favorite he had been too diligent a student to become a society man but was ready enough in vacation periods to make the most of every country frolic and even on great occasions to rush up from the city and return at some unearthly hour in the morning when his partners in dance were not half through their dreams while on these occasions he had shared in the prevailing hilarity he nevertheless had the presentiment that some one of the laughing light-footed girls would one day pour his coffee and send him to his office in either a good or bad mood to grapple with the problems awaiting him there he had in a measure decided that when he married it should be to a girl whom he had played with in childhood and whom he knew a good deal about and not to a chance acquaintance of the world at large so beneath all his diversified gallantries he had maintained a quiet little policy of observation until his thoughts had gradually gathered around two of his young associates who unconsciously to themselves as we have said put in stronger and stronger claims every time he saw them they asserted these claims in the only way in which he would have recognized them by being more charming agreeable and as he fancied by being better than the others he had not made them aware even by manner of the distinction accorded to them and as yet he was merely a friend but the time had come he believed for definite action while he weighed and considered some prompter fellows might take the case out of his hands entirely therefore he welcomed this vacation and the opportunities it afforded the festivities began with what is termed in the country a large party and carrie mitchell and lottie waldo were both there resplendent in new gowns made for the occasion marstern thought them both charming they danced equally well and talked nonsense with much the same ease and vivacity he could not decide which was the prettier nor did the eyes and attentions of others afford him any aid they were general favorites as well as himself although it was evident that to some they might become more but they were apparently in the heyday of their girlhood and thus far had preferred miscellaneous admiration to individual devotion by the time the evening was over marston felt that if life consisted of large parties he might as well settle the question by the toss of a copper 
it must not be supposed that he was such a conceited prig as to imagine that such a fortuitous proceeding or his best efforts afterward could settle the question as it related to the girls it would only decide his own procedure he was like an old marauding baron in honest doubt from which town he can carry off the richest booty that is in case he can capture any one of them his overtures for capitulation might be met with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and he be sent limping off the field nevertheless no man regrets that he must take the initiative and he would be less than a man who would fear to do so when it came to this point in the affair marston shrugged his shoulders and thought i must take my chances like the rest but he wished to be sure that he had attained this point and not lay siege to one girl only to wish afterward it had been the other his course that evening proved that he not only had a legal cast of mind but also a judicial one he invited both miss mitchell and miss waldo to take a sleigh ride with him the following evening fancying that when sandwiched between them in the cutter he could impartially note his impressions his unsuspecting clients laughingly accepted utterly unaware of the momentous character of the trial scene before them as marston smoked a cigar before retiring that night he admitted to himself that it was rather a remarkable court that was about to be held he was the only advocate for the claims of each and finally he proposed to take a seat on the bench and judge between them indeed before he slept he decided to take that august position at once and maintain a judicial impartiality while noting his impressions christmas eve happened to be a cold clear starlit night and when marston drove to miss waldo's door he asked himself could a fellow ask for anything daintier and finer than the red-lipped dark-eyed girl revealed by the hall lamp as she tripped lightly out her anxious mamma following her with words of unheeded caution about not taking cold and coming home early he had not traversed the mile which intervened between the residences of the two girls before he almost wished he could continue the drive under the present auspices and that as in the old times he could take toll at every bridge and encircle his companion with his arm as they bounced over the thank you ma'ams the frosty air appeared to give keenness and piquancy to miss lottie's wit and the chime of the bells was not merrier or more musical than her voice but when a little later he saw blue-eyed carrie mitchell in her furs and hood silhouetted in the window his old dilemma became as perplexing as ever nevertheless it was the most delightful uncertainty that he had ever experienced and he had a presentiment that he had better make the most of it since it could not last much longer meanwhile he was hedged about with blessings clearly not in disguise and he gave utterance to this truth as they drove away surely there was never so lucky a fellow here i am kept warm and happy by the two finest girls in town yes said lottie and it's a shame you can't sit on both sides of us i assure you i wish it were possible it would double my pleasure i'm very well content remarked carrie quietly as long as i can keep on the right side of people well you are not on the right side to-night interrupted lottie good gracious thought marston she's next to my heart i wonder if that will give her unfair advantage but carrie explained of course i was speaking metaphorically in that aspect of the case it would be a shame to me if any side i have is not right toward those who have so honored me he hastened to say oh carrie has all the advantage she is next to your heart would you like to exchange places was the query flashed back by carrie oh no i'm quite as content as you are why then since i am more than content exultant indeed it appears that we all start from excellent premises to reach a happy conclusion of our christmas eve cried marston now you are talking shop mr lawyer premises and conclusions indeed said lottie since you are such a happy sandwich you must be a tongue sandwich and be very entertaining he did his best the two girls seconding his efforts so genially that he found himself after driving five miles psychologically just where he was physically between them as near to one in his thoughts and preferences as to the other let us take the river road home suggested lottie as long as you agree he answered you both are sovereign potentates 
if you should express conflicting wishes i should have to stop here in the road till one abdicated in favor of the other or we all froze but you sitting so snugly between us would not freeze said lottie if we were obstinate we would have to assume our pleasantest expressions and then you could eventually take us home as bits of sculpture in fact i'm getting cold already are you also miss carey oh i'll thaw out before summer don't mind me well then mind me resumed lottie see how white and smooth the river looks why can't we drive home on the ice it will save miles i mean it looks so inviting oh dear cried carrie i feel like protesting now the longest way round may be both the shortest and safest way home you ladies shall decide this morning i drove over the route we would take to-night and i should not fear to take a ton of coal over it a comparison suggesting warmth and a great fire i vote for the river said lottie promptly oh well mr marston if you've been over the ice so recently i only wish to feel reasonably safe i declare thought marston lottie is the braver and more brilliant girl and the fact that she is not inclined to forego the comfort of the home fire for the pleasure of my company reveals the difficulty of and therefore incentive to the suit i may decide to enter upon before new year's meanwhile his heart on carrie's side began to grow warm and alert as if recognizing an affinity to some object not far off granting that she had not been so brilliant as lottie she had been eminently companionable in a more quiet way if there had not been such bursts of enthusiasm at the beginning of the drive her enjoyment appeared to have more staying powers he liked her none the less that her eyes were often turned towards the stars or the dark silhouettes of the leafless trees against the snow she did not keep saying ah how lovely what a fine bit that is but he had only to follow her eyes to see something worth looking at a proof that miss carey also is not so preoccupied with the pleasure of my company that she has no thoughts for other things cogitated marston it's rather in her favor that she prefers nature to a great fire they're about even yet meanwhile the horse was speeding along on the white hard expanse of the river skirting the west shore they now had only about a mile to drive before striking land again and the scene was so beautiful with the great dim outlines of the mountains before them that both the girls suggested that they should go leisurely for a time we shouldn't hastily and carelessly pass such a picture as that any more than one would if a fine copy of it were hung in a gallery said carrie the stars are so brilliant along the brow of that highland yonder that they form a dia oh oh what is the matter and she clung to marston's arm the horse was breaking through the ice whoa said marston firmly even as he spoke lottie was out of the sleigh and running back on the ice crying and wringing her hands we shall be drowned she almost screamed hysterically mr marston what shall we do can't we turn around and go back the way we came miss carey will you do what i ask will you believe me when i say that i do not think you are in any danger yes i'll do my best she replied catching her breath she grew calm rapidly as he tried to reassure lottie telling her that the water from the rising tide had overflowed the main ice and that thin ice had formed over it also that the river at the most was only two or three feet deep at that point but all was of no avail lottie stood out upon the ice in a panic declaring that he should never have brought them into such danger and that he must turn around at once and go back as they came but miss waldo the tide is rising and we may find wet places returning besides it would bring us home very late now miss carey and i will drive slowly across this place and then return for you after we have been across it twice you surely won't fear i won't be left alone suppose you two should break through and disappear what would become of me you would be better off than we he replied laughing i think it's horrid of you to laugh oh i'm so cold and frightened i feel as if the ice were giving way under my feet why miss lottie we just drove over that spot where you stand here miss carey shall stay with you while i drive back and forth alone then if you were drowned we'd both be left alone to freeze to death i pledge you my word you shall be by that grape fire within less than an hour if you will trust me five minutes oh well if you will risk your life and ours too but carey you must stay with me 
will you trust me miss carey and help me out of this scrape carey was recovering from her panic and replied i have given you my promise he was out of the sleigh instantly and the thin ice broke with him also i must carry you a short distance he said i cannot allow you to get your feet wet put one arm around my neck so now please obey as you promised she did so without a word and he bore her beyond the water inwardly exulting and blessing that thin ice his decision was coming with the passing seconds indeed it had come returning to the sleigh he drove slowly forward his horse making a terrible crunching and splashing lottie meanwhile keeping up a staccato accompaniment of little shrieks ah my charming creature he thought with you it was only what will become of me i might not have found out until it was too late the relative importance of me in the universe had we not struck this bad crossing and one comes to plenty of bad places to cross in a lifetime the area of thin ice was not very narrow and he was becoming but a dim and shadowy outline to the girls lottie was now screaming for his return having crossed the overflowed space and absolutely assured himself that there was no danger he returned more rapidly and found Carrie trying to calm her companion. Oh, sobbed Lottie, my feet are wet and almost frozen. The ice underneath may have borne you, but it won't bear all three of us. Oh, dear, I wish I hadn't. I wish I was home, and I feel as if I'd never get there. Miss Lottie, I assure you that the ice will hold a ton, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I shall put you in the sleigh, and Miss Carrie will drive you over. You two together do not weigh much more than I do. I'll walk just behind you with my hands on the back of the sleigh, and if I see the slightest danger, I'll lift you out of the sleigh first and carry you to safety. This proposition promised so well that she hesitated, and he lifted her instantly before she could change her mind, then helped Carrie in with a quiet pressure of the hand, as much as to say, I shall depend on you. But, Mr. Marston, your feet will get wet, protested Carrie. That doesn't matter, he replied good-naturedly. I shall be no worse off than Miss Lottie, and I'm determined to convince her of safety. Now go straight ahead as I direct. Once the horse stumbled, and Lottie thought he was going down head first. Oh, lift me out! Quick, quick! she cried. Yes, indeed I will, Miss Lottie, as soon as we are opposite that great fire of yours. They were soon safely over, and within a half hour reached Lottie's home. It was evident she was a little ashamed of her behavior, and she made some effort to retrieve herself, but she was cold and miserable, vexed with herself, and still more vexed with Marston. That a latent sense of justice forbade the latter feeling only irritated her the more. Individuals, as well as communities, must have scapegoats, and it is not an unusual impulse on the part of some to blame and dislike those before whom they have humiliated themselves she gave her companions a rather formal invitation to come in and get warm before proceeding further but marston said very politely that he thought it was too late unless miss carey was cold carey protested that she was not so cold but that she could easily wait till she reached her own fireside well good night then and the door was shut a trifle emphatically mr marston said carey sympathetically your feet must be very cold and wet after splashing through all that ice water they are he replied but i don't mind it well if i had tried for years i could not have found such a test of character as we had to-night what do you mean oh well you two girls did not behave exactly alike i like the way you behaved you helped me out of a confounded scrape would you have tried for years to find a test she asked concealing the keenness of her query under a laugh i should have been well rewarded if i had by such a fine contrast he replied Carrie's faculties had not so congealed but that his words set her thinking. She had entertained at times the impression that she and Lottie were his favorites. Had he taken them out that night together in hope of contrasts, of finding tests that would help his halting decision? He had ventured where the intuitions of a girl like Carrie Mitchell were almost equal to second sight, and she was alert for what would come next. He accepted her invitation to come in and warm his feet at the glowing fire in the grate, which Carrie's father had made before retiring. Mrs. Mitchell, feeling that her daughter was with an old friend and playmate, did not think the presence of a chaperone essential, and left the young people alone. 
Carrie bustled about, brought cake, and made hot lemonade, while Marston stretched his feet to the grate with a luxurious sense of comfort and complacency, thinking how homelike it all was and how paradisiacal life would become if such a charming little Hebe presided over his home. His lemonade became nectar offered by such hands. She saw the different expression in his eyes. It was now homage, decided preference for one and not mere gallantry to two. Outwardly she was demurely oblivious and maintained simply her wonted friendliness. Marston, however, was thawing in more senses than one, and he was possessed by a strong impulse to begin an open siege at once. "'I haven't had a single suit of any kind yet, Carrie,' he said, dropping the prefix of Miss, which had gradually been adopted as they had grown up. "'Oh, well, that was the position of all the great lawyers once,' she replied, laughing. Marston's father was wealthy, and all knew that he could afford to be briefless for a time. "'I may never be great, but I shall work as hard as any of them,' he continued. "'To tell you the honest truth, however, this would be the happiest Christmas Eve of my life if I had a downright suit on my hands. Why can't I be frank with you and say I'd like to begin the chief suit of my life now and here, a suit for this little hand? I'd plead for it as no lawyer ever pleaded before.' I settled that much down on the ice. And if I hadn't happened to behave on the ice in a manner agreeable to your lordship, you would have pleaded with the other girl, she remarked, withdrawing her hand and looking him directly in the eyes. What makes you think so? he asked, somewhat confusedly. You do. He sprang up and paced the room for a few moments, then confronted her with the words. You shall have the whole truth. Any woman that I would ask to be my wife is entitled to that. And he told her just what the attitude of his mind had been from the first. She laughed outright, then gave him her hand as she said, Your honesty ensures that we can be very good friends, but I don't wish to hear anything more about suits, which are close of kin to lawsuits. He looked very dejected, feeling that he had blundered fatally in his precipitation. "'Come now, Headley, be sensible,' she resumed, half laughing, half serious. "'As you say, we can be frank with each other. "'Why, only the other day we were boy and girl together, "'coasting downhill on the same sled. "'You are applying your legal jargon to a deep experience, to something sacred. "'The result, to my mind, of a divine instinct. "'Neither you nor I have ever felt for each other this instinctive preference, "'this subtle gravitation of the heart. "'Don't you see?' Your head has been concerned about me, and only your head. By a kindred process you would select one bale of merchandise in preference to another. Good gracious, I've faults enough. You'll meet some other girl that will stand some other test far better than I. I want a little of what you call silly romance in my courtship. See, I can talk about this suit as coolly and fluently as you can. We'd make a nice pair of lovers, about as frigid as the ice-water you waded through so good-naturedly and the girl's laugh rang out merrily, awakening echoes in the old house. Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell might rest securely when their daughter could laugh like that. It was the mirth of a genuine American girl whose self-protection was better than the care of a thousand duenas. He looked at her with honest admiration in his eyes, then rose quietly and said, "'That's fine, Carrie. Your head's worth two of mine, and you'd make a better lawyer. You see through a case from top to bottom.' You were right. I wasn't in love with you. I don't know whether I'm in love with you now. And you haven't an infinitesimal spark for me. Nevertheless, I begin my suit here and now. I shall never withdraw it till you are engaged to another fellow. So there. Carrie looked rather blank at this result of her reductio ad absurdum process, and he did not help her by adding, a fellow isn't always in love. There must be a beginning, and when I arrive at this beginning, under the guidance of reason, judgment, and observation, I don't see as I'm any more absurd than the fellow who tumbles helplessly in love. He doesn't know why. What becomes of all these people who have divine gravitations? You and I both know of some who have had satanic repulsions afterward. They use their eyes and critical faculties after marriage instead of before. The romance exhaled like a morning mist, and the facts came out distinctly. They learned what kind of a man and woman they actually were, and two idealized creatures were sent to limbo. Because I don't blunder upon the woman I wish to marry, but pick her out, that's no reason I can't and won't love her. 
Your analysis and judgment were correct only up to date. You have now to meet a suit honestly, openly announced. This may be bad policy on my part, yet I have so much faith in you and respect for you that I don't believe you will let my precipitation create a prejudice. Give me a fair hearing. That's all I ask. Well, well, I'll promise not to frown, even though some finer paragon would throw me completely in the shade. You don't believe in me yet, he resumed, after a moment of thought. I felt that I had blundered awfully a while ago, but I doubt it. A girl of your perceptions would soon have seen it all. I've not lost anything by being frank from the start. Be just to me, however. It wasn't policy that led me to speak, but this homelike scene and you appearing like the good genius of a home. He pulled out his watch and gave a low whistle as he held it toward her. Then his manner suddenly became grave and gentle. Carrie, he said, I wish you not a merry Christmas, but a happy one, and many of them. It seems to me it would be a great privilege for a man to make a woman like you happy. Is this the beginning of the suit? she asked with a laugh that was a little forced. I don't know. Perhaps it is, but I spoke just as I felt. Good night. She would not admit of a trace of sentiment on her part. Good night, she said. Merry Christmas. Go home and hang up your stocking. Bless me, she thought, as she went slowly up the stairs. I thought it was going to be through with him for good and all, except as a friend. But if he goes on this way... The next morning a basket of superb roses was left at her home. There was no card, and Mama queried and surmised, but the girl knew. They were not displeasing to her, and somehow, before the day was over, they found their way to her room. But she shook her head decidedly as she said, He must be careful not to send me other gifts, for I will return them instantly. Flowers, in moderation, never commit a girl. But then came another gift, a book of pencilings here and there, not against sentimental passages, but words that made her think. It was his manner in society, however, that at once annoyed, perplexed, and pleased her. On the first occasion they met in the company with others. He made it clear to every one that he was her suitor. Yet he was not a burr which she could not shake off. He rather seconded all her efforts to have a good time with any and every one she chose. Nor did he, wallflower fashion, mope in the meanwhile and look unutterable things. He added to the pleasure of a score of others, and even conciliated Lottie, yet at the same time surrounded the girl of his choice with an atmosphere of unobtrusive devotion. She was congratulated on her conquest, rather maliciously so by Lottie. Her air of courteous indifference was well maintained, yet she was a woman and could not help being flattered. Certain generous traits in her nature were touched also by a homage which yielded everything and exacted nothing. The holidays soon passed, and he returned to his work. She learned incidentally that he toiled faithfully instead of mooning around. At every coin of vantage she found him, or some token of his ceaseless effort. She was compelled to think of him, and to think well of him. Though Mama and Papa judiciously said little, it was evident that they liked the style of lover into which he was developing. Once during the summer she said, I don't think it's right to let you go on in this way any longer. Are my attentions so very annoying? No, indeed. A girl never had a more agreeable or useful friend. Are you engaged to some other fellow? Of course not. You know better. There is no of course not about it. I couldn't and wouldn't lay a straw in the way. You are not bound, but I. You bound? Certainly. You must remember what I said. Then I must accept the first man that asks me. I ask you. No, someone else, so as to unloose your conscience and give you a happy deliverance. You would leave me still bound and hopeless in that case. I love you now, Carrie Mitchell. Oh, dear, you are incorrigible. It's just a lawyer's persistence in winning a suit. You can still swear on the dictionary that you don't love me at all? I might, on the dictionary. There, I won't talk about such things any more and she resolutely changed the subject. But she couldn't swear, even on the dictionary. She didn't know where she stood or how it would all end, but with increasing frequency the words, I love you now, haunted her waking and dreaming hours. 
the holidays were near again and then came a letter from marston asking her to take another sleigh ride with him on christmas eve his concluding words were there is no other woman in the world that i want on the other side of me she kissed these words then looked around in a startled shamefaced manner blushing even in the solitude of her room christmas eve came but with it a wild storm of wind and sleet she was surprised at the depth of her disappointment would he even come to call through such a tempest he did come and come early and she said demurely i did not expect you on such a night as this he looked at her for a moment half humorously half seriously and her eyes drooped before his you will know better what to expect next time was his comment when is next time any and every time which gives me a chance to see you who should know that better than you are you never going to give up she asked with averted face not till you become engaged hush they are all in the parlor well they ought to know as much by this time also she thought it was astonishing how he made himself at home in the family circle in half an hour there was scarcely any restraint left because a visitor was present yet as if impelled by some mysterious influence one after another slipped out and carrie saw with strange little thrills of dismay that she would soon be alone with that indomitable lawyer she signalled to her mother but the old lady's eyes were glued to her knitting at last they were alone and she expected a prompt and powerful appeal from the plaintiff but marston drew his chair to the opposite side of the hearth and chatted so easily naturally and kindly that her trepidation passed utterly it began to grow late and a heavier gust than usual shook the house it appeared to waken him to the dire necessity of breasting the gale and he rose and said i feel as if i could sit here forever carrie it's just the impression i had a year ago to-night you sitting there by the fire gave then and give now to this place the irresistible charm of home i think i had then the decided beginning of the divine gravitation wasn't that what you called it which has been growing so strong ever since you thought then that the ice water i waited was in my veins do you think so now if you do i shall have to take another year to prove the contrary neither am i convinced of the absurdity of my course as you put it then i studied you coolly and deliberately before i began to love you and reason and judgment have had no chance to jeer at my love but hedley she began with a slight tremor in her tones you are idealizing me as certainly as the blindest i've plenty of faults i haven't denied that so have i plenty of faults what right have i to demand a perfection i can't offer i have known people to marry who imagined each other perfect and then come to court for a separation on the ground of incompatibility of temperament they learned the meaning of that long word too late and were scarcely longer about it than the word itself now i'm satisfied that i could cordially agree with you on some points and lovingly disagree with you on others chief of all it's your instinct to make a home you appear better at your own fireside than when in full dress at a reception you see here hedley you've got to give up this suit at last i'm engaged and she looked away as if she could not meet his eyes engaged he said slowly looking at her with startled eyes well about the same as engaged my heart has certainly gone from me beyond recall he drew a long breath i was foolish enough to begin to hope he faltered you must dismiss hope to-night then she said her face still averted he was silent and she slowly turned toward him he had sunk into a chair and buried his face in his hands the picture of dejected defeat there was a sudden flash of mirth through tear-gemmed eyes a glance at the clock then noiseless steps and she was on her knees beside him her arms around his neck her blushing face near his wondering eyes as she breathed happy christmas hedley how do you like your first gift and what room is there now for hope End of a Christmas Eve suit by Edward P. Rowe. Recording by Like Many Waters. A Christmas Guest by Selma Lagerlof. Translated by Pauline Bancroft Flack. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One of those who had lived the life of a pensioner at Ickeby was little Ruster, who could transpose music and play the flute. He was of low origin and poor, without home and without relations. Hard times came to him when the company of pensioners were dispersed. He then had no horse nor carriole, no fur coat nor red-painted luncheon basket. He had to go on foot from house to house and carry his belongings, tied in a blue-striped cotton handkerchief. He buttoned his coat all the way up to his chin, so that no one should need to know in what condition his shirt and waistcoat were, and in its deep pockets he kept his most precious possessions, his flute, taken to pieces, his flat brandy bottle, and his music pen. His profession was to copy music, and if it had been as in the old days, there would have been no lack of work for him. But with every passing year, music was less practiced in Vermland. The guitar, with its moldy silken ribbon, and its worn screws, and the dented horn, with faded tassels and cord, were put away in the lumber room in the attic, and the dust settled inches deep on the long, iron-bound violin boxes. Yet the less little Ruster had to do with flute and music pen, so much the more must he turn to the brandy flask, and at last he became quite a drunkard. It was a great pity. He was still received at the manor-houses as an old friend, but there were complaints when he came, and joy when he went. There was an odor of dirt and brandy about him, and if he had only a couple of glasses of wine or one toddy, he grew confused and told unpleasant stories. He was the torment of the hospitable houses. One Christmas he came to Lofdala, where Liliacrona, the great violinist, had his home. Liliacrona had also been one of the pensioners of Ekby, but after the death of the major's wife he returned to his quiet farm and remained there. Ruster came to him a few days before Christmas, in the midst of all the preparations, and asked for work. Liliacrona gave him a little copying to keep him busy. "'You ought to have let him go immediately,' said his wife. "'Now he will certainly take so long with that that we will be obliged to keep him over Christmas.' "'He must be somewhere,' answered Liliacrona. And he offered Ruster toddy and brandy, sat with him, and lived over again with him the whole Ekeby time. But he was out of spirits, and disgusted by him like everyone else, although he would not let it be seen, for old friendship and hospitality were sacred to him. In Liliacrona's house, for three weeks now, they had been preparing to receive Christmas. They had been living in discomfort and bustle, had sat up with dip lights and torches till their eyes grew red, had been frozen in the outhouse with the salting of the meat, and in the brew house with the brewing of the beer. But both the mistress and the servants gave themselves up to it all without grumbling. When all the preparations were done, and the holy evening come, a sweet enchantment would sink down over them. Christmas would loosen all tongues so that jokes and jests, rhymes and merriment would flow of themselves without effort. Everyone's feet would wish to twirl in the dance, and from memory's dark corners words and melodies would rise, although no one could believe that they were there. And then everyone was so good, so good. Now, when Ruster came, the whole household at Lofdala thought that Christmas was spoiled. The mistress and the older children and the old servants were all of the same opinion. Ruster caused them a suffocating disgust. They were, moreover, afraid that when he and Liliacrona began to rake up the old memories, the artist's blood would flame up in the great violinist, and his home would lose him. 
Formerly he had not been able to remain long at home. No one can describe how they loved their master on the farm, since they had had him with them a couple of years, and what he had to give, how much he was to his home, especially at Christmas. He did not take his place on any sofa or rocking stool, but on a high, narrow wooden bench in the corner of the fireplace. When he was settled there, he started off on adventures. He traveled about the earth, climbed up to the stars and even higher. He played and talked by turns, and the whole household gathered about him and listened. Life grew proud and beautiful when the richness of that one soul shone on it. Therefore they loved him as they loved Christmas time, pleasure, the spring sun. And when little Rooster came, their Christmas peace was destroyed. They had worked in vain if he was coming to tempt away their master. It was unjust that the drunkard should sit at the Christmas table in a happy house and spoil the Christmas pleasure. On the forenoon of Christmas Eve, little Ruster had his music all written out, and he said something about going, although of course he meant to stay. Lilia Crona had been influenced by the general feeling, and therefore he said quite lukewarmly and indifferently that Ruster had better stay where he was over Christmas. Little Ruster was inflammable and proud. He twirled his mustache and shook back the black artist's hair that stood like a dark cloud over his head. What did Lilia Crona mean? Should he stay because he had nowhere else to go? Oh, only think how they stood and waited for him in the big ironworks in the parish of Bro. The guest room was in order, the glass of welcome filled. He was in great haste. He only did not know to which he ought to go first. Very well, answered Lilia Crona. You may go, if you will. After dinner, little Ruster borrowed horse and sleigh, coat and furs. The stable boy from Lofdala was to take him to some place in Bro and then drive quickly back, for it threatened snow. No one believed that he was expected, or that there was a single place in that neighborhood where he was welcome. But they were so anxious to be rid of him that they put the thought aside and let him depart. He wished it himself, they said, and then they thought that now they would be glad. But when they gathered in the dining room at five o'clock to drink tea and to dance round the Christmas tree, Lilia Crona was silent and out of spirits. He did not seat himself on the bench. He touched neither tea nor punch. He could not remember any polka. The violin was out of order. Those who could play and dance had to do it without him. Then his wife grew uneasy. The children were discontented. Everything in the house went wrong. It was the most lamentable Christmas Eve. The porridge turned sour. The candles sputtered. The wood smoked. The wind stirred up the snow and blew bitter cold into the rooms. The stable boy who had driven Rooster did not come home. The cook wept. The maids scolded. Finally, Lydia Crona remembered that no sheaves had been put out for the sparrows, and he complained aloud of all the women about him who abandoned old customs and were newfangled and heartless. They understood well enough that what tormented him was remorse, that he had let little Ruster go away from his home on Christmas Eve. After a while he went to his room, shut the door, and began to play, as he had not played since he had ceased roaming. It was full of hate and scorn, full of longing and revolt. You thought to bind me, but you must forge new fetters. You thought to make me as small-minded as yourselves, but I turn to larger things, to the open. Commonplace people, slaves of the home, hold me prisoner, if it is in your power. When his wife heard this music, she said, Tomorrow he's gone, if God does not work a miracle in the night. 
our inhospitableness has brought on just what we thought we could avoid. In the meantime, little Ruster drove about in the snowstorm. He went from one house to the other and asked if there was any work for him to do. But he was not received anywhere. They did not even ask him to get out of the sledge. Some had their houses full of guests. Others were going away on Christmas Day. Drive to the next neighbor, they all said. He could come and spoil the pleasure of an ordinary day, but not of Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve came but once a year, and the children had been rejoicing in the thought of it all the autumn. They could not put that man at a table where there were children. Formerly they had been glad to see him, but not since he had become a drunkard. Where should they put the fellow, moreover? The servant's room was too plain, and the guest room was too fine. So little Ruster had to drive from house to house in the blinding snow. His wet mustache hung limply down over his mouth. His eyes were bloodshot and blurred, but the brandy was blown out of his brain. He began to wonder, and to be amazed. Was it possible that no one wished to receive him? Then, all at once, he saw himself. He saw how miserable and degraded he was, and he understood that he was odious to people. It is the end of me, he thought. No more copying of music, no more flute-playing. No one on earth needs me. No one has compassion on me. The storm whirled and played, tore apart the drifts and piled them up again, took a pillar of snow in its arms and danced out onto the plain, lifted one flake up to the clouds and chased another down into a ditch. It is so, said little Ruster. While one dances and whirls, it is play. But when one must be buried in the drift and forgotten, it is sorrow and grief. But down they all have to go, and now it was his turn to think that he had now come to the end. He no longer asked where the man was driving him. He thought that he was driving in the land of death. Little Ruster made no offerings to the gods that night. He did not curse flute-playing or the life of a pensioner. He did not think that it had been better for him if he had plowed the earth or sewn shoes. But he mourned that he was now a worn-out instrument, which pleasure could no longer use. He complained of no one, for he knew that when the horn is cracked and the guitar will not stay in tune, they must go. He became all at once a very humble man. He understood that it was the end of him on this Christmas Eve. Hunger and cold would destroy him, for he understood nothing, was good for nothing, and had no friends. The sledge stops, and suddenly it is light about him, and he hears friendly voices, and there is someone who is helping him into a warm room, and someone who is pouring warm tea into him. His coat is pulled off him, and several people cry that he is welcome, and warm hands rub life into his benumbed fingers. He was so confused by it all that he did not come to his senses for nearly a quarter of an hour. He could not possibly comprehend that he had come back to Lofdala. He had not been at all conscious that the stable boy had grown tired of driving about in the storm and had turned home nor did he understand why he was now so well received in Liliacrona's house. He could not know that Liliacrona's wife understood what a weary journey he had made that Christmas Eve, when he had been turned away from every door where he had knocked. She felt such compassion on him that she forgot her own troubles. Liliacrona went on with the wild playing up in his room, he did not know that Ruster had come. The latter sat, meanwhile, in the dining-room with the wife and the children. 
the servants, who used also to be there on Christmas Eve, had moved out into the kitchen, away from their mistress's trouble. The mistress of the house lost no time in setting Rooster to work. "'You hear, I suppose,' she said, "'that Lilia Crona does nothing but play all the evening, "'and I must attend to setting the table and the food. "'The children are quite forsaken. "'You must look after these two smallest.' Children were the kind of people with whom little Rooster had had least intercourse. He had met them neither in the bachelor's wing nor in the campaign tent, neither in the wayside inns nor on the highways. He was almost shy of them, and did not know what he ought to say that was fine enough for them. He took out his flute and taught them how to finger the stops and holes. There was one of four years and one of six, they had a lesson on the flute, and were deeply interested in it. This is A, he said, and this is C. And then he blew the notes. Then the young people wished to know what kind of an A and C it was that was to be played. Ruster took out his score and made a few notes. No, they said, that is not right. And they ran away for an ABC book. Little Rooster began to hear their alphabet. They knew it, and they did not know it. What they knew was not very much. Rooster grew eager. He lifted the little boys up, each on one of his knees, and began to teach them. Lilia Crona's wife went out and in, and listened, quite in amazement. It sounded like a game, and the children were laughing the whole time. But they learned— Ruster kept on for a while, but he was absent from what he was doing. He was turning over the old thoughts from out in the storm. This was good and pleasant, but nevertheless it was the end of him. He was worn out. He ought to be thrown away. And all of a sudden he put his hands before his face and began to weep. Lilia Crona's wife came quickly up to him. Ruster, she said, I can understand that you think it is all over for you. You cannot make a living with your music, and you are destroying yourself with brandy. But it is not the end, Ruster. Yes, sobbed the little flute player. Do you see that to sit as tonight with the children, that would be something for you. If you would teach children to read and write, you would be welcomed everywhere. That is no less important an instrument on which to play, Rooster, than flute and violin. Look at them, Rooster. She placed the two children in front of him, and he looked up, blinking as if he had looked at the sun. It seemed as if his little blurred eyes could not meet those of the children, which were big, clear, and innocent. Look at them, Rooster repeated Lilia Crona's wife. I dare not, said Rooster, for it was like a purgatory to look through the beautiful child eyes to the unspotted beauty of their souls. Lilia Crona's wife laughed loud and joyously. Then you must accustom yourself to them, Rooster. You can stay in my house as schoolmaster this year. Lilia Crona heard his wife's laugh and came out of his room. "'What is it?' he said. "'What is it?' "'Nothing,' she answered, "'but that Rooster has come again, "'and I have engaged him as schoolmaster for our little boys.' Lilia Crona was quite amazed. "'Do you dare?' he said. "'Do you dare? "'Has he promised to give up?' "'No,' said the wife. "'Rooster has promised nothing.' but there is much about which he must be careful when he has to look little children in the eyes every day. If it had not been Christmas, perhaps I would not have ventured. But when our Lord dared to place a little child who was his own son among us sinners, so can I also dare to let my little children try to save a human soul. Lilia Crona could not speak but every feature and wrinkle in his face twitched and twisted 
as always when he heard anything noble. Then he kissed his wife's hand, as gently as a child who asks for forgiveness, and then cried aloud, All the children must come and kiss their mother's hand. They did so, and then they had a happy Christmas in Lilia Crona's house. End of A Christmas Guest by Selma Lagerlof Translated by Pauline Bancroft Flack Recording by Maria Casper Christmas in England by Washington Irving This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is nothing in England that exercises a more delightful spell over my imagination than the lingerings of the holiday customs and rural games of former times. They recall the pictures my fancy used to draw in the May morning of life, when as yet I only knew the world through books, and believed it to be all that poets had painted it, and they bring with them the flavour of those honest days of yore, in which, perhaps with equal fallacy, I am apt to think the world was more homebred, social, and joyous than at present. I regret to say that they are daily growing more and more faint, being gradually worn away by time, but still more obliterated by modern fashion. They resemble those picturesque morsels of Gothic architecture which we see crumbling in various parts of the country, partly dilapidated by the waste of ages, and partly lost in the additions and alterations of latter days. Poetry, however, clings with cherishing fondness about the rural game and holiday revel from which it has derived so many of its themes as the ivy winds its rich foliage about the gothic arch and mouldering tower gratefully repaying their support by clasping together their tottering remains and as it were embalming them in verdure of all the old festivals however that of Christmas awakens the strongest and most heartfelt associations. There is a tone of solemn and sacred feeling that blends with our conviviality, and lifts the spirit to a state of hallowed and elevated enjoyment. The services of the church about this season are extremely tender and inspiring. They dwell on the beautiful story of the origin of our faith, and the pastoral scenes that accompanied its announcement. They gradually increase in fervour and pathos during the season of Advent, until they break forth in jubilee on the morning that brought peace and goodwill to men. I do not know a grander effect of music on the moral feelings than to hear the full choir and the pealing organ performing a Christmas anthem in a cathedral, and filling every part of the vast pile with triumphant harmony. It is a beautiful arrangement, also derived from days of yore, that this festival, which commemorates the announcement of the religion of peace and love, has been made the season for gathering together of family connections, and drawing closer again those bonds of kindred hearts, which the cares and pleasures and sorrows of the world are continually operating to cast loose, of calling back the children of a family who have launched forth in life, and wandered widely asunder, once more to assemble about the paternal hearth, that rallying place of the affections, there to grow young and loving again among the endearing mementos of childhood. There is something in the very season of the year that gives a charm to the festivity of Christmas. At other times we derive a great portion of our pleasures from the mere beauties of nature. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for some distance in one of the public coaches, on the day preceding Christmas. The coach was crowded, both inside and out, with passengers, who, by their talk, seemed principally bound to the mansions of relations and friends to eat the Christmas dinner. It was loaded also with hampers of game, and baskets and boxes of delicacies, 
and hares hung dangling their long ears about the coachman's box presents from distant friends for the impending feasts i had three fine rosy-cheeked schoolboys for my fellow-passengers inside full of the buxom health and manly spirits which i have observed in the children of this country they were returning home for the holidays in high glee and promising themselves a world of enjoyment it was delightful to hear the gigantic plans of pleasure of the little rogues and the impracticable feats they were to perform during their six weeks emancipation from the abhorred thraldom of book birch and pedagogue they were full of anticipations of the meeting with the family and household down to the very cat and dog and of the joy they were to give their little sisters by the presents with which their pockets were crammed but the meeting to which they seemed to look forward with the greatest impatience was with bantam which i found to be a pony and according to their talk possessed of more virtues than any steed since the days of bucephalus how he could trot how he could run and then such leaps as he would take there was not a hedge in the whole country that he could not clear they were under the particular guardianship of the coachman to whom whenever an opportunity presented they addressed a host of questions and pronounced him one of the best fellows in the whole world indeed i could not but notice the more than ordinary air of bustle and importance of the coachman who wore his hat a little on one side and had a large bunch of christmas greens stuck in the buttonhole of his coat he is always a personage full of mighty care and business and he is particularly so during this season having so many commissions to execute in consequence of the great interchange of presents perhaps the impending holiday might have given a more than usual animation to the country for it seemed to me as if everybody was in good looks and good spirits game poultry and other luxuries of the table were in brisk circulation in the villages the grocers butchers and fruiterers shops were thronged with customers the housewives were stirring briskly about putting their dwellings in order and the glossy branches of holly with their bright red berries began to appear at the windows the scene brought to mind an old writer's account of christmas preparations now capons and hens besides turkeys geese and ducks with beef and mutton must all die for in twelve days a multitude of people will not be fed with a little now plums and spice sugar and honey square it among pies and broth now or never must music be in tune for the youth must dance and sing to get them a heat while the aged sit by the fire the country maid leaves half her market and must be sent again if she forgets a pack of cards on christmas eve great is the contention of holly and ivy whether master or dame wears the breeches dice and cards benefit the butler and if the cook do not lack wit he will sweetly lick his fingers end of christmas in england by washington irving Christmas Trees by Robert Frost This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Christmas Trees A Christmas Circular Letter The city had withdrawn into itself and left at last the country to the country when between whirls of snow not come to lie and whirls of foliage not yet laid there drove a stranger to our yard who looked the city yet did in country fashion in that there he sat and waited till he drew us out a buttoning coats to ask him who he was he proved to be the city come again to look for something it had left behind and could not do without and keep its christmas he asked if i would sell my christmas trees my woods the young fir balsams like a place where houses 
all our churches and have spires i hadn't thought of them as christmas trees i doubt if i was tempted for a moment to sell them off their feet to go in cars and leave the slope behind the house all bare where the sun shines now no warmer than the moon i'd hate to have them know it if i was yet more i'd hate to hold my trees except as others hold theirs or refuse for them beyond the time of profitable growth the trial by market everything must come to i dallied so much with the thought of selling then whether from mistaken courtesy in fear of seeming short of speech or whether from hope of hearing good of what was mine i said there aren't enough to be worth while i could soon tell how many they would cut you let me look them over you could look but don't expect i'm going to let you have them pasture they spring in some in clumps too close that lop each other of boughs but not a few quite solitary and having equal boughs all round and round the latter he nodded just to or paused to say beneath some lovelier one with a buyer's moderation that would do i thought so too but wasn't there to say so we climbed the pasture on the south crossed over and came down on the north he said a thousand a thousand christmas trees at what a piece he felt some need of softening that to me a thousand trees would come to thirty dollars then i was certain i had never meant to let him have them never show surprise but thirty dollars seemed so small beside the extent of pasture i should strip three cents for that was all they figured out a piece three cents so small beside the dollar friends i should be writing to within the hour would pay in cities for good trees like those regular vestry trees whole sunday schools could hang enough on to pick off enough a thousand christmas trees i didn't know i had worth three cents more to give away than sell as may be shown by a simple calculation too bad i couldn't lay one in a letter i can't help wishing i could send you one in wishing you herewith a merry christmas end of christmas trees by robert frost A College Santa Claus by Ralph Henry Barbour. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Satherwaite ought to, threw his overcoat across the broad mahogany table, regardless of the silver and cut glass furnishings, shook the melting snowflakes from his cap, and tossed it atop the coat, half kicked, half shoved a big leathern armchair up to the wide fireplace, dropped himself into it, and stared moodily at the flames. Satherwaite was troubled. In fact, he assured himself, drawing his handsome features into a generous scowl, that he was, on this Christmas Eve, the most depressed and bored person in the length and breadth of New England. Satherwaite was not used to being depressed, and boredom was a state usually far remote from his experience. Consequently, he took it worse. With something between a groan and a growl, he drew a crumpled telegram from his pocket. The telegram was at the bottom of it all. He read it again. E. Satherwaite, Randolph Hall, Cambridge. Advise you're not coming. Aunt Louise very ill. Merry Christmas. Phil. Merry Christmas, growled Satherwaite, throwing the offending sheet of buff paper into the flames. Looks like it, doesn't it? confound phil's aunt louise anyway what business has she getting sick at christmas time not of course that i wish the old lady any harm but it it well it's wretched luck when at college phil was the occupant of the bedroom that lay in the darkness beyond the half-open door to the right he lived when at home in a big rambling house in the berkshires a house from the windows of which one could see into three states an overlook a wonderful expanse of wooded hill and sloping meadow a house which held besides phil and phil's father and mother and aunt louise and a younger brother 
Phil's sister. Satherwaite growled again, more savagely, at the thought of Phil's sister. Not, be it understood, at that extremely attractive young lady, but at the fate which was keeping her from his sight. Satherwaite had promised his roommate to spend Christmas with him, thereby bringing upon himself pained remonstrances from his own family, remonstrances which, Satherwaite acknowledged, were quite justifiable. His bags stood beside the door. He had spent the early afternoon very pleasurably in packing them, carefully weighing the respective merits of a primrose waistcoat and a blue flannel one, as weapons wherewith to impress the heart of Phil's sister. And now... He kicked forth his feet, and brought brass tongs and shovel clattering on the hearth. It relieved his exasperation. The fatal telegram reached him at five o'clock, as he was on the point of donning his coat. From five to six he'd remained in a torpor of disappointment, continually wondering whether Phil's sister would care. At six, his own boarding-house being closed for the recess, he had trudged through the snow to a restaurant in the square and had dined miserably on lukewarm turkey and lumpy mashed potatoes. And now it was nearly eight, and he did not even care to smoke. His one chance of reaching his own home that night had passed, and there was nothing for it but to get through the interminable evening somehow, and catch an early train in the morning. The theatres in town offered no attraction. As for his club, he had stopped in on his way from dinner, and had fussed with an evening paper, until the untenanted expanse of darkly furnished apartments and the unaccustomed stillness had driven him forth again. He drew his long legs under him, and arose, crossing the room and drawing aside the deep-toned hangings before the window. It was still snowing. Across the avenue a flood of mellow light from a butcher's shop was thrown out over the snowy sidewalk. Its windows were garlanded with Christmas greens and hung with pathetic-looking turkeys and geese. Belated shoppers passed out, their arms piled high with bundles. A car swept by, its drone muffled by the snow. The spirit of Christmas was in the very air. Satherwaite's depression increased, and, of a sudden, inaction became intolerable. He would go and see somebody, anybody, and make them talk to him. But when he had his coat in his hands, he realized that even this comfort was denied him. He had friends in town nice folk who would be glad to see him any other time, but into whose family gatherings he could no more force himself to-night than he could steal. As for the men he knew in college, they had all gone to their homes or to those of somebody else. Staring disconsolately about the study, it suddenly struck him that the room looked disgustingly slovenly and unkept. Phil was such an untidy beggar. He would fix things up a bit. If he did it carefully and methodically, no doubt he could consume a good hour and a half that way. It would then be half-past nine. Possibly, if he tried hard, he could use up another hour bathing and getting ready for bed. As a first step, he removed his coat from the table and laid it carefully across the foot of the leather couch. Then he placed his damp cap on one end of the mantel. The next object to meet his gaze was a well-worn notebook. It was not his own, and it did not look like Phil's, the mystery was solved when he opened it and read, H. G. Doyle, College House, on the flyleaf. He remembered then. He had borrowed it from Doyle almost a week before, at a lecture. He had copied some of the notes, and had forgotten to return the book. It was very careless of him. He would return it as soon as... Then he recollected having seen Doyle at noon that day, coming from one of the cheaper boarding houses. It was probable that Doyle was spending recess at college. Just the thing. He would call on Doyle. It was not until he was halfway downstairs that he remembered the book. He went back for it, two steps at a time. Out in the street, with the fluffy flakes against his face, he felt better. After all, there was no use in getting grouchy over his disappointment. Phil would keep, and so would Phil's sister, at least until Easter. Or, better yet, he would get Phil to take him home with him over Sunday sometime. He was passing the shops now, and stopped before jeweler's window. His eye caught a rather jolly-looking paper knife in gun metal. He had made his purchases for Christmas, and had already dispatched them, but the paper knife looked attractive, and, if there was no one to give it to, he could keep it himself. So he passed into the shop and purchased it. 
"'Put it into a box, will you?' he requested. "'I may want to send it away.' Out on the avenue again, his thoughts reverted to his prospective host. The visit had elements of humor. He had known Doyle at preparatory school, and since then, at college, had maintained the acquaintance in a casual way. He liked Doyle, always had, just as any man must like an honest, earnest, gentlemanly fellow, whether their paths run parallel or cross only at rare intervals. He and Doyle were not at all in the same coterie. Satherwaite's friends were the richest, and sometimes the laziest, men in college. Doyle's were, well, presumably men who, like himself, had only enough money to scrape through from September to June, who studied hard for degrees, whose viewpoint of university life must, of necessity, be widely separated from Satherwaite's. As for visiting Doyle, Satherwaite could not remember ever having been in his room but once, and that was long ago, in their freshman year. Satherwaite had to climb two flights of steep and very narrow stairs, and when he stood at Doyle's door, he thought he must have made a mistake. From within came the sounds of very unstudious revelry, laughter, a snatch of song, Voices raised in good-natured argument. Satherwaite referred again to the flyleaf of the notebook. There was no error. He knocked and, in obedience to a cheery, Come in! entered. He found himself in a small study, shabbily furnished, but cheerful and homelike by reason of the leaping flames in the grate and the blue haze of tobacco smoke that almost hid its farther wall. About the room sat six men, their pipes held questioningly away from their mouths, and their eyes fixed wonderingly, half resentfully, upon the intruder. But what caught and held Satherwaite's gaze was a tiny Christmas tree, scarcely three feet high, which adorned the center of the desk. Its branches held toy candles, as yet unlighted, and were festooned with strings of crimson cranberries and colored popcorn, while here and there a small package dangled amidst the greenery. "'How are you, Satherwaite?' Doyle, tall, lank, and nearsighted, arose and moved forward with outstretched hand. He was plainly embarrassed, as was every other occupant of the study, Satherwaite included. The laughter and talk had subsided. Doyle's guests politely removed their gaze from the newcomer and returned their pipes to their lips. But the newcomer was intruding, and knew it, and he was consequently embarrassed. Embarrassment, like boredom, was a novel sensation to him and he speedily decided that he did not fancy it. He held out Doyle's book. "'I brought this back, old man. I don't know how I came to forget it. I'm awfully sorry, you know. It was so very decent of you to lend it to me. Awfully sorry, really.' Doyle murmured that it didn't matter, not a particle, and wouldn't Satherwaite sit down? No, Satherwaite couldn't stop. He heard the youth in the faded cricket blazer tell the man next to him, in a stage aside, that this was Satherwaite ought to, an awful swell, you know. Satherwaite again declared that he could not remain. Doyle said he was sorry. They were just having a little, sort of a Christmas Eve party, you know. He blushed while he explained, and wondered whether Satherwaite thought them a lot of idiots, or simply a parcel of sentimental kids. Probably Satherwaite knew some of the fellows, he went on. Satherwaite studied the assemblage, and replied that he thought not, though he remembered having seen several of them at lectures and things. Doyle made no move toward introducing his friends to Satherwaite, and, to relieve the momentary silence that followed, observed that he supposed it was getting colder. Satherwaite replied, absently, that he hadn't noticed, but that it was still snowing. The youth in the cricket blazer fidgeted in his chair. Satherwaite was thinking. Of course, he was not wanted there. He realized that. Yet, he was of half a mind to stay. The thought of his empty room dismayed him. The cheer and comfort before him appealed to him forcibly. And, more than all, he was possessed of a desire to vindicate himself to this circle of narrow-minded critics. Great Scott! Just because he had some money, and went with some other fellows who also had money, he was to be promptly labeled snob, and treated with polite tolerance only. By Jove, he would stay if only to punish them for their narrowness. "'You're sure I shan't be intruding, Doyle?' he asked. Doyle gasped in amazement. Satherwaite removed his coat. A shiver of consternation passed through the room. 
Then the host found his tongue. Glad to have you. Nothing much doing. Few friends. Quiet evening. Let me take your coat. Introductions followed. The man in the cricket blazer turned out to be Doak, Ought Three, the man who had won the Jonas Greave scholarship. A small youth with eagle-like countenance was Summers, he who had debated so brilliantly against Princeton. A much bewhiskered man was Aylworth, of the law school. Cranch and Smith, both members of Satherwaite's class, completed the party. Satherwaite shook hands with those within reach and looked for a chair. Instantly everyone was on his feet. There was a confused chorus of, Take this, won't you? Satherwaite accepted a straight-backed chair with part of its cane seat missing, after a decent amount of protest. Then a heavy discouraging silence fell. Satherwaite looked around the circle. Everyone, save Aylworth and Doyle, was staring blankly at the fire. Aylworth dropped his eyes gravely. Doyle broke out explosively with, Do you smoke, Satherwaite? Yes, but I'm afraid... He searched his pockets perfunctorily. I haven't my pipe with me. His cigarette case met his searching fingers, but somehow cigarettes did not seem appropriate. I'm sorry, said Doyle, but I'm afraid I haven't an extra one. Any of you fellows got a pipe that's not working? Murmured regrets followed. Doak, who sat next to Satherwaite, put a hand in his coat pocket and viewed the intruder doubtingly from around the corners of his glasses. It doesn't matter a bit, remarked Satherwaite heartily. I've got sort of a pipe here, said Doak, if you're not over particular what you smoke. Satherwaite received the pipe gravely. It was a blackened briar whose bowl was burnt halfway down on one side from being lighted over the gas, and whose mouthpiece, gnawed away in long usage, had been reshaped with a knife. Satherwaite examined it with interest, rubbing the bowl gently on his knee. He knew, without seeing, that Doak was eyeing him with mingled defiance and apology, and wondering in what manner a man who was used to meerschaums and gold-mounted briars would take the proffer of his worn-out favorite. And he knew, too, that all the others were watching. He placed the stem between his lips and drew on it once or twice, with satisfaction. "'Seems a jolly old pipe,' he said. "'I fancy you must be rather fond of it. Has anyone got any backy?' Five pouches were tendered instantly. Satherwaite filled his pipe carefully. He had won the first trick, he told himself, and the thought was pleasurable. The conversation had started up again, but it was yet perfunctory, and Satherwaite realized that he was still an outsider. Doyle gave him the opportunity he wanted. "'Isn't it something new for you to stay here through recess?' he asked. Then Satherwaite told about Phil's Aunt Louise and the telegram about his dismal dinner at the restaurant, and the subsequent flight from the tomb-like silence of the club, how he had decided, in desperation, to clean up his study, and how he had come across Doyle's notebook. He told it rather well. He had a reputation for that sort of thing, and tonight he did his best. He pictured himself to his audience on the verge of suicide from melancholia, and assured them that this fate had been averted only through his dislike of being found lifeless amid such untidy surroundings. He decked the narrative with touches of drollery, and was rewarded with the grins that overspread the faces of his hearers. Aylworth nodded appreciatingly, now and then, and Doak even slapped his knee once and giggled aloud. Satherwaite left out all mention of Phil's sister, naturally, and ended with, And so... When I saw you fellows having such a Christian, comfortable sort of a time, I simply couldn't break away again. I knew I was risking getting myself heartily disliked, and really I wouldn't blame you if you rose en masse and kicked me out. But I am desperate. Give me some tobacco from time to time, and just let me sit here and listen to you. It will be a kindly act to a homeless orphan. Shut up, said Doyle heartily. We're glad to have you, of course. The others concurred. We were going to light up the tree after a bit. We do it every year, you know. It's kind of, of Christmassy when you don't get home for the holidays, you see. We give one another little presents and, and have rather a bit of fun out of it. Only, he hesitated doubtfully, only I'm afraid it may bore you awfully. Bore me? cried Satherwaite. Why, man alive, I should think it would be the jolliest sort of a thing. It's just like being kids again. 
he turned and observed the tiny tree with interest and do you mean that you all give one another presents and keep it secret and and all that yes just little things you know answered dope deprecatingly it's the nearest thing to a real christmas that i've known for seven years said aylworth gravely satherwaite observed him wonderingly by jove he murmured seven years do you know i'm glad now i am going home instead of to sterner's for christmas a fellow ought to be with his own folks don't you think everybody said yes heartily and there was a moment of silence in the room presently cranch whose home was in michigan began speaking reminiscently of the christmases he had spent when a lad in the pine woods he made the others feel the cold and the magnitude of the pictures he drew and for a space satherwaite was transported to a little lumber town in a clearing and stood by excitedly while a small boy in jeans drew woolen mittens, wonderful ones of red and gray, from out a Christmas stocking. And Summers told of a Christmas he had once spent in a Quebec village, and Aylworth followed him with an account of Christmas morning in a Maine coast fishing town. Satherwaite was silent. He had no Christmases of his own to tell about. They would have been sorry, indeed, after the others. Christmases in a big Philadelphia house rather staid and stupid days, as he remembered them now, days lacking in any delightful element of uncertainty, but filled with wonderful presents so numerous that the novelty had worn away from them ere bedtime. He felt that, somehow, he had been cheated out of a pleasure which should have been his. The tobacco pouches went from hand to hand. Christmas giving had already begun, and Satherwaite, to avoid disappointing his new friends, had to smoke many more pipes than was good for him. Suddenly they found themselves in darkness, save for the firelight. Doyle had arisen stealthily and turned out the gas. Then, one by one, the tiny candles flickered and flared bluely into flame. Someone pulled the shades from before the two windows, and the room was hushed. Outside they could see the flakes falling silently, steadily, between them and the electric lights that shone across the avenue. It was a beautiful, cold, still world of blue mists. A gong clanged softly, and a car, well-nigh untenanted, slid by beneath them, its windows frosted halfway up, flooding the snow with mellow light. Someone beside Satherwaite murmured gently, "'Good old Christmas!' The spell was broken. Satherwaite sighed. Why, he hardly knew, and turned away from the window. The tree was brilliantly lighted now and strings of cranberries caught the beams ruddily. Doak stirred the fire, and Doyle, turning from a whispered consultation with some of the others, approached Satherwaite. "'Would you mind playing Santa Claus? Give out the presents, you know. We always do it that way.' Satherwaite would be delighted, and, better to impersonate that famous old gentleman, he turned up the collar of his jacket and put each hand up the opposite sleeve, looking as benignant as possible the while. "'That's fine,' cried Smith. "'But hold on, you need a cap.' He seized one from the window seat, a worn thing of yellowish-brown otter, and drew it down over Satherwaite's ears. The crowd applauded merrily. "'Dear little boys and girls,' began Satherwaite in a quavering voice. "'No girls,' cried Doak. "'I want the cranberries,' cried Smith. I love cranberries. I'll get the popcorn, then. That was the sedate Aylworth. You'll be beastly sick, said Doak, grinning jovially through his glasses. Satherwaite untied the first package from its twig. It bore the inscription, For Little Willie Cranch. Everyone gathered around while the recipient undid the wrappings and laid bare a pen wiper adorned with a tiny crimson football. Doak explained to Satherwaite that Cranch had played football just once on a scrub team and had heroically carried the ball down a long field and placed it triumphantly under his own goalposts. This accounted for the laughter that ensued. Sammy Doak received a notebook marked Mathematics 3A. The point of this allusion was lost to Satherwaite, for Doak was too busy laughing to explain it. And so it went, and the room was in a constant roar of mirth. Doyle conferred excitedly with Aylworth across the room. By and by, 
He stole forward, and, detaching one of the packages from the tree, erased and wrote on it with great secrecy. Then he tied it back again, and retired to the hearth, grinning expectantly, until his own name was called, and he was shoved forward to receive a rubber penholder. Presently Satherwaite, working around the Christmas tree, detached a package, and frowned over the address. "'Fellows, this looks like—like like Satherwaite, but—' He viewed the assemblage in embarrassment. But I fancy it's a mistake. Not a bit, cried Doyle. That's just my writing. Open it, cried the others, thronging up to him. Satherwaite obeyed, wondering. Within the wrappers was a pocket memorandum book, a simple thing of cheap red leather. Someone laughed uncertainly. Satherwaite, very red, ran his finger over the edges of the leaves, examined it long, as though he had never seen anything like it before, and placed it in his waistcoat pocket. "'I—I—' I, he began. "'Chop it off!' cried someone joyously. "'I'm awfully much obliged to—to to whoever—' "'It's from the gang,' said Doyle. "'For the Merry Christmas,' said Aylworth. "'Thank you, gang,' said Satherwaite. The distribution went on, but presently— when all the rest were crowding about Summers, Satherwaite whipped a package from his pocket and, writing on it hurriedly, was apparently in the act of taking it from the tree when the others turned again. "'Little Harry Doyle,' he read gravely. Doyle viewed the package in amazement. He had dressed the tree himself. "'Open it up, old man!' When he saw the gunmetal paper knife, he glanced quickly at Satherwaite. He was very red in the face. Satherwaite smiled back imperturbably. The knife went from hand to hand, awakening enthusiastic admiration. "'But I say, old oh man, who gave—' began Smith. "'I'm awfully much obliged, Satherwaite,' said Doyle. "'But really, I couldn't think of taking—' "'Chop it off,' echoed Satherwaite. "'Look here, Doyle, it isn't the sort of thing I'd give you from choice. It's a useless sort of toy, but I just happen to have it with me.' bought it in the square, on the way to give to someone, I didn't know who, and so, if you don't mind, I wish you'd accept it, you know. It'll do to put on the table, or open cans with. If you'd rather not take it, why, chuck it out the window. It isn't that, cried Doyle. It's only that it's much too fine. Oh, no, it isn't, said Satherwaite. Now, then, where's little Alfie Aylworth? Small candy canes followed the packages, and the men drew once more around the hearth, munching the pink and white confectionery enjoyingly. Smith insisted upon having the cranberries, and wore them around his neck. The popcorn was distributed equally, and the next day, in the parlor car, Satherwaite drew his from a pocket together with his handkerchief. Someone struck up a song, and Doyle remembered that Satherwaite had been in the glee club, there was an instant clamor for a song, and Satherwaite, consenting, looked about the room. "'Haven't any thump-box,' said Smith. "'Can't you go it alone?' Satherwaite thought he could, and did. He had a rich tenor voice, and he sang all the songs he knew. When it could be done, by hook or by crook, the others joined in the chorus. Not too loudly, for it was getting late, and proctors have sharp ears. When the last refrain had been repeated for the third time, and silence reigned for the moment, they heard the bell in the nearby tower. They counted its strokes. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. "'Merry Christmas, all!' cried Smith. In the clamor that ensued, Satherwaite secured his coat and hat. He shook hands all around. Smith insisted upon sharing the cranberries with him and so looped a string gracefully about his neck. When Satherwaite backed out the door, he still held Doak's pet pipe clenched between his teeth, and Doak, knowing it, said not a word. "'Hope you'll come back and see us,' called Doyle. "'That's all right, old man. Don't forget us,' shouted Aylworth. And Satherwaite, promising again and again not to, stumbled his way down the dark stairs. Outside, he glanced gratefully up at the lighted panes. Then he grinned, and scooping a handful of snow, sent it fairly against the glass. Instantly the window banged up, and six heads thrust themselves out. "'Good night! Merry Christmas, old man! 
Happy New Year! Something smashed softly against Satherwaite's cheek. He looked back. They were gathering snow from the ledges and throwing snowballs after him. Good shot, he called. Merry Christmas! The sound of their cries and laughter followed him far down the avenue. End of A College Santa Claus by Ralph Henry Barbour Read by Donald Cummings The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Chapter 5 Dolce Domo. The sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate forefeet their heads thrown back and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air, as the two animals hastened by in high spirits with much chatter and laughter. They were returning across country after a long day's outing with otter, hunting and exploring on the wide uplands, where certain streams tributary to their own river had their first small beginnings and in the shades of the short winter day were closing in on them, and they had still some distance to go. Plodding at random across the plough they heard the sheep and had made for them, and now, leading from the sheep pen, they found a beaten track that made walking a lighter business, and responded, moreover, to that small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them, saying unmistakably, Yes, quite right this leads home it looks as if we were coming to a village said the mole somewhat dubiously slackening his pace as the track that had in time become a path and then had developed into a lane now handed them over to the charge of a well-metalled road the animals did not hold with villages and their own highways thickly frequented as they were took an independent course regardless of church post office or public house oh never mind said the rat at this season of the year they're all safe indoors by this time sitting round the fire men women and children dogs and cats and all we shall slip through all right without any bother or unpleasantness and we can have a look at them through their windows if you like and see what they're doing the rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible but squares of a dusky orange-red on either side of the street, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low latticed windows were innocent of blinds, and to the lookers-in from outside, the inmates gathered round the tea-table, absorbed in handiwork or talking with laughter and gesture, had each that happy grace which is the last thing the skilled actor shall capture, the natural grace which goes with perfect unconsciousness of observation. Moving at will from one theatre to another, the two spectators, so far from home themselves, had something of wistfulness in their eyes, as they watched a cat being stroked, a sleepy child picked up and huddled off to bed, or a tired man stretch and knock out his pipe on the end of a smoldering log. But it was from one little window with its blind drawn down, a mere blank transparency on the night, that the sense of home and the little curtained world within walls the larger, stressful world of outside nature, shut out and forgotten, most pulsated. Close against the white blind hung a bird cage, clearly silhouetted, every wire, perch, and appurtenance distinct and recognizable even to yesterday's dull-edged lump of sugar. On the middle perch, the fluffy occupant, head tucked well into feathers, seemed so near to them as to be easily stroked had they tried. Even the delicate tips of his plumped-out plumage penciled plainly on the illuminated screen. 
As they looked, the sleepy little fellow stirred uneasily, woke, shook himself, and raised his head. They could see the gape of his tiny beak as he yawned in a bored sort of way, looked round, and then settled his head into his back again, while the ruffled feathers gradually subsided into perfect stillness. Then a gust of bitter wind took them in the back of the neck, a small sting of frozen sleet on the skin woke them as from a dream, and they knew their toes to be cold and their legs tired, and their own home distant a weary way. Once beyond the village, where the cottages ceased abruptly, on either side of the road they could smell through the darkness the friendly fields again, and they braced themselves for the last long stretch, the home stretch, the stretch that we know is bound to end sometime in the rattle of the door latch, the sudden firelight, and the sight of familiar things greeting us as long absent travelers from far over sea. They plodded along steadily and silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper as it was pitch dark, and it was all a strange country for him as far as he knew and he was following obediently in the wake of the rat, leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as his habit was, his shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on the straight gray road in front of him. So he did not notice poor Mole when suddenly the summons reached him and took him like an electric shock. We others, who have long lost the more subtle of the physical senses, have not even proper terms to express an animal's intercommunications with his surroundings, living or otherwise, and have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of the animal night and day, summoning, warning, inciting, repelling. It was one of these mysterious fairy calls from out the void that suddenly reached Mole in the darkness, making him tingle through and through with its very familiar appeal, even while yet he could not clearly remember what it was. He stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recapture the fine filament, the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A moment, and he had caught it again, and with it this time came recollection in fullest flood. Home! That was what they meant, those caressing appeals, those soft touches wafted through the air, those invisible little hands pulling and tugging, all one way. Why, it must be quite close by him at that moment, his old home that he had hurriedly forsaken and never sought again that day when he first found the river. And now it was sending out its scouts and its messengers to capture him and bring him in. Since his escape on that bright morning, he had hardly given it a thought, so absorbed had he been in his new life, in all its pleasures, its surprises, its fresh and captivating experiences. Now, with a rush of old memories, how clearly it stood up before him in the darkness. Shabby indeed, and small and poorly furnished, and yet his, the home he had made for himself, the home he had been so happy to get back to after his day's work. And the home had been happy with him, too, evidently, and was missing him and wanted him back, and was telling him so through his nose, sorrowfully, reproachfully, but with no bitterness or anger, only with a plaintive reminder that it was there and wanted him. The call was clear, the summons was plain, he must obey it instantly and go. Ratty, he called, full of joyful excitement. Hold on, come back, I want you, quick. Oh, come along, Mole, do, replied the rat cheerfully, still plodding along. Please stop, Ratty, pleaded the poor Mole in anguish of heart. You don't understand. It's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it, and it's close by here, really quite close, and I must go to it, I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty, please, please come back. The rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the mole was calling, too far to catch the sharp note of painful appeal in his voice, 
and he was much taken up with the weather, for he too could smell something, something suspiciously like approaching snow. "'Mole, we mustn't stop now, really,' he called back. "'We'll come for it tomorrow, whatever it is you've found. "'But I daren't stop now. "'It's late, and the snow's coming on again, "'and I'm not sure of the way. "'And I want your nose, Mole, so come on quick. "'There's a good fellow.' "'And the rat pressed forward on his way "'without waiting for an answer. "'Poor Mole stood alone in the road, "'his heart torn asunder, "'and a big sob gathering, gathering, "'somewhere low down inside him, "'to leap up to the surface presently he knew, "'in passionate escape. But even under such a test as this, his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. Meanwhile, the wafts from his old home pleaded, whispered, conjured, and finally claimed him imperiously. He dared not tarry longer within their magic circle. With a wrench that tore his very heartstrings, he set his face down the road and followed submissively in the track of the rat while faint, thin little smells, still dogging his retreating nose, reproached him for his new friendship and his callous forgetfulness. With an effort, he caught up to the unsuspecting rat, who began chattering cheerfully about what they would do when they got back, and how jolly a fire of logs in the parlor would be, and what a supper he meant to eat. Never noticing his companion's silence and distressful state of mind, at last, however, when they had gone some considerable way further, and were passing some tree stumps at the edge of a copse that bordered the road, he stopped and said kindly, "'Look here, Mole, old chap, you seem dead tired. No talk left in you, and your feet dragging like lead. We'll sit down here for a minute and rest. The snow has held off so far, and the best part of our journey is over.' The mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump and tried to control himself, for he felt it surely coming. The sob he had fought with so long refused to be beaten. Up and up it forced its way to the air, and then another and another, and others thick and fast, till poor mole at last gave up the struggle and cried freely and helplessly and openly, now that he knew it was all over and he had lost what he could hardly be said to have found. The rat, astonished and dismayed at the violence of Mole's paroxysm of grief, did not dare to speak for a while. At last he said very quietly and sympathetically, "'What is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter, tell us your trouble, and let me see what I can do.' Poor Mole found it difficult to get any words out, between the upheavals of his chest that followed one upon another so quickly and held back speech and choked it as it came. I know it's a, a shabby, dingy little place, he sobbed forth at last brokenly, not like your cozy quarters or Toad's beautiful hall or Badger's great house, but it was my own little home, and I was fond of it, and I went away and forgot all about it, and then I smelt it suddenly, on the road when I called and you wouldn't listen, Rat, and everything came back to me with a rush and I wanted it. Oh, dear, oh, dear, and when you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, and I had to leave it, though I was smelling it all the time, I thought my heart would break. We might have just gone and had one look at it, Ratty, only one look. It was close by, but you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, you wouldn't turn back. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Recollection brought fresh waves of sorrow, and sobs again took full charge of him, preventing further speech. The rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, only patting Mole gently on the shoulder. After a time he muttered gloomily, I see it all now. What a pig I have been. A pig, that's me. Just a pig. A plain pig. He waited till Mole's sobs became gradually less stormy and more rhythmical. He waited till at last sniffs were frequent and sobs only intermittent. Then he rose from his seat and remarking carelessly, Well, now we'd really better be getting on, old chap, and set off up the road again over the toilsome way they had come. Wherever are you going to, ratty, cried the tearful Mole, looking up in alarm. 
"'We're going to find that home of yours, old fellow,' replied the rat pleasantly. "'So you had better come along, for it will take some finding, and we shall want your nose.' "'Oh, come back, ratty, do,' cried the mole, getting up and hurrying after him. "'It's no good, I tell you. It's too late and too dark, and the place is too far off, and the snow's coming, and I never meant to let you know I was feeling that way about it. It was all an accident and a mistake. And think of Riverbank and your supper.' "'Hang Riverbank and supper, too,' said the rat heartily. "'I tell you, I'm going to find this place now, if I stay out all night.' So cheer up, old chap, and take my arm, and we'll very soon be back there again. Still snuffling, pleading, and reluctant, Mole suffered himself to be dragged back along the road by his imperious companion, who, by a flow of cheerful talk and anecdote, endeavored to beguile his spirits back and make the weary way seem shorter. When at last it seemed to the rat that they must be nearing that part of the road, where the mole had been held up, he said, Now, no more talking. Business. Use your nose and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for some little way, when suddenly the rat was conscious, through his arm that was linked in moles, of a faint sort of electric thrill that was passing down that animal's body. Instantly he disengaged himself, fell back a pace, and waited all attention. The signals were coming through. Mole stood a moment, rigid, while his uplifted nose, quivering slightly, felt the air. Then a short, quick run forward, a fault, a check, a try back, and then a slow, steady, confident advance. The rat, much excited, kept close to his heels, as the mole, with something of the air of a sleepwalker, crossed a dry ditch, scrambled through a hedge, and nosed his way over a field, open and trackless and bare, in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived, but the rat was on the alert and promptly followed him down the tunnel to which his unerring nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless, and the earthy smell was strong, and it seemed a long time to rat ere the passage ended and he could stand erect and stretch and shake himself. The mole struck a match, and by its light the rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot, and directly facing them was Mole's little front door, with Mole End painted in Gothic lettering over the bell-pull at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it, and the rat, looking round him, saw that they were in a sort of forecourt. A garden seat stood on one side of the door, and on the other a roller, for the mole, who was a tidy animal when at home, could not stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statuary, Garibaldi and the infant Samuel and Queen Victoria, and other heroes of modern Italy. Down on one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley, with benches along it and little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. In the middle was a small round pond containing goldfish, and surrounded by a cockle-shell border. Out of the center of the pond rose a fanciful erection clothed in more cockle-shells, and topped by a large silvered glass ball that reflected everything all wrong and had a very pleasing effect. Mole's face beamed at the sight of all these objects so dear to him, and he hurried Rat through the door, lit a lamp in the hall, and took one glance round his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless, deserted look of the long-neglected house, and its narrow, meager dimensions, its worn and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose to his paws. Oh, ratty, he cried dismally, why ever did I do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold little place on a night like this, when you might have been at Riverbank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire, with all your own nice things about you? 
The rat paid no heed to his doleful self-reproaches. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, and lighting lamps and candles, and sticking them up everywhere. "'What a capital little house this is!' he called out cheerily. "'So compact, so well planned. Everything here, and everything in its place. We'll make a jolly night of it. The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things.' "'So this is the parlor? Splendid! Your own idea, those little sleeping bunks in the wall? Capital! Now I'll fetch the wood and the coals, and you get a duster mole. You'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table. And try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap!' Encouraged by his inspiriting companion, the mole roused himself and dusted and polished with energy and hardiness while the rat, running to and fro with arms full of fuel, soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He hailed the mole to come and warm himself, but mole promptly had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in dark despair and burying his face in his duster. "'Rat!' he moaned. "'How about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry, weary animal? I've nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb.' "'What a fellow you are for giving in,' said the rat reproachfully. "'Why, only just now I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser, quite distinctly. "'And everybody knows that means there are sardines about somewhere in the neighborhood. "'Rouse yourself, pull yourself together, and come with me and forage.' "'They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard and turning out every drawer.' The result was not so very depressing after all, though of course it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of captain's biscuits nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. "'There's a banquet for you,' observed the rat as he arranged the table. "'I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us tonight.' "'No bread,' groaned the mole dolorously. "'No butter, no... "'No pâté de foie gras, no champagne,' continued the rat, grinning. "'And that reminds me. What's that little door at the end of the passage? "'Your cellar, of course. Every luxury in this house. Just you wait a minute.' He made for the cellar door and presently reappeared, somewhat dusty, with a bottle of beer in each paw and another under each arm. "'Self-indulgent beggar you seem to be, Mole,' he observed. "'Deny yourself nothing.' This is really the jolliest little place I ever was in. Now, wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the place look so homelike they do. No wonder you're so fond of it, Mole. Tell us all about it, and how you came to make it what it is. Then, while the rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks, and mustard which he mixed in an egg cup, the Mole, his bosom still heaving with the stress of his recent emotion, related somewhat shyly at first but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject how this was planned and how that was thought out and how this was got through a windfall from an aunt and that was a wonderful find and a bargain and this other thing was bought out of laborious savings and a certain amount of going without his spirits finally quite restored he must needs go and caress his possessions and take a lamp and show off their points to his visitor and expatiate on them quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed rat who was desperately hungry but strove to conceal it nodded seriously examining with a puckered brow and saying wonderful and most remarkable at intervals when the chance for an observation was given him at last the rat succeeded in decoying him to the table and had just got seriously to work with the sardine opener when sounds were heard from the forecourt without sounds like the scuffling of small feet in the gravel and a confused murmur of tiny voices while broken sentences reached them now all in a line hold the lantern up a bit tommy clear your throats first no coughing after i say one two three where's young bill here come on do we're all awaiting 
"'What's up?' inquired the rat, pausing in his labors. "'I think it must be the field mice,' replied the mole, with a touch of pride in his manner. "'They go round carol singing regularly at this time of the year. "'They're quite an institution in these parts, and they never pass me over. "'They come to Mole End last of all, and I used to give them hot drinks and supper too sometimes, when I could afford it. "'It will be like old times to hear them again.' "'Let's have a look at them,' cried the rat, jumping up and running to the door. It was a pretty sight and a seasonable one that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red worsted comforters round their throats, their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets, their feet jiggling for warmth. With bright beady eyes they glanced shyly at each other, snickering a little, sniffing and applying coat sleeves a good deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, Now then, one, two, three, and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air, singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers composed in fields that were fallow and held by frost or when snowbound in chimney corners and handed down to be sung in the miry street to lamp-lit windows at yule time villagers all this frosty tide let your doors swing open wide though wind may follow and snow beside yet draw us in by your fire to bide joy shall be yours in the morning here we stand in the cold and the sleet Blowing fingers and stamping feet, Come from afar away you to greet, You by the fire and we in the street, Bidding you joy in the morning. For ere one half of the night was gone, Sudden a star has led us on, Raining bliss and ben a sun, Bliss to-morrow and more anon, Joy for every morning. Good man Joseph toiled through the snow, saw the star or a stable low, Mary she might not further go, welcome thatch and litter below, joy was hers in the morning. And then they heard the angels tell, who were the first to cry Noel, animals all as it befell, in the stable where they did dwell. Joy shall be theirs in the morning. The voices ceased. The singers, bashful but smiling, exchanged sidelong glances. And silence succeeded, but for a moment only. Then, from up above and far away, down the tunnel they had so lately traveled, was borne to their ears in a faint musical hum, the sound of distant bells ringing a joyful and clangorous peal. "'Very well sung, boys,' cried the rat heartily. "'And now come along in, all of you, "'and warm yourselves by the fire and have something hot.' "'Yes, come along, field mice,' cried the mole eagerly. "'This is quite like old times. "'Shut the door after you. "'Pull up that settle to the fire. "'Now you just wait a minute while we—' "'Oh, ratty!' he cried in despair, "'plumping down on a seat with tears impending.' "'Whatever are we doing? We've nothing to give them.' "'You leave all that to me,' said the masterful rat. "'Here, you with the lantern, come over this way. I want to talk to you. "'Now tell me, are there any shops open at this hour of the night?' "'Why, certainly, sir,' replied the field mouse respectfully. "'At this time of the year our shops keep open to all sorts of hours.' "'Then look here,' said the rat. "'You go off at once, you and your lantern, and you get me—' Here much muttered conversation ensued, and the mole only heard bits of it, such as, Fresh mind. No, a pound of that will do. See you get Bugginses, for I won't have any other. No, only the best. If you can't get it there, try somewhere else. Yes, of course, homemade, no tin stuff. Well then, do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw, the field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice, perched in a row on the settle, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to enjoyment of the fire, 
and toasted their chilblains till they tingled, while the mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history and made each of them recite the names of his numerous brothers, who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to go out a-caroling this year, but looked forward very shortly to winning the parental consent. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. "'I perceive this to be old Burton,' he remarked approvingly. "'Sensible mole, the very thing. Now we shall be able to mull some ale. Get the things ready, mole, while I draw the corks.' It did not take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater well into the red heart of the fire, and soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way, and wiping his eyes and laughing, and forgetting he had ever been cold in all his life. They act plays, too, these fellows, the mole explained to the rat. Make them up all by themselves and act them afterwards. And very well they do it, too. They gave us a capital one last year, about a field mouse who was captured at sea by a Barbary corsair and made to row in a galley, and when he escaped and got home again, his lady love had gone into a convent. Here, you, you were in it, I remember. Get up and recite a bit. The field mouse addressed got up on his legs, giggled shyly, looked round the room, and remained absolutely tongue-tied. His comrades cheered him on, Mole coaxed and encouraged him, and the rat went so far as to take him by the shoulders and shake him, but nothing could overcome his stage fright. They were all busily engaged on him, like watermen applying the Royal Humane Society's regulations to a case of long submersion, when the latch clicked, the door opened, and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. There was no more talk of play-acting once the very real and solid contents of the basket had been tumbled out on the table. Under the generalship of Rat, everybody was set to do something or to fetch something. In a very few minutes supper was ready, and Mole, as he took the head of the table, in a sort of dream, saw a lately barren board set thick with savory comforts, saw his little friends' faces brighten and beam, as they fell to without delay, and then let himself loose, for he was famished indeed, on the provender so magically provided, thinking what a happy homecoming this had turned out after all. As they ate, they talked of old times, and the field mice gave him the local gossip up to date, and answered as well as they could the hundred questions he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing only taking care that each guest had what he wanted and plenty of it, and that Mole had no trouble or anxiety about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful and showering wishes of the season, with their jacket pockets stuffed with remembrances for the small brothers and sisters at home. When the door had closed on the last of them, and the chink of the lanterns had died away, Mole and Rat kicked the fire up, drew their chairs in, brewed themselves a last nightcap of mulled ale, and discussed the events of the long day. At last the rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, Mole, old chap, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That your own bunk over on that side? Very well, then, I'll take this. What a ripping little house this is. Everything so handy. He clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well up in the blankets, and slumber gathered him forthwith as a swath of barley is folded into the arms of the reaping machine. The weary mole also was glad to turn in without delay, and soon had his head on his pillow in great joy and contentment. But ere he closed his eyes he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight that played or rested on familiar and friendly things, which had long been unconsciously a part of him, and now smilingly received him back without rancor. He was now in just the frame of mind that the tactful rat had quietly worked to bring about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even, it all was, but clearly, too, how much it all meant to him, 
and the special value of some such anchorage in one's existence. He did not at all want to abandon the new life in its splendid spaces, to turn his back on sun and air and all they offered him, and creep home and stay there. The upper world was all too strong. It called to him still, even down there, and he knew he must return to the larger stage. But it was good to think that he had this to come back to, this place which was all his own, these things which were so glad to see him again, and could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome. End of Dolce Domum by Kenneth Graham Recording by Nan Dodge In the Workhouse, Christmas Day by George R. Sims. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. In the Workhouse, Christmas Day. It is Christmas Day in the workhouse, and the cold bare walls are bright with garlands of green and holly, and the place is a pleasant sight. For with clean-washed hands and faces, in a long and hungry line, the paupers sit at the tables, for this is the hour they dine. And the guardians and their ladies, although the wind is east, have come in their furs and wrappers to watch their charges feast, to smile and be condescending, put pudding on pauper plates to be host at the workhouse banquet they've paid for with their rates oh the paupers are meek and lowly with their thank ye kindly mums so long as they fill their stomachs what matter it whence it comes but one of the old men mutters and pushes his plate aside great god he cries but it chokes me for this is the day she died the guardians gazed in horror the master's face went white. Did a pauper refuse the pudding? Could their ears believe aright? Then the ladies clutched their husbands, thinking the man would die, struck by a bolt or something, by the outraged one on high. But the pauper sat for a moment, then rose mid a silence grim, for the others had ceased to chatter and trembled in every limb. He looked at the guardian's ladies, then eyeing their lords he said i eat not the food of villains whose hands are foul and red whose victims cry for vengeance from their dank unhallowed graves he's drunk said the workhouse master or else he's mad and raves not drunk or mad cried the pauper but only a hunted beast who torn by the hounds and mangled declines the vulture's feast keep your hands off me curse you hear me right out to the end you come here to see how paupers the season of christmas spend you come here to watch us feeding as they watch the captured beast hear why a penniless pauper spits on your paltry feast do you think i will take your bounty and let you smile and think you're doing a noble action with a parish's meat and drink where's my wife you traitors the poor old wife you slew yes by the god above us my nance was killed by you last winter my wife lay dying starved in a filthy den i'd never been to the parish i came to the parish then i swallowed my pride in coming for ere the ruin came i held up my head as a traitor and i bore a spotless name I came to the parish craving break for a starving wife bread for the woman who'd loved me through the fifty years of life and what do you think they told me mocking my awful grief that the house was open to us but they wouldn't give out relief i slunk to the filthy alley twas a cold raw christmas eve and the baker's shops were open tempting a man to thieve but I clenched my fists together, 
holding my head awry. So I came to her empty-handed and mournfully told her why. Then I told her the house was open. She had heard of the ways of that, for her bloodless cheeks went crimson, and up in her rags she sat, crying, By the Christmas here, John, we've never had one apart. I think I can bear the hunger. The other would break my heart. All through that eve I watched her, holding her hand in mine, praying the Lord and weeping, till my lips were salt as brine. I asked her once if she hungered, and as she answered no, the moon shone in at the window, set in a wreath of snow. Then the room was bathed in glory, and I saw in my darling's eyes the faraway look of wonder that comes when the spirit flies. And her lips were parched and parted, and her reason came and went, for she raved of our home in Devon, where our happiest years were spent. And the accents long forgotten came back to the tongue once more, for she talked like the country lassie I wooed by the Devon shore. Then she rose to her feet and trembled, and fell on the rags and moaned, and, Give me a crust, I'm famished. For the love of God, she groaned. I rushed from the room like a madman and flew to the workhouse gate, crying, Food for a dying woman. And the answer came, Too late. They drove me away with curses. Then I fought with a dog in the street and tore from the Mongols' clutches a crust he was trying to eat. Back through the filthy by lanes, back through the trampled slush up to the crazy garret wrapped in an awful hush my heart sank down at the threshold and i paused with a sudden thrill for there in the silvery moonlight my nance lay cold and still up to the blackened ceiling the sunken eyes were cast i knew on those lips all bloodless my name had been the last she called for her absent husband oh god had i but known had called in vain and in anguish, had died in that den, alone. Yes, there in a land of plenty lay a loving woman dead, cruelly starved and murdered for a loaf of the parish bread. At yonder gate last Christmas I craved for a human life. You, who would feast us paupers, what of my murdered wife? There, get ye gone to your dinners, don't mind me in the least. Think of the happy paupers eating your Christmas feast. And when you recount their blessings in your smug parochial way, say what you did for me, too, only last Christmas Day. End of In the Workhouse Christmas Day by George R. Sims My Christmas Party From Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood by George MacDonald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen As Christmas Day drew nearer and nearer, my heart glowed with the more gladness, and the question came more and more pressingly. Could I not do something to make it more really a holiday of the church for my parishioners? That most of them would have a little more enjoyment on it than they had had all the year through, I had ground to hope. But I wanted to connect this gladness, in their minds, I mean, for who could dissever them, in fact, with its source, the love of God, that love manifested unto men in the birth of the human babe, the Son of Man. But I would not interfere with the Christmas Day at home. I resolved to invite as many of my parishioners as would come to spend Christmas Eve at the vicarage. I therefore had a notice to that purport affixed to the church door, and resolved to send out no personal invitations whatever, so that I might not give offence by accidental omission. The only person thrown into perplexity by this mode of proceeding was Mrs. Pearson. "'How many am I to provide for, sir?' she said with an injured air. "'For as many as you ever saw in church at one time,' I said. "'And if there should be too much, why, so much the better. "'It can go to make Christmas Day the merrier at some of the poorer houses.' "'She looked discomposed, for she was not of an easy temper. 
but she never acted from her temper. She only looked or spoke from it. "'I shall want help,' she said at length. "'As much as you like, Mrs. Pearson. I can trust you entirely.' Her face brightened, and the end showed that I had not trusted her amiss. I was a little anxious about the result of the invitation, partly as indicating the amount of confidence my people placed in me. But although no one said a word to me about it beforehand except old Rogers, as soon as the hour arrived, the people began to come. And the first I welcomed was Mr. Brownrigg. I had had all the rooms on the ground floor prepared for their reception. Tables of provision were set out in every one of them. My visitors had tea or coffee, with plenty of bread and butter when they arrived, and the more solid supplies were reserved for a later part of the evening. I soon found myself with enough to do. But before long I had a very efficient staff, for after having had occasion once or twice to mention something of my plans for the evening, I found my labors gradually diminish, and yet everything seemed to go right. The fact being that good Mr. Boulderstone, in one part, had cast himself into the middle of the flood, and stood there immovable both in face and person, turning its waters into the right channel, namely, towards the barn, which I had fitted up for their reception in a body, while in another quarter, namely, in the barn, Dr. Duncan was doing his best, and that was something simply first-rate, to entertain the people till all should be ready. From a kind of instinct, these gentlemen had taken upon them to be my staff, almost without knowing it, and very grateful I was. I found, too, that they soon gathered some of the young and more active spirits about them, whom they employed in various ways for the good of the community. When I came in and saw the goodly assemblage, for I had been busy receiving them in the house, I could not help rejoicing that my predecessor had been so fond of farming that he had rented land in the neighborhood of the vicarage, and built this large barn, of which I could make a hall to entertain my friends. The night was frosty, the stars shining brilliantly overhead, so that, especially for country people, there was little danger in the short passage to be made to it from the house. But, if necessary, I resolved to have a covered way built before next time. For how can a man be the person of a parish if he never entertains his parishioners. And really, though it was lighted only with candles round the walls, and I had not been able to do much for the decoration of the place, I thought it looked very well, and my heart was glad that Christmas Eve, just as if the babe had been coming again to us that same night. And is he not always coming to us afresh in every childlike feeling that awakes in the hearts of his people? I walked about amongst them, greeting them, and greeted everywhere in turn with kind smiles and hearty shakes of the hand. As often as I paused in my communications for a moment, it was amusing to watch Mr. Boulderstone's honest, though awkward, endeavors to be at ease with his inferiors. But Dr. Duncan was just a sight worth seeing. Very tall and very stately, he was talking now to this old man, now to that young woman, and every face glistened towards which he turned. There was no condescension about him, he was as polite and courteous to one as to another, and the smile that every now and then lighted up his old face was genuine and sympathetic. No one could have known by his behavior that he was not at court, and I thought, surely even the contact with such a man will do something to refine the taste of my people. I felt more certain than ever that a free mingling of all classes would do more than anything else towards binding us all into a wise, patriotic nation." would tend to keep down that foolish emulation which makes one class ape another from afar, like Ben Jonson's Fungoso, still lighting short a suit, would refine the roughness of the rude, and enable the polish to see with what safety his just share in public matters might be committed into the hands of the honest workmen. If we could once leave it to each other to give what honor is due, knowing that honor demanded is as worthless as insult undeserved is hurtless. What has one to do to honor himself? That is and can be no honor. When one has learned to seek the honor that cometh from God only, he will take the withholding of the honor that comes from men very quietly indeed. The only thing that disappointed me was that there was no one there to represent Old Castle Hall. But how could I have everything a success at once? And Catherine Weir was likewise absent. After we had spent a while in pleasant talk, and when I thought nearly all were with us, I got up on a chair at the end of the barn, and said, "'Kind friends, I am very grateful to you for honoring my invitation as you have done. Permit me to hope that this meeting will be the first of many, and that from it may grow the yearly custom in this parish of gathering in love and friendship upon Christmas Eve. 
When God comes to man, man looks round for his neighbor. When man departed from God in the Garden of Eden, the only man in the world ceased to be the friend of the only woman in the world, and, instead of seeking to bear her burden, became her accuser to God, in whom he saw only the judge, unable to perceive that the infinite love of the Father had come to punish him in tenderness and grace. But when God in Jesus comes back to men, brothers and sisters spread forth their arms to embrace each other, and so to embrace him. This is when he is born again in our souls. For, dear friends, what we all need is just to become little children like him, to cease to be careful about many things and trust in him, seeking only that he should rule and that we should be made good like him. What else is meant by seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you? Instead of doing so, we seek the things God has promised to look after for us and refuse to seek the thing he wants us to seek, a thing that cannot be given us except we seek it. We profess to think Jesus the grandest and most glorious of men, and yet hardly care to be like him. And so when we are offered his spirit, that is, his very nature within us, for the asking, we will hardly take the trouble to ask for it. But tonight, at least, let all unkind thoughts, all hard judgments of one another, all selfish desires after our own way, be put from us, that we may welcome the babe into our very bosoms, that when he comes amongst us, for is he not like a child still, meek and lowly of heart? He may not be troubled to find that we are quarrelsome and selfish and unjust. I came down from the chair, and Mr. Brownrigg, being the nearest of my guests, and wide awake, for he had been standing and had indeed been listening to every word according to his ability, I shook hands with him, and positively there was some meaning in the grasp with which he returned mine. I am not going to record all the proceedings of the evening, but I think it may be interesting to my readers to know something of how we spent it. First of all, we sang a hymn about the Nativity, and then I read an extract from a book of travels, describing the interior of an eastern cottage, probably much resembling the inn in which our Lord was born, the stable being scarcely divided from the rest of the house. For I felt that to open the inner eyes even of the brain, enabling people to see in some measure the reality of the old lovely story, to help them have what the Scotch philosophers call a true conception of the external conditions and circumstances of the events, might help to open the yet deeper spiritual eyes, which alone can see the meaning and truth dwelling in and giving shape to the outward facts. And the extract was listened to with all the attention I could wish, except at first from some youngsters at the further end of the barn, who became, however, perfectly still as I proceeded. After this followed conversation, during which I talked a good deal to Jane Rogers, paying her particular attention indeed, with the hope of a chance of bringing old Mr. Brownrigg and her together in some way. "'How is your mistress, Jane?' I said. "'Quite well, sir, thank you. I only wish she was here. I wish she were. But perhaps she will come next year.' "'I think she will. I am almost sure she would have liked to come tonight, for I heard her say—I beg your pardon, Jane, for interrupting you, but I would rather not be told anything you may have happened to overhear,' I said in a low voice. "'Oh, sir,' returned Jane, blushing a dark crimson, "'it wasn't anything particular. Still, if it was anything on which a wrong conjecture might be built—' I wanted to soften it to her. "'It is better that one should not be told it.' "'Thank you for your kind intention, though. "'And now, Jane,' I said, "'will you do me a favor? "'That I will, sir, if I can. "'Sing that Christmas carol I heard you sing last night to your mother.' "'I didn't know anyone was listening, sir. "'I know you did not. "'I came to the door with your father, and we stood and listened. "'She looked very frightened, "'but I would not have asked her had I not known that she could sing like a bird. "'I am afraid I shall make a fool of myself,' she said. "'We should all be willing to run that risk for the sake of others,' I answered. "'I will try then, sir.' So she sang, and her clear voice soon silenced the speech all round. "'Babe Jesus lay on Mary's lap, the sun shone in his hair, "'and so it was she saw, mayhap, the crown already there. "'For she sang, Sleep on, my little king, bad Herod dares not come.' Before thee, sleeping holy thing, wild winds would soon be dumb. I kiss thy hands, I kiss thy feet, my king so long desired. Thy hands shall never be soiled, my sweet, 
thy feet shall never be tired. For thou art the king of men, my son, thy crown I see it plain, and men shall worship thee every one, and cry glory, Amen. Babe Jesus opened his eyes so wide, at Mary looked her Lord, and Mary stinted her song and sighed. Babe Jesus said never a word. When Jane had done singing, I asked her where she had learned the carol, and she answered, My mistress gave it me. There was a picture to it of the baby on his mother's knee. I never saw it, I said. Where did you get the tune? I thought it would go with a tune I knew, and I tried it, and it did. But I was not fit to sing to you, sir. You must have quite a gift of song, Jane, I said. My father and mother can both sing. Mr. Brownrigg was seated on the other side of me, and had apparently listened with some interest. His face was ten degrees less stupid than it usually was. I fancied I saw even a glimmer of some satisfaction in it. I turned to old Rogers. "'Sing us a song, old Rogers,' I said. "'I'm no canary at that, sir, and besides, my singing days be over. I advise you to ask Dr. Duncan there. He can sing.' I rose and said to the assembly, "'My friends, if I did not think God was pleased to see us enjoying ourselves, I should have no heart for it myself. I am going to ask our dear friend Dr. Duncan to give us a song. If you please, Dr. Duncan.' "'I am very nearly too old,' said the doctor. "'But I will try.' His voice was certainly a little feeble, but the song was not much the worse for it, and a more suitable one for all the company he could hardly have pitched upon. There is a plough that has no share, but a coulter that parteth keen and fair, but the furrows they rise to a terrible size, or ever the plough hath touched them there. Gainst horses and plough and wrath they shake, the horses are fierce, but the plough will break. And the seed that is dropped in those furrows of fear will lift to the sun neither blade nor ear. Down it drops plumb where no spring times come, and here there needeth no harrowing gear. Wheat nor poppy nor any leaf will cover this naked ground of grief. But a harvest day will come at last, when the watery winter all is past. The waves so grey will be shorn away, by the angels' sickles keen and fast, and the buried harvest of the sea, stored in the barns of eternity. Genuine applause followed the good doctor's song. I turned to Miss Boulderstone, from whom I had borrowed a piano, and asked her to play a country dance for us. But first, I said, not getting up on a chair this time, some people think it is not proper for a clergyman to dance. I mean to assert my freedom from any such law. If our Lord chose to represent, in his parable of the prodigal son, the joy in heaven over a repentant sinner by the figure of music and dancing, I will hearken to him rather than to men, be they as good as they may. For I had long thought that the way to make indifferent things bad was for good people not to do them. And so saying, I stepped up to Jane Rogers, and asked her to dance with me. She blushed so dreadfully that, for a moment, I was almost sorry I had asked her. But she put her hand in mine at once, and if she was a little clumsy, she yet danced very naturally, and I had the satisfaction of feeling that I had an honest girl near me, who I knew was friendly to me in her heart. But to see the faces of the people! While I had been talking, old Rogers had been drinking in every word. To him it was milk and strong meat in one but now his face shone with a father's gratification besides. And Richard's face was glowing too. Even old Brownrigg looked with a curious interest upon us, I thought. Meantime, Dr. Duncan was dancing with one of his own patients, old Mrs. Trotter, to whose wants he ministered far more from his table than his surgery. I have known that man, hearing of a case of want from his servant, send the fowl he was about to dine upon, untouched, to those whose necessity was greater than his and Mr. Boulderstone had taken out old Mrs. Rogers, and young Brownrigg had taken Mary Weir. Thomas Weir did not dance at all, but looked on kindly. "'Why don't you dance, old Rogers?' I said, as I placed his daughter in a seat beside him. "'Did your honour ever see an elephant go up the futtock shrouds?' "'No, I never did. I thought you must, sir, to ask me why I don't dance. You won't take my fun ill, sir. I'm an old man o war's man, you know, sir.' I should have thought, Rogers, that you would have known better by this time than make such an apology to me. God bless you, sir. An old man's safe with you. Or a young lass either, sir, he added, turning with a smile to his daughter. I turned and addressed Mr. Boulderstone. 
I am greatly obliged to you, Mr. Boulderstone, for the help you have given me this evening. I've seen you talking to everybody, just as if you had to entertain them all. I hope I haven't taken too much upon me, but the fact is, somehow or other, I don't know how, I got into the spirit of it. You got into the spirit of it because you wanted to help me, and I thank you heartily. Well, I thought it wasn't a time to mind one's P's and Q's exactly, and really it's wonderful how one gets on without them. I hate formality myself. The dear fellow was the most formal man I had ever met. Why don't you dance, Mr. Brownrigg? Who'd care to dance with me, sir? I don't care to dance with an old woman, and a young woman won't care to dance with me. I'll find you a partner if you will put yourself in my hands. I don't mind trusting myself to you, sir. So I led him to Jane Rogers. She stood up in respectful awe before the master of her destiny. There were signs of calcitration in the church warden when he perceived whither I was leading him. But when he saw the girl stand trembling before him, whether it was that he was flattered by the signs of his own power, accepting them as homage, or that his hard heart actually softened a little, I cannot tell. But after just a perceptible hesitation, he said, "'Come along, my lass, and let's have a hop together.' She obeyed very sweetly. "'Don't be too shy,' I whispered to her as she passed me. And the church warden danced very heartily with the lady's maid. I then asked him to take her into the house and give her something to eat in return for her song. He yielded somewhat awkwardly, and what passed between them I do not know, but when they returned she seemed less frightened at him than when she heard me make the proposal, and when the company was parting I heard him take leave of her with the words, "'Give us a kiss, my girl, and let bygones be bygones,' which kiss I heard with delight, for had I not been a peacemaker in this matter, and had I not then a right to feel blessed. But the understanding was brought about simply by making the people meet, compelling them, as it were, to know something of each other really. Hitherto this girl had been a mere name, or phantom at best, to her lover's father, and it was easy for him to treat her as such, that is, as a mere fancy of his son's. The idea of her had passed through his mind, but with what vividness any idea, notion, or conception could be present to him, my readers must judge from my description of him. So that obstinacy was a ridiculously easy accomplishment to him, for he never had any notion of the matter to which he was opposed, only of that which he favoured. It is very easy indeed for such people to stick to their point. But I took care that we should have dancing in moderation. It would not do for people either to get weary with recreation or excited with what was not worthy of producing such an effect. Indeed, we had only six country dances during the evening, that was all, and between the dances I read two or three of Wordsworth's ballads to them, and they listened even with more interest than I had been able to hope for. The fact was that the happy and free-hearted mood they were in enabled the judgment. I wish one knew always by what musical spell to produce the right mood for receiving and reflecting a matter as it really is. Every true poem carries this spell with it in its own music, which it sends out before it as a harbinger, or, properly, a hairburger, to prepare a harbour or lodging for it. But then it needs a quiet mood, first of all, to let this music be listened to. For I thought with myself, if I could get them to like poetry and beautiful things and words, it would not only do them good, but help them to see what is in the Bible, and therefore to love it more. For I never could believe that a man who did not find God in other places as well as in the Bible ever found him there at all. And I always thought that to find God in other books enabled us to see clearly that he was more in the Bible than in any other book, or all other books put together. After supper we had a little more singing, and to my satisfaction nothing came to my eyes or ears during the whole evening that was undignified or ill-bred. Of course I knew that many of them must have two behaviors, and that now they were on their good behavior. But I thought the oftener such were put on their good behavior, giving them the opportunity of finding out how nice it was, the better. It might make them ashamed of the other at last. There were many little bits of conversation I overheard, which I should like to give my readers, but I cannot dwell longer upon this part of my annals. Especially I should have enjoyed recording one piece of talk, in which Old Rogers was evidently trying to move a more directly religious feeling in the mind of Dr. Duncan. I thought I could see that the difficulty with the noble old gentleman was one of expression. But after all, the old foremast man was a seer of the kingdom, 
and the other, with all his refinement and education and goodness too, was but a child in it. Before we parted, I gave to each of my guests a sheet of Christmas carols, gathered from the older portions of our literature, for most of the modern hymns are to my mind neither milk nor meat, mere wretched imitations. There were a few curious words and idioms in these, but I thought it better to leave them as they were, for they might set them inquiring, and give me an opportunity of interesting them further, some time or other, in the history of a word. For in their ups and downs of fortune, words fare very much like human beings. And here is my sheet of carols. An Hymn of Heavenly Love O blessed well of love, O flower of grace, O glorious morning star, O lamp of light, Most lively image of thy Father's face, Eternal King of glory, Lord of might, Meek Lamb of God, before all worlds be height, How can we thee requite for all this good, Or what can prize that thy most precious blood? Yet not thou asked in lieu of all this love, But love of us for guerdon of thy pain, I, me, what can us less than that behove? Had he required life of us again? Had it been wrong to ask his own with gain? He gave us life, he it restored lost. Then life were least, that us so little cost. But he our life hath left unto us free, Free that was thrall, and blessed that was banned. Nay aught demand, but that we loving be, As he himself hath loved us aforehand and bound thereto with an eternal band, him first to love that us so dearly bought, and next our brethren to his image wrought. Him first to love great right and reason is, who first to us our life and being gave, and after when we fared had amiss, us wretches from the second death did save, and last the food of life which now we have, even he himself in his dear sacrament, to feed our hungry souls unto us lent. Then next to love our brethren that were made of that self-mould and that self-maker's hand, that we unto the same again shall fade, where they shall have like heritage of land, however here on higher steps we stand, which also were with self-same price redeemed, that we, however of us, light esteemed. Then rouse thyself, O earth, out of thy soil, in which thou wallowest like to filthy swine, and doest thy mind in dirty pleasures moil, Unmindful of that dearest Lord of thine, Lift up to him thy heavy clouded eyne, That thou this sovereign bounty mayst behold, And read through love his mercies manifold. Begin from first where he encradled was, In simple cratch wrapped in a wad of hay, Between the toilful ox and humble ass, And in what rags and in how base array The glory of our heavenly riches lay, When him the silly shepherds came to see, whom greatest princes sought on lowest knee. From thence read on the story of his life, his humble carriage, his unfaulty ways, his cankered foes, his fights, his toil, his strife, his pains, his poverty, his sharp assays, through which he passed his miserable days, offending none and doing good to all, yet being malist both by great and small. With all thy heart, with all thy soul and mind, Thou must him love, and his behests embrace. All other loves with which the world doth blind Weak fancies, and stir up affections base, Thou must renounce and utterly displace, And give thyself unto him full and free, That full and freely gave himself to thee. Then shall thy ravished soul inspired be, With heavenly thoughts far above human skill, And thy bright radiant eyes shall plainly see the day of his pure glory present still, before thy face that all thy spirit shall fill with sweet enragement of celestial love, kindled through sight of those fair things above. Spencer New Prince, New Pomp Behold a silly tender babe in freezing winter night, in homely manger trembling lies, alas, a piteous sight. The inns are full, no man will yield this little pilgrim bed, but forced he is with silly beasts in crib to shroud his head. Despise him not for lying there, first what he is inquire. An orient pearl is often found in depth of dirty mire. Weigh not his crib his wooden dish, nor beast that by him feed. Weigh not his mother's poor attire, nor Joseph's simple weed. This stable is a prince's court, 
the crib his chair of state, the beasts are parcel of his pomp, the wooden dish his plate, the persons in that poor attire his royal liveries wear, the prince himself is come from heaven, this pomp is praised there. With joy approach, O Christian white, do homage to thy king, and highly praise this humble pomp which he from heaven doth bring. Southwell A Dialogue Between Three Shepherds 1. Where is this blessed babe that hath made all the world so full of joy and expectation, that glorious boy that crowns each nation with a triumphant wreath of blessedness? 2. Where should he be but in the throng and among his angel ministers that sing and take wing, just as may echo to his voice and rejoice, when wing and tongue and all may so procure their happiness? 3. But he hath other waiters now, a poor cow, an ox and mule stand and behold, and wonder that a stable should enfold him that can thunder. Chorus. O oh, what a gracious God have we, how good, how great, even as our misery. Jeremy Taylor. A Song of Praise for the Birth of Christ. Away, dark thoughts, awake my joy, awake my glory, sing. Sing songs to celebrate the birth of Jacob's God and King. O happy night that brought forth light which makes the blind to see. The day spring from on high came down to cheer and visit thee. The wakeful shepherds near their flocks were watchful for the morn. But better news from heaven was brought, your Saviour Christ is born. In Bethlehem town the infant lies, within a place obscure. O little Bethlehem, poor in walls, but rich in furniture. Since heaven is now come down to earth, hither the angels fly. Hark how the heavenly choir doth sing glory to God on high. The news is spread, the church is glad. Simeon, o'er come with joy, sings with the infant in his arms. Now let thy servant die. Wise men from far beheld the star, which was their faithful guide, until it pointed forth the babe, and him they glorified. Do heaven and earth rejoice and sing? Shall we our Christ deny? He's born for us, and we for him. Glory to God on high. John Mason End of My Christmas Party by George MacDonald Ola, or A Christmas Present for Mother by John D. MacDonald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ola, or A Christmas Present for Mother, by John D. MacDonald. Requisites. Scene. A sitting room with fireplace, a small one, or a two-burner oil stove hid in a fireplace. Characters. Alta Good, read by Devora Allen. Henry Good, read by T. J. Burns. Leon Good, read by Thomas Peter. Mrs. Good, read by phone. Ola, a street waif, read by Jasmine Selma. Narrator, read by Maria Casper. Alta, working on a tidy, sighs heavily. <sighs> Leon, whittling a stick, looks up at Alta. I say, Alta, isn't that tidy finished yet? You must be taking a lot of pains with it, for you have been a long time at it. That is true, Leon. I have been working on it a long time. You see, it is for Mother, and I can only work on it when she is away somewhere. I have quite a lot to do on it, but I think I can finish it before Mother comes home. You had better let Henry and me help you, Alta, and then you surely will finish it. <laughs> oh, Leon, it wouldn't be a tidy if I let you and Henry get in some of your stitches on it. I rather think that it would be an untidy instead of a tidy. I think you had better crack some nuts for Mother and leave me to do this. Henry, who has been rubbing some corn off into the popper. Yes, Leon. You get some nuts cracked and leave Sister to do her fancy work. I'm going to pop this corn and have it ready for Mother when she gets home. Henry pops the corn and Leon cracks nuts. By the way, Alta, what do you think Mother will bring you for a Christmas present? A riding pad or an automobile? He wanted both, but as we're very poor, you will likely only get one of them. Which shall it be? 
Now, Henry, please don't tease me any more about that automobile. You know I was only fooling. Besides, there are a number of things that I need more than I do an automobile. I know what Alta wants, Henry. She would like a half dozen more brothers just like us. Come now, Alta, isn't that so? No, not at all, Leon. Two brothers are enough for me. But I would like a sister to play with. You boys tease me so. Perhaps Mother will bring you one when she comes home from her Christmas shopping tonight. You pop your corn, Henry, and I will attend to my work. I can see that you feel like teasing me again tonight. Henry to Leon. I suppose there will be a lot of happy children tomorrow, Leon, with plenty of candy and nuts and all kinds of presents. Bill Lark told me they were going to have a Christmas tree at their church, and they were going to give a present to all the poor in the town. Say, that will be great, won't it? Still, I'll bet there will be a lot of children that won't get anything, and I feel sorry for them. I was reading a story yesterday about a poor little girl who had no father or mother to care for her. She had no home but used to sleep in any hall or doorway that she found open. And one cold Christmas Eve, she froze to death. It made me cry when I read it. Henry dumping the corn from the popper on the table. Well, sister, we have no father, and we are very poor too. But we have a nice home and enough to eat, and the very best mother in all the world. Dear me, boys, whatever should we do without our mother? Knock heard at door. Alta hurries to put Tidy away. Here comes Mother. I'm so glad. Goes to door, finds Ola standing there. Why, little girl, who are you? Oh, please, may I come in and get warm? I'm so very, very cold, and I have no place to go, and no place to sleep, and I'm, I'm so hungry. Boys go to door also. Come in. Come in and get warm. You poor little thing. What is your name, little girl? Ola shivering. Oh, I'm just Ola. Take off your coat and hat, Ola, and come up to the fire and get warm. You get a chair for her, Henry, while I get her a hot drink and something to eat. Henry puts chair by fire. Ola starting to remove coat. I guess I'd better keep my things on, because your mom might get mad when she sees me. And I'll have to scoot, because I get kicked out of lots of places. Most people don't like poor folks. They say we steal and lie and lots of other things. But I don't. Here, Ola, eat this bread and drink this. And when Mother comes, she will give you some more. Gives Ola hot drink and bread. Where are your father and mother, Ola? I haven't got none. I am just alone. Well, who takes care of you? I do it myself. Henry coming closer to Ola. Why, who buys food for you? Nobody, only me. Alta wiping tears away. You poor, poor little thing. How do you earn money to buy bread and clothes and shoes? I sell matches and papers. And I run errands sometimes for the butcher man. And sometimes I scrub out the butcher man's shop, but I don't get much. And sometimes I sing on the street. And I get as much as ten cents! Sing for us, will you, Ola? We would like to hear you. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Alta calls boys aside. Say, boys, let's keep Ola. The poor little thing. She can be our sister, and I will give her some of my clothes and shoes to wear, and we can all take care of her. Let's do it, Henry. Let's do it. We will give her to Mother for her Christmas present. All right. We'll do it. When we hear Mother coming, we will let Ola stand in the corner and cover her up so Mother won't see her when she comes in. What fun! Alta speaks to Ola. Ola, 
How would you like to live here with us, and have our mother for your mother too? Wouldn't it be nice? Ola, standing up, looks surprised. Oh, oh, oh! Mrs. Good knocks at the door. Quick, Ola, quick, stand over here, and we will cover you all up before mother comes in. Enter Mrs. Good. Well, my dear children, have you enjoyed yourselves while I was out shopping? Oh, yes, mother, we had a splendid time. The boys were real good to me and didn't tease much. Mother, are all those bundles Christmas presents for us? Now, dear, don't be inquisitive. Wait until tomorrow morning to see what I have for you. Places bundles on the table. Henry to Alta. I see a riding pad, Alta, but no automobile. Alta turns her head away from him. Leon, very importantly, hands in pockets. Well, mother, we have a Christmas present for you, and we're not going to keep you waiting till Christmas morning for it either. Henry excitedly. What do you suppose it is, mother? Give a good guess now. Oh, some candy, or some fancy work. Isn't that it, Alta? No, not fancy work, dear mother. We have something better than that. Our new present moves and sings, and is very, very useful. Mrs. Good smiling. Oh, I know now. You have a canary bird that moves and sings, and is indeed very useful, because it teaches us to be happy all the time. No, it's not a canary, mother, because it talks, too. Now, a canary doesn't talk, you know. Henry, it must be a parrot. Come now, isn't it a parrot? No, mother, it's no parrot either. Guess again. Mrs. Good pondering. No, I'll give it up. But I know it must be something nice. I can tell by your happy faces. Bring it out, boys. Bring it out. Boys carry Ola, still covered up, out to middle of the room, in rigid position. Oh, what a big present that is, boys. Leon, as he uncovers Ola. Yes, and it can sing and scrub and sell matches. Mrs. Good in surprise. My children, what little girl is this? How did you come here? Mother, the poor little creature came to our door so cold and hungry, and we brought her in. We thought she would freeze to death. And now, Mother, we want to keep her, and she is your Christmas present from us. Mrs. Good, as she seats herself in a chair. Come here, little girl, and tell me all about it. Puts arm around Ola. What is your name, dear? Ola. Ola what? Oh, no, not Ola what. It's just Ola, that's all. Where is your home, Ola? I haven't got no home. But you must live somewhere, and someone must take care of you. Can it be that you are all alone in the world? I guess I must be, because no one gives me a home, and I take care of myself. I had a nice mama once, and she took care of me. But mama was sick a long time, and she told me one day to always be a good little girl. And sometime... I could come and see her up in heaven, cause she was going there pretty soon. And I guess she went to heaven, cause I didn't see her since they took her away in a carriage. Do keep her, mother, and we will all share up with her. Mrs. Good, thoughtfully. Three little ones of my own to provide for. Can I take another, and a stranger? Draws Ola closer to her. Ola, the children say you can sing. Will you sing for me? Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Ola, would you like to live here with us and let me be your mother in place of the one that's gone to heaven? Oh, my! Live here? Oh, in this lovely house? 
runs over to the fireplace. And be warm all the time? Oh, yes, yes! Yes, Ola, and not only have a nice warm home, but a warm place in our hearts, too. Now, dear children, I thank you all for your Christmas present. Draws Ola to her. And if you will all come closer, I will read a few verses from the Bible. Then shall the king say to them that shall be on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, possess you the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you covered me. Sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the just answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, and fed thee, thirsty, and gave thee drink? Or when did we see thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and covered thee? Or when did we see thee sick, or in prison, and came to thee? And the king answering shall say to them, Amen, I say to you, as long as you did it to one of these my least brethren, you did it to me. Yes, after all, it is more blessed to give than to receive, and for his sake I will give this little one a home. Curtain End of Ola or A Christmas Present from Other by John D. MacDonald Old Christmas Tide by Sir Walter Scott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. Old Christmas Tide. Heap on more wood. The wind is chill, but let it whistle as it will. We'll keep our Christmas merry still. Each age has deemed the newborn year the fittest time for festal cheer. Even heathen yet, the savage Dane at isle more deep the mead did drain. High on the beach his galley drew, and feasted all his pirate crew. Then in his low and pine-built hall, where shields and axes decked the wall, they gorged upon the half-dressed steer, caroused in seas of sable beer, while round, in brutal jest, were thrown the half-gnawed rib and marrow bone, or listened all in grim delight, while scalds yelled out the joy of fight. Then forth in frenzy would they hie, while wildly loose their red locks fly and dancing round the blazing pile they make such barbarous mirth the while as best might to the mind recall the boisterous joys of odin's hall and well our christian sires of old loved when the year its course had rolled and brought blithe christmas back again with all his hospitable train domestic and religious rite gave honour to the holy night on Christmas Eve the bells were rung, On Christmas Eve the mass was sung, That only night and all the year Saw the stoled priest the chalice rear, The damsel donned her kirtle sheen, The hall was dressed with holly green, Forth to the wood did merry men go, To gather in the mistletoe, Then opened wide the baron's hall, To vassal, tenant, serf and all power laid his rod of rule aside and ceremony doffed his pride the heir with roses in his shoes that night might village partner choose the lord underrogating shared the vulgar game of post and pair all hailed with uncontrolled delight and general voice the happy night that to the cottage as the crown brought tidings of salvation down the fire with well-dried logs supplied went roaring up the chimney wide 
the huge hall table's oaken face scrubbed till it shone the day to grace bore then upon its massive board no mark to part the squire and lord then was brought in the lusty brawn by old blue-coated serving man then the grim boar's head frowned on high crested with bays and rosemary well can the green-garbed ranger tell how when and where the monster fell what dogs before his death he tore and all the baiting of the boar the wassail round in good brown bowls garnished with ribbons blithely trows there the huge sirloin reeked hard by plum porridge stood and christmas pie nor failed old scotland to produce at such high tide her savoury goose then came the merry maskers in and carols roared with blithesome din if unmelodious was the song it was a hearty note and strong who lists may in their mumming see traces of ancient mystery white shirts supplied the masquerade and smutted cheeks the visors made but oh what maskers richly dight can boast of bosoms half so light england was merry england when old christmas brought his sports again twas christmas broached the mightiest ale twas christmas told the merriest tale a christmas gamble oft could cheer the poor man's heart through half the year end of old christmas tide by sir walter scott peace on earth by edward arlington robinson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo peace on earth he took a frayed hat from his head and peace on earth was what he said a morsel out of what you're worth and there we have it peace on earth not much although a little more than what there was on earth before i'm as you see i'm ichabod but never mind the ways i've trod i'm sober now so help me god i could not pass the fellow by do you believe in god said i and is there to be peace on earth tonight we celebrate the birth he said of one who died for men the son of god we say what then your god or mine i'd make you laugh were i to tell you even half that i have learned of mine to-day where yours would hardly seem to stay could he but follow in and out some anthropoids i know about the god to whom you may have prayed might see a world he never made your words are flowing full said i but yet they give me no reply your fountain might as well be dry a wiser one than you my friend would wait and hear me to the end and for his eyes a light would shine through this unpleasant shell of mine that in your fancy makes of me a christmas curiosity all right i might be worse than that and you might now be lying flat i might have done it from behind and taken what there was to find don't worry for i'm not that kind do i believe in god is that the price tonight of a new hat has he commanded that his name be written everywhere the same have all who live in every place identified his hidden face who knows but he may like as well my story is one you may tell and if he show me there be peace on earth as there be fields and trees outside a jail yard am i wrong if i now sing him a new song your world is in yourself my friend for your endurance to the end and all the peace there is on earth is faith in what your world is worth and saying without any lies your world could not be otherwise one might say that and then be shot 
i told him and he said why not i ceased and gave him rather more than he was counting of my store and since i have it thanks to you don't ask me what i mean to do said he believe that even i would rather tell the truth than lie on christmas eve no matter why his unshaved educated face his inextinguishable grace and his hard smile are with me still deplore the vision as i will for whatsoever he be at so droll a derelict as that should have at least another hat end of peace on earth by edward arlington robinson Port in a Storm by George MacDonald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Papa, said my sister Effie, one evening as we all sat about the drawing room fire. One after another, as nothing followed, we turned our eyes upon her. There she sat, still silent embroidering the corner of a cambric handkerchief, apparently unaware that she had spoken. It was a very cold night in the beginning of winter. My father had come home early, and we had dined early that we might have a long evening together, for it was my father's and mother's wedding day, and we had always kept it as the homeliest of holidays. My father was seated in an easy chair by the chimney corner, with a jug of burgundy near him, and my mother sat by his side, now and then taking a sip out of his glass. Effie was now nearly nineteen. The rest of us were younger. What she was thinking about we did not know then, though we could all guess now. Suddenly she looked up, and seeing all eyes fixed upon her, became either aware or suspicious, and blushed rosy red. "'You spoke to me, Effie. What was it, my dear?' "'Oh, yes, Papa. I wanted to ask you whether you wouldn't tell us tonight the story about how you—' "'Well, my love?' "'About how you—' "'I am listening, my dear. "'I mean, about Mama and you. "'Yes, yes. "'About how I got your Mama for a mother to you. "'Yes, I paid a dozen of port for her. "'We all and each exclaimed, "'Papa!' and my mother laughed. "'Tell us all about it,' was the general cry. "'Well, I will,' answered my father. "'I must begin at the beginning, though.' "'And filling his glass with burgundy, he began. "'As far back as I can remember,' I lived with my father in an old manor house in the country. It did not belong to my father, but to an elder brother of his, who at that time was captain of a seventy-four. He loved the sea more than his life, and as yet apparently had loved his ship better than any woman. At least he was not married. My mother had been dead for some years, and my father was now in very delicate health. He had never been strong, and since my mother's death, I believe, though I was too young to notice it, he had pined away. I am not going to tell you anything about him just now, because it does not belong to my story. When I was about five years old, as nearly as I can judge, the doctors advised him to leave England. The house was put into the hands of an agent to let, at least so I suppose, and he took me with him to Madeira, where he died. I was brought home by his servant, and by my uncle's directions sent to a boarding school, from there to Eton, and from there to Oxford. Before I had finished my studies my uncle had been an admiral for some time, the year before I left Oxford he married Lady Georgiana Thornbury, a widow lady with one daughter. Thereupon he bade farewell to the sea, though I dare say he did not like the parting, and retired with his bride to the house where he was born, the same house I told you I was born in, which had been in the family for many generations, and which your cousin now lives in. It was late in the autumn when they arrived at Culverwood. They were no sooner settled than my uncle wrote to me, inviting me to spend Christmas tide with them at the old place and here you may see that my story has arrived at its beginning. It was with strange feelings that I entered the house. It looked so old-fashioned and stately and grand, to eyes which had been accustomed to all the modern commonplaces. Yet the shadowy recollections which hung about it gave an air of homeliness to the place, which, along with the grandeur, occasioned a sense of rare delight. For what can be better than to feel that you are in stately company, and at the same time perfectly at home in it, I am grateful to this day for the lesson I had from the sense of which I have spoken, that of mingled awe and tenderness in the aspect of the old hall as I entered it for the first time after fifteen years, having left it a mere child. 
I was cordially received by my old uncle and my new aunt. But the moment Kate Thornbury entered, I lost my heart and have never found it again to this day. I get on wonderfully well without it, though, for I have got the loan of a far better one till I find my own, which, therefore, I hope I never shall. My father glanced at my mother as he said this, and she returned his look in a way which I can now interpret as a quiet, satisfied confidence. But the tears came in Effie's eyes. She had trouble before long, poor girl, but it is not her story I have to tell. My father went on. Your mother was prettier then than she is now, but not so beautiful. Beautiful enough, though, to make me think there never had been or could again be anything so beautiful. She met me kindly, and I met her awkwardly. You made me feel that I had no business there, said my mother, speaking for the first time in the course of the story. See there, girls, said my father. You were always so confident in first impressions and instinctive judgment. I was awkward because, as I said, I fell in love with your mother the moment I saw her, and she thought I regarded her as an intruder into the old family precincts. I will not follow the story of the days. I was very happy, except when I felt too keenly how unworthy I was of Kate Thornbury. Not that she meant to make me feel it, for she was never other than kind. But she was such that I could not help feeling it. I gathered courage, however, and before three days were over, I began to tell her all my slowly reviving memories of the place, with my childish adventures associated with this and that room or outhouse or spot in the grounds. For the longer I was in the place, the more my old associations with it revived, till I was quite astonished to find how much of my history in connection with Culverwood had been thoroughly imprinted on my memory. She never showed, at least, that she was weary of my stories, which, however interesting to me, must have been tiresome to anyone who did not sympathize with what I felt toward my old nest. From room to room we rambled, talking or silent, and nothing could have given me a better chance, I believe, with a heart like your mother's. I think it was not long before she began to like me, at least, and liking had every opportunity of growing into something stronger, if only she, too, did not come to the conclusion that I was unworthy of her. My uncle received me like the jolly old tar that he was, welcomed me to the old ship, hoped we should make many a voyage together, and that I would take the run of the craft, all but in one thing. "'You see, my boy,' he said, "'I married above my station, and I don't want my wife's friends to say that I laid alongside of her to get hold of her daughter's fortune. No, no, my boy, your old uncle has too much salt water in him to do a dog's trick like that. So you take care of yourself, that's all. She might turn the head of a wiser man than ever came out of our family.' I did not tell my uncle that his advice was already too late, for that, though it was not an hour since I had first seen her, my head was so far turned already that the only way to get it right again was to go on turning it in the same direction, though no doubt there was a danger of overhauling the screw. The old gentleman never referred to the matter again, nor took any notice of our increasing intimacy, so that I sometimes doubt even now if he could have been in earnest in the very simple warning he gave me. Fortunately, Lady Georgiana liked me, at least I thought she did, and that gave me courage. "'That's all nonsense, my dear,' said my mother. "'Mama was nearly as fond of you as I was, but you never wanted courage.' "'I knew better than to show my cowardice, I dare say,' returned my father. "'But,' he continued, "'things grew worse and worse, till I was certain I should kill myself or go straight out of my mind if your mother would not have me. So it went on for a few days, and Christmas was at hand. The Admiral had invited several old friends to come and spend the Christmas week with him. Now you must remember that, although you look on me as an old-fashioned fogey, Oh, Papa, we all interrupted, but he went on. Yet my old uncle was an older-fashioned fogey, and his friends were much the same as himself. Now I am fond of a glass of port, though I dare not take it, and must content myself with burgundy. Uncle Bob would have called burgundy pigwash. He could not do without his port, though he was a moderate enough man as customs were. Fancy then his dismay when, on questioning his butler, an old coxswain of his own, and after going down to inspect in person, he found that there was scarcely more than a dozen of port in the wine cellar. He turned white with dismay, and till he had brought the blood back to his countenance by swearing, he was something awful to behold in the dim light of the tallow candle old Jacob held in his tattooed fist. I will not repeat the words he used. Fortunately they are out of fashion amongst gentlemen, although ladies, I understand, are beginning to revive the custom, now old and always ugly." Jacob reminded his honour that he would not have more put down till he had got a proper cellar built, for the one there was, he had said, was not fit to put anything but dead men in. Thereupon, after abusing Jacob for not reminding him of the necessities of the coming season, he turned to me, and began, certainly not to swear at his own father, 
but to expostulate sideways with the absent shade for not having provided a decent cellar before his departure from this world of dinners and wine, hinting that it was somewhat selfish and very inconsiderate of the welfare of those who were to come after him. Having a little exhausted his indignation, he came up and wrote the most peremptory order to his wine merchant in Liverpool to let him have thirty dozen of port before Christmas Day, even if he had to send it by post-chase. I took the letter to the post myself, for the old man would trust nobody but me, and indeed would have preferred taking it himself, but in winter he was always lame from the effects of a bruise he had received from a falling spar in the Battle of Abu Kir. That night I remember well. I lay in bed wondering whether I might venture to say a word, or even to give a hint to your mother that there was a word that pined to be said if it might. All at once I heard a whine of the wind in the old chimney. How well I knew that whine, for my kind aunt had taken the trouble to find out from me what room I had occupied as a boy, and by the third night I spent there she had got it ready for me. I jumped out of bed and found that the snow was falling fast and thick. I jumped into bed again and began wondering what my uncle would do if the port did not arrive. And then I thought that, if the snow went on falling as it did, and if the wind rose any higher, it might turn out that the roads through the hilly part of Yorkshire in which Culverwood lay might very well be blocked up. The north wind doth blow, and we shall have snow, and what will my uncle do then, poor thing? He'll run for his port, but he will run short, and have too much water to drink, poor thing. With the influences of the chamber of my childhood crowding upon me, I kept repeating the travestied rhyme to myself, till I fell asleep. Now, boys and girls, if I were writing a novel, I should like to make you, somehow or other, put together the facts, that I was in the room I have mentioned, that I had been in the cellar with my uncle for the first time that evening, that I had seen my uncle's distress, and heard his reflections upon his father. I may add that I was not, myself, even then, so indifferent to the merits of a good glass of port as to be unable to enter into my uncle's dismay, and that of his guests at last, if they should find that the snowstorm had actually closed up the sweet approaches of the expected port. If I was personally indifferent to the matter, I fear it is to be attributed to your mother, and not to myself. Nonsense! interposed my mother once more. I never knew such a man for making little of himself and much of other people. You never drank a glass too much port in your life. That's why I'm so fond of it, my dear, returned my father. I declare you make me quite discontented with my pig wash here. That night I had a dream. The next day the visitors began to arrive. Before the evening after they had all come. There were five of them. Three tars and two land crabs, as they called each other when they got jolly, which, by the way, they would not have done long without me. My uncle's anxiety visibly increased. Each guest, as he came down to breakfast, received each morning a more constrained greeting. I beg your pardon, ladies. I forgot to mention that my aunt had lady visitors, of course, but the fact is it is only the port-drinking visitors in whom my story is interested, always excepted your mother. These ladies my admiral uncle greeted with something even approaching to servility. I understood him well enough. He instinctively sought to make a party to protect him when the awful secret of his cellar should be found out. But for two preliminary days or so his resources would serve, for he had plenty of excellent claret and Madeira stuff I don't know much about, and both Jacob and himself condescended to maneuver a little. The wine did not arrive, but the morning of Christmas Eve did. I was sitting in my room, trying to write a song for Kate. That's your mother, my dears. I know, Papa, said Effie, as if she were very knowing to know that. When my uncle came into the room, looking like Sintram with death and the other one after him. That's the nonsense you read to me the other day, isn't it, Effie? Not nonsense, dear Papa, remonstrated Effie, and I loved her for saying it, for surely that is not nonsense. I didn't mean it, said my father, and turning to my mother, added, It must be your fault, my dear, that my children are so serious that they always take a joke for earnest. However, it was no joke with my uncle. If he didn't look like Sintram, he looked like the other one. The roads are frozen. I mean snowed up, he said. There's just one bottle of port left, and what Captain Calker will say, I dare say I know, but I'd rather not. Damn this weather. God forgive me. That's not right. "'But it is trying, ain't it, my boy?' "'What will you give me for a dozen of port, uncle?' was all my answer. "'Give you? I'll give you Culverwood, you rogue!' "'Done!' I cried. Th "'That is,' stammered my uncle, "'that is,' and he reddened like the funnel of one of his hated steamers, "'that is, you know, always provided, you know. "'It wouldn't be fair to Lady Georgiana now, would it? "'I put it to yourself. "'If she took the trouble, you know, you understand me, my boy.' "'That's of course, uncle,' I said." "'Ah, I see you're a gentleman like your father, "'not to trip a man when he stumbles,' said my uncle. 
for such was the dear old man's sense of honour that he was actually uncomfortable about the hasty promise he had made without first specifying the exception. The exception, you know, has Culverwood at the present hour, and right welcome he is. Of course, uncle, I said, between gentlemen, you know. Still, I want my joke out, too. What will you give me for a dozen of port to tide you over Christmas Day? Give you, my boy? I'll give you— But here he checked himself, as one that had been burned already. Bah, he said, turning his back and going towards the door. What's the use of joking about serious affairs like this? And so he left the room, and I let him go, for I had heard that the road from Liverpool was impassable, the wind and snow having continued every day since that night of which I told you. Meantime, I had never been able to summon the courage to say one word to your mother. I beg her pardon, I mean Miss Thornbury. Christmas Day arrived. My uncle was awful to behold. His friends were evidently anxious about him. They thought he was ill. There was such a hesitation about him, like a shark with a bait, and such a flurry like a whale in his last agonies. He had a horrible secret which he dared not tell, and which yet would come out of its grave at the appointed hour. Down in the kitchen the roast beef and turkey were meeting their desserts. Up in the storeroom, for Lady Georgiana was not above housekeeping any more than her daughter, the ladies of the house were doing their part, and I was oscillating between my uncle and his niece, making myself amazingly useful now to one and now to the other. The turkey and the beef were on the table, nay, they had been well eaten, before I felt that my moment was come. Outside the wind was howling, and driving the snow with soft pats against the window panes. Eager-eyed I watched General Fortescue, who despised sherry or Madeira even during dinner, and would no more touch champagne than he would eau sucre, but drank port after fish or with cheese indiscriminately. With eager eyes I watched how the last bottle dwindled out its fading life in the clear decanter. Glass after glass was supplied to General Fortescue by the fearless coxswain, who, if he might have had his choice, would rather have boarded a Frenchman than waited for what was to follow. My uncle scarcely ate at all, and the only thing that stopped his face from growing longer with the removal of every dish was that nothing but death could have made it longer than it already was. It was my interest to let matters go as far as they might up to a certain point, beyond which it was not my interest to let them go if I could help it. At the same time I was curious to know how my uncle would announce, confess, the terrible fact that in his house, on Christmas Day, having invited his oldest friends to share with him the festivities of the season, there was not one bottle more of port to be had. I waited till the last moment, till I fancied the admiral was opening his mouth like a fish in despair to make his confession. He had not even dared to make a confidant of his wife in such an awful dilemma. Then I pretended to have dropped my table napkin behind my chair, and rising to seek it, stole round behind my uncle and whispered in his ear, "'What will you give me for a dozen of port now, uncle?' "'Bah!' he said. "'I'm at the gratings. Don't torture me. I'm in earnest, uncle.' He looked round at me with a sudden flash of bewildered hope in his eye. In the last agony he was capable of believing in a miracle. But he made me no reply. He only stared. "'Will you give me Kate? I want Kate,' I whispered. "'I will, my boy. That is, if she'll have you. That is, I mean to say, if you produce the true tawny.' "'Of course, uncle. Honor bright, as port in a storm,' I answered, trembling in my shoes and everything else I had on, for I was not more than three parts confident in the result.' The gentleman beside Kate, happening at the moment to be occupied, each with the lady on his other side, I went behind her and whispered to her as I had whispered to my uncle, though not exactly in the same terms. Perhaps I had got a little courage from the champagne I had drunk. Perhaps the presence of the company gave me a kind of mesmeric strength. Perhaps the excitement of the whole venture kept me up. Perhaps Kate herself gave me courage, like a goddess of old in some way I did not understand. At all events I said to her, Kate. We had got so far even then. My uncle hasn't another bottle of port in his cellar. Consider what a state General Fortescue will be in soon. He'll be tipsy for want of it. Will you come and help me to find a bottle or two? She rose at once, with a white rose blush, so delicate I don't believe anyone saw it but myself. But the shadow of a stray ringlet could not fall on her cheek without my seeing it. When we got into the hall the wind was roaring loud, and the few lights were flickering and waving gustily with alternate light and shade across the old portraits which I had known so well as a child. For I used to think what each would say first if he or she came down out of the frame and spoke to me. I stopped, and taking Kate's hand I said, I daren't let you come farther, Kate, before I tell you another thing. My uncle has promised, if I find him a dozen of port, you must have seen what a state the poor man is in, to let me say something to you, 
I suppose he meant your mamma, but I prefer saying it to you if you will let me. Will you come and help me to find the port? She said nothing, but took up a candle that was on a table in the hall, and stood waiting. I ventured to look at her. Her face was now celestial rosy red, and I could not doubt that she had understood me. She looked so beautiful that I stood staring at her without moving. What the servants could have been about that not one of them crossed the hall, I can't think. At last Kate laughed and said, Well, I started, and I dare say took my turn at blushing. At least I did not know what to say. I had forgotten all about the guests inside. Where's the port? said Kate. I caught hold of her hand again and kissed it. You needn't be quite so minute in your account, my dear, said my mother, smiling. I will be more careful in future, my love, returned my father. What do you want me to do? said Kate. Only to hold the candle for me, I answered, restored to my seven senses at last. And taking it from her, I led the way and she followed, till we had passed through the kitchen and reached the cellar stairs. These were steep and awkward, and she let me help her down. Now, Edward, said my mother. Yes, yes, my love, I understand, returned my father. Up to this time your mother had asked no questions, but when we stood in a vast, low cellar which we had made several turns to reach, and I gave her the candle, and took up a great crowbar which lay on the floor, she said at last, Edward, are you going to bury me alive, or what are you going to do? I'm going to dig you out, I said, for I was nearly beside myself with joy, as I struck the crowbar like a battering ram into the wall. You can fancy, John, that I didn't work the worse that Kate was holding the candle for me. Very soon, though with great effort, I had dislodged a brick, and the next blow I gave into the hole sent back a dull echo. I was right. I worked now like a madman, and in a very few minutes more I had dislodged the whole of the brick-thick wall which filled up an archway of stone, and curtained an ancient door in the lock of which the key now showed itself. It had been well greased, and I turned it without much difficulty. I took the candle from Kate, and led her into a spacious region of sawdust, cobweb, and wine fungus. "'There, Kate,' I cried, in delight. "'But,' said Kate, "'will the wine be good?' "'General Fortescue will answer you that,' I returned exultantly. "'Now come, and hold the light again while I find the port bin.' I soon found not one, but several well-filled port bins, which to choose I could not tell. I must chance that. Kate carried a bottle and the candle, and I carried two bottles very carefully. We put them down in the kitchen with orders they should not be touched. We had soon carried the dozen to the hall table by the dining-room door. When at length, with Jacob chuckling and rubbing his hands behind us, we entered the dining-room, Kate and I, for Kate would not part with her share in the joyful business, loaded with a level bottle in each hand which we carefully erected on the sideboard, I presume, from the stare of the company, that we presented a rather remarkable appearance. Kate in her white muslin, and I in my best clothes covered with brick dust and cobwebs and lime, but we could not be half so amusing to them as they were to us. There they sat with the dessert before them, but no wine decanters forthcoming. How long they had sat thus I have no idea. If you think your mamma has, you may ask her. Captain Calker and General Fortescue looked positively white about the gills. My uncle, clinging to the last hope despairingly, had sat still and said nothing, and the guests could not understand the awful delay. Even Lady Georgiana had begun to fear a mutiny in the kitchen, or something equally awful. But to see the flash that passed across my uncle's face when he saw us appear with ported arms, he immediately began to pretend that nothing had been the matter. "'What the deuce has kept you, Ned, my boy?' he said. "'Fair Healy,' he went on, I beg your pardon. Jacob, you can go on decanting. It was very careless of you to forget it. Meantime, Hebe, bring that bottle to General Jupiter there. He's got a corkscrew in the tail of his robe, or I'm mistaken. Out came General Fortescue's corkscrew. I was trembling once more with anxiety. The cork gave the genuine plop. The bottle was lowered. Glug, glug, glug came from its beneficent throat, and out flowed something tawny as a lion's mane. The general lifted it lazily to his lips, saluting his nose on the way. Fifteen, By Jove!' he cried. "'Well, Admiral, this was worth waiting for. Take care how you decant that, Jacob, on peril of your life.' My uncle was triumphant. He winked hard at me not to tell. Kate and I retired, she to change her dress, I to get mine well brushed and my hands washed. By the time I returned to the dining-room, no one had any questions to ask. For Kate, the ladies had gone to the drawing-room before she was ready and I believe she had some difficulty in keeping my uncle's counsel. But she did. Need I say that was the happiest Christmas I ever spent. "'But how did you find the cellar, Papa?' asked Effie. "'Where are your brains, Effie? Don't you remember I told you that I had a dream?' 
Yes, but you don't mean to say that the existence of that wine cellar was revealed to you in a dream. But I do, indeed. I had seen the wine cellar built up just before we left for Madeira. It was my father's plan for securing the wine when the house was let. And very well it turned out for the wine, and me too. I had forgotten all about it. Everything had conspired to bring it to my memory, but had just failed of success. I had fallen asleep under all the influences I told you of. Influences from the region of my childhood. They operated still when I was asleep. And all other distracting influences being removed, at length roused in my sleeping brain the memory of what I had seen. In the morning I remembered not my dream only, but the event of which my dream was a reproduction. Still I was under considerable doubt about the place, and in this I followed the dream only, as near as I could judge. The Admiral kept his word, and interposed no difficulties between Kate and me. Not that, to tell the truth, I was ever very anxious about that rock ahead, but it was very possible that his fastidious honour or pride might have occasioned a considerable interference with our happiness for a time. As it turned out, he could not leave me Culverwood, and I regretted the fact as little as he did himself. His gratitude to me was, however, excessive, assuming occasionally ludicrous outbursts of thankfulness. I do not believe he could have been more grateful if I had saved his ship and its whole crew, for his hospitality was at stake. Kind old man. Here ended my father's story, with a light sigh, a gaze into the bright coals, a kiss of my mother's hand which he held in his, and another glass of burgundy. End of Port in a Storm by George MacDonald Round About Our Coal Fire or Christmas Entertainments by an anonymous author calling himself Dick Merriman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Maggs. Round About Our Coal Fire, Chapter 1. Of mirth and jollity, Christmas gambols, eating, drinking, kissing, and other diversions of the holy days. First, acknowledging the sacredness of the holy time of Christmas, I proceed to set forth the rejoicings which are generally made at that great festival. You must understand, good people, that the manner of celebrating this great course of holy days is vastly different now to what it was in former days. There was once upon a time hospitality in the land. An English gentleman, at the opening of the great day, had all his tenants and neighbours entered his hall by daybreak. The strong beer was broached, and the blackjacks went plentifully about with toast, sugar, nutmeg, and good Cheshire cheese. The rums were embowered with holly, ivy, cypress, bays, laurel, and mistletoe, and a bouncing Christmas log in the chimney, glowing like the cheeks of a country milkmaid. Then was the pewter as bright as Clorinda, and every bit of brass as polished as the most refined gentleman. The servants were running here and there, with merry hearts and jolly countenances. Everyone was busy in welcoming of guests, and looked as smug as new-licked puppies. The lasses were blithe and buxom as the maids in good Queen Bess's days, when they eat sirloins of roast beef for breakfast. Peg would scuttle about to make a toast for John, while Tom run harem scarum to draw a jug of ale for Marjorie. Gaffer Spriggins was bid thrice welcome by the squire, and Goody Goose did not fail of a smacking bust from his worship in memory of past favours, while his son and heir was mousling and tousling the blooming beauties of the tenant's daughters. In a word, the spirit of generosity ran through the whole house. In these times all the spits were sparkling, the hacking must be boiled by daybreak, or else two young men took the maiden by the arms and run around the marketplace, till she was ashamed of her laziness, and what was worse than this, she must not play with the young fellows that day, but stand neuter, like a girl in a winding sheet, at a church door for a bastard child. But now let us inquire a little farther, to arrive at the sense of the thing. This great festival was in former times kept with so much freedom and openness of heart that every one in the country where a gentleman resided 
possessed at least a day of pleasure in the Christmas holy days. The tables were all spread from the first to the last, the sirloins of beef, the mince pies, the plum porridge, the capons, turkeys, geese and plum puddings were all brought upon the board, and those who had sharp stomachs and sharp knives ate heartily and were welcome, which gave rise to the proverb, Merry in the hall when beards wag all. There were then turnspits employed, who by the time dinner was over would look as black and as greasy as a Welsh porridge pot, but the jacks have since turned them all out of doors. The geese, which used to be fattened for the honest neighbours, have been of late sent to London, and the quills made into pens to convey away the landlord's estate. The sheep are drove away to raise money to answer the loss at a game at dice or cards, and their skins made into parchments for deeds and indentures. Nay, even the poor innocent bee, who was used to pay its tribute to the Lord once a year at least in good Metheglin, for the entertainment of the guests, and its wax converted into beneficial plasters for sick neighbours, is now used for the sealing of deeds to his disadvantage. But give me the man who has a good heart in his belly, and has spirit enough to keep up the old way of hospitality, feeds his people till they are plump as partridges and as fat as porpoises, that every servant may appear as jolly as the late Bishop of Winchester's porter at Chelsea, and not keep a parcel of sneaking-looking wretches about them, whose ribs are as apparent as those of a gridiron. What an honour it is to a master to hear the folks about him praising his generosity, and such a character is a help to him sometimes at an election. For servants who are kept under a good-natured direction must love their master, and make the country folks admire him more from their praise of him, for there is always one or other of them setting forth his goodness. It makes the greater impression on those who never saw him, or ever have been at his house. When I speak this, I recollect the fable of the mouse, who helped the lion out of the toil he was caught in, and likewise the common opinion that a mouse may destroy an elephant, Besides another observation, that a mouse may creep where an elephant cannot go, and do good when some people least expect it. Then let all your folks live briskly, and at such a time of rejoicing, enjoy the benefit of good beef and pudding. Let the strong beer be unlocked, and let the piper play, all the hills and far away, and also strike up drowsy gut scrapers, Gallants be ready, each with his lady, etc. For there must be a dance now and then by way of exercise and wit, or else I am sure her low thrombo was in the wrong box, as well as the old ballad woman, who gave you a song and a dance, and all for the price for halfpenny. I have now by me two squires and a sir, who say I am mad to write in this manner, for they are jealous I hint at them. One says to me, when did you ever find me stingy? I believe you have a mind to reflect on my character. A second says, When did I make away my estate by my goose quills, the parchment from my sheep's back, and the wax of my bees? And says the third, And pray, sir, how can you censure me on any account? Have I not treated you with many bottles of claret, and did I not laugh as loud as any one when we were at Hurlow Thrombo together? And then I dropped my subject, as many noted preachers do, and summed up the matter in a few words, viz. Gentlemen, if I have told you of your sins, mend if you can for the future. Let the stingy be generous, let the generous be wise, and let him who is between one and t'other keep his claret to himself if he will, and laugh less when there is nothing to be laughed at. But then it is said, laugh and be fat, which words may be understood thus. If a man has but a mean substance, he can never have any great occasion to laugh, and much less to be fat. But if he has plenty of provender, then the proverb is right, he may laugh that wins, and be fat into the bargain. 
the newspapers inform us that the spirit of hospitality has not quite forsaken us, for three or four of them tell us that several of the gentry are gone down to their respective seats in the country in order to keep their Christmas in the old way and entertain their tenants and trade folks as their ancestors used to do, and I wish them a Merry Christmas accordingly. But I must also take notice to the stingy tribe that if they don't at least make their tenants or tradesmen drink when they come to see them in the Christmas holy days, they have liberty of pissing behind the door, which is a law of very ancient date. A merry gentleman of my acquaintance desires, I will insert, that the old folks in days of yore kept open house at Christmas out of interest, for then, says he, they receive the greatest part of their rent in kind, such as wheat, barley or malt, ox and calf, sheep, swine, turkeys, capons, geese, and such like, and they not having room enough to preserve their grain, or fodder enough to sustain their cattle or poultry, nor markets to sell off the overplus, they were obliged to use them in their own houses, and by treating of the people of the country, gain credit amongst them, and riveted the minds and good will of their neighbours so firmly in them that no one durst venture to oppose them. The squire's will was done whatever came on it, for if he happened to ask a neighbour what it was a clock, they returned with a low scrape, It is what your worship pleases. The dancing and singing of the benches in the great inns of court in Christmas is in some sort founded upon interest, for they hold, as I am informed, some privilege for dancing about the fire in the middle of their hall and singing the song round about our coal fire, etc. This time of year being cold and frosty, generally speaking, or when Jack Frost commonly takes us by the nose, the diversions are within doors, either in exercise or by the fireside. Country dancing is one of the chief exercises, Mole Peakley and the Black Toke are never forgot. These dances stir the blood and give the males and females a fellow feeling of each other's activity, ability and agility. Cupid always sits in the corner of the room where these diversions are transacting and shoots quivers full of arrows at the dancers and makes his own game of them. Then comes mumming or masquerading, when the squire's wardrobe is ransacked for dresses of all kinds, and the coal holes searched around, or corks burnt to black the faces of the fair, or make deputy moustaches, and every one in the family, except the squire himself, must be transformed from what they were. Then begins the freedom between one and t'other to be sprinkled about the hall, and every one shows their wit according to their capacity and then a dance again and a good hearty pull or two at the silver tankard of strong beer, made woody good with sugar and nutmeg. Then Jenny gives you a jig, which is proportionably good as it gives her a band in sweat. Doll in her way gives you a double courant, and turns round fifty times in a minute till most of them are drunk enough and reel home or lie down in the barn. Or else there is a match at Blind Man's Buff, and then it is lawful to set anything in the way for folks to tumble over. Whether it be to break arms, legs, or heads, tis no matter, for neck or nothing, the devil loves no cripples. This play, I am told, was first set on foot by the country bone-setters, who, like some surgeons, when they first set up business in the country, provide two or three pickled halls of figure to pox the parish, both very necessary steps towards gaining good business. As for puss in the corner, that is a very harmless sport, and one may ramp at it as much as one will. For at this game, when a man catches his woman, he may kiss her till her ears crack, or she will be disappointed if she is a woman of any spirit. But if it is one who offers at a struggle and blushes, then be assured she is a prude, for though she won't stand a bus in public, she'll receive it with open arms behind the door, and you may kiss her till she makes your heart ache. The next game to this is questions and commands, 
when the commander may oblige his subject to answer any lawful question and make the same obey him instantly under the penalty of being smutted or paying such forfeit as may be laid on the aggressor. But the forfeit is generally fixed at some certain price, such as a shilling, half a crown, etc., so every one knowing what to do if they should be too stubborn to submit make themselves easy at discretion. At one of these entertainments, I remember a gentleman was commanded to take a certain lady into the next room and make her squeak. He took the lady according to order and was free enough in a modest way. But, madam, says he, why don't you squeak? Sir, answered the lady, you are to make me squeak. But, returns the gentleman, if you don't squeak, I must forfeit. Why don't you make me, says the lady. And, though there was a catch in the room, and he was put to the last push, she would not squeak, and the poor gentleman was forced to pay the forfeit after he had taken so much pains with her. Some would have made him lay down double the money, i.e. one part as a forfeit and the other for socket money. As for the game of hoop and hide, the parties have the liberty of hiding where they will in any part of the house, and if it should prove to be a bed, and if they even then happen to be caught, the dispute ends in kissing, etc. Most of the other diversions are cards and dice, but they are seldom set on foot unless a lawyer is on hand to breed some dispute for him to decide, or at least have some party in. And now I come to another entertainment frequently used, which is of the storytelling order, viz. of hobgoblins, witches, conjurers, ghosts, fairies, and such like common disturbers. End of chapter one of Round About Our Coal Fire. The Same Old Christmas Spirit by Ralph Bergengren. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Don't laugh at Grandfather if he hangs up his stocking. Probably he won't do it. Strong old man that he is, or even a weak old one, he has resisted the temptation a good many seasons, and he will doubtless manage to get through another. But the desire is there, latent. And if he dared do it, borrowing perhaps from Grandma, and got up Christmas morning to find Faith rewarded with a candy cane, few youngsters would feel much happier. Christmas, in fact, is for the young, the old, and all intermediate periods. We lose sight of it temporarily. Buying gifts that we cannot afford, in return for gifts that we do not want, seriously obscures the joy of giving where we wish and receiving from those whom it warms our heart to know have not forgotten us. There are moments when the whole Christmas season seems a business expedient, invented by trade to take advantage of sentiment, sentimentality, and false pride. Santa Claus is a hypocrite, and Christmas exclusively for the rich. And yet... The Christmas spirit is sturdy enough to survive the handicap. It wipes out the unfriendly criticism of the immediately preceding period, leaves something, after the buying and the worrying are over, that is well worth the cost in nervous exhaustion. And Grandfather, although he doesn't admit it for fear of ridicule, would like to hang up his stocking. End of The Same Old Christmas Spirit A Scene of Medieval Christmas by John Addington Simmons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. A Scene of Medieval Christmas. Let us imagine Christmas Day in a medieval town of northern England. The cathedral is only partly finished. Its nave and transepts are the work of Norman architects, but the choir has been destroyed in order to be rebuilt by more graceful designers and more skillful hands. The old city is full of craftsmen assembled to complete the church. Some have come, as a religious duty, to work off their tale of sins by bodily labor. 
some are animated by a love of art simple men who might have rivalled with the greeks in ages of more cultivation others again are well-known carvers brought for hire from distant towns and countries beyond the sea but to-day and for some days past the sound of hammer and chisel has been silent in the choir monks have bustled about the nave dressing it up with holly bows and bushes of yew and preparing a stage for the sacred play they are going to exhibit on the feast day christmas is not like corpus christi and now the market-place stands inches deep in snow so that the miracles must be enacted beneath a roof instead of in the open air and what place so appropriate as the cathedral where poor people may have warmth and shelter while they see the show besides the gloomy old church with its windows darkened by the falling snow lends itself to candlelight effects that will enhance the splendor of the scene everything is ready the incense of morning mass yet lingers round the altar the voice of the friar who told the people from the pulpit the story of christ's birth has hardly ceased to echo time has just been given for a midday dinner and for the shepherds and the farm lads to troop in from the countryside the monks are ready at the wooden stage to draw its curtain, and all the nave is full of eager faces. There you may see the smith and carpenter, the butcher's wife, the country priest, and the grey-cowled friar. Scores of workmen, whose home the cathedral for the time is made, are also here, and you may know the artists by their thoughtful foreheads and keen eyes. That young monk carved Madonna and her son above the southern porch— Beside him stands the master mason, whose strong arms have hewn gigantic images of prophets and apostles for the pinnacles outside the choir. And the little man with cunning eyes between the two is he who cuts such quaint hobgoblins for the gargoyles. He has a vein of satire in him, and his humor overflows into the stone. Many and many a grim beast and hideous head has he hidden among vine leaves and trellis work upon the porches. Those who know him well are loath to anger him, for fear their sons and sons' sons should laugh at them forever caricatured in solid stone. Hark! There sounds the bell. The curtain is drawn, and the candles blaze brightly round the wooden stage. What is this first scene? We have God in heaven, dressed like a pope with triple crown, and attended by his court of angels. They sing and toss up censers till he lifts his hand and speaks. In a long Latin speech he unfolds the order of creation and his will concerning man. At the end of it up leaps an ugly buffoon, in goatskin, with ram's horns upon his head. Some children begin to cry, but the older people laugh, for this is the devil, the clown and comic character, who talks their common tongue and has no reverence before the very throne of heaven. He asks leave to plague men and receives it. Then, with many a curious caper, he goes down to hell beneath the stage. The angels sing and toss their censers as before, and the first scene closes to a sound of organs. The next is more conventional, in spite of some grotesque incidents. It represents the fall. The monks hurry over it quickly, as a tedious but necessary prelude to the birth of Christ. That is the true Christmas part of the ceremony, and it is understood that the best actors and the most beautiful dresses are to be reserved for it. The builders of the choir in particular are interested in the coming scenes, since one of their number has been chosen, for his handsome face and tenor voice, to sing the angel's part. He is a young fellow of nineteen, but his beard is not yet grown, and long hair hangs down upon his shoulders. A chorister of the cathedral, his younger brother will act the Virgin Mary. At last the curtain is drawn. We see a cottage room, dimly lighted by a lamp, and Mary spinning near her bedside. She sings a country air, and goes on working, till a rustling noise is heard, more light is thrown upon the stage, and a glorious creature, in white raiment, with broad golden wings, appears. He bears the lily, and cries, Ave Maria, gratia plena. She does not answer, but stands confused, with down-dropped eyes and timid mien. Gabriel rises from the ground and comforts her, and sings aloud his message of glad tidings. 
Then Mary gathers courage, and kneeling in her turn, thanks God. And when the angel in his radiance disappears, she sings the song of the Magnificat, clearly and simply, in the darkened room. Very soft and silver sounds this hymn through the great church. The women kneel, and children are hushed as by a lullaby. But some of the hinds and prentice lads begin to think it rather dull. They are not sorry when the next scene opens with a sheepfold and a little campfire. Unmistakable bleatings issue from the fold, and five or six common fellows are sitting round the blazing wood. One might fancy they had stepped straight from the church floor to the stage, so natural do they look. Besides, they call themselves by common names, Colin and Tom Liabed and Nimble Dick. Many a round laugh wakes echoes in the church when these shepherds stand up and hold debate about a stolen sheep. Tom Liabed has nothing to remark but that he is very sleepy and does not want to go in search of it tonight. Colin cuts jokes and throws out shrewd suspicions that Dick knows something of the matter, but Dick is sly and keeps them off the scent, although a few of his asides reveal to the audience that he is the real thief. While they are thus talking, silence falls upon the shepherds. Soft music from the church organ breathes, and they appear to fall asleep. The stage is now quite dark, and for a few moments the aisles echo only to the dying melody. When, behold, a ray of light is seen, and splendor grows around the stage from hidden candles, and in the glory Gabriel appears upon a higher platform made to look like clouds. The shepherds wake in confusion, striving to shelter their eyes from this unwanted brilliancy. But Gabriel waves his lily, spreads his great gold wings, and bids good cheer with clarion voice. The shepherds fall to worship, and suddenly, round Gabriel, there gathers a choir of angels, and a song of Gloria in excelsis, to the sound of a deep organ is heard far off. From distant isles it swells, and seems to come from heaven. Through a long, resonant fugue, the glory flies, and as it ceases with complex conclusion, the lights die out, the angels disappear, and Gabriel fades into the darkness. Still the shepherds kneel, rustically chanting a carol half in Latin, half in English, which begins in dolci jubilo. The people know it well, and when the chorus rises with ubi sunt godia, its wild melody is caught by voices up and down the nave. This scene makes deep impression upon many hearts, for the beauty of Gabriel is rare, and few who see him in his angel's dress would know him for the lad who daily carves his lilies and broad water flags about the pillars of the choir. To that simple audience he interprets heaven, and little children will see him in their dreams. Dark winter nights and awful forests will be trodden by his feet, made musical by his melodious voice, and parted by the rustling of his wings. The youth himself may return tomorrow to the workman's blouse and chisel, but his memory lives in many minds, and may form a part of Christmas for the fancy of men as yet unborn. The next drawing of the curtain shows us the stable of Bethlehem crowned by its star. There kneels Mary, and Joseph leans upon his staff. The ox and the ass are close at hand, and Jesus lies in jeweled robes on straw within the manger. To right and left bow the shepherds, worshipping in dumb show, while voices from behind chant a solemn hymn. In the midst of the melody is heard the flourish of trumpets, and heralds step upon the stage, followed by the three crowned kings. They have come from the far east, led by the star. The song ceases, while drums and fifes and trumpets play a stately march. The kings pass by, and do obeisance one by one. Each gives some costly gift, each doffs his crown and leaves it at the Saviour's feet. Then they retire to a distance and worship in silence like the shepherds. Again the angel's song is heard, and while it dies away, the curtain closes and the lights are put out. The play is over and the evening has come. The people must go from the warm church into the frozen snow and crunch their homeward way beneath the moon. But in their minds they carry a sense of light and music and unearthly loveliness. Not a scene of this day's pageant will be lost. It grows within them and creates the poetry of Christmas. Nor must we forget the sculptors who listen to the play. 
we spoke of them minutely, because these mysteries sank deep into their souls and found a way into their carvings on the cathedral walls. The monk who made Madonna by the southern porch will remember Gabriel and place him bending low in a lordly salutation by her side. The painted glass of the chapter house will glow with fiery choirs of angels learned by heart that night. And who does not know the mocking devils and quaint satyrs that the humorous sculptor carved among his fruits and flowers? Some of the miseraries of the stalls still bear portraits of the shepherd thief, and of the ox and ass who blinked so blindly when the kings by torchlight brought their dazzling gifts. Truly these old miracle plays and the carved work of cunning hands that they inspired are worth to us more than all the delicate creations of Italian pencils. Our homely northern churches still retain, for the child who reads their bosses and their sculptured fronts, more Christmas poetry than we can find in Fra Angelico's devoutness or the liveliness of Giotto. Not that southern artists have done nothing for our Christmas. Cimabue's gigantic angels at Assisi and the radiant seraphs of Raphael or of Signorelli were seen by Milton in his Italian journey. He gazed in Romish churches on graceful nativities into which Angelico and Credi threw their simple souls. How much they tinged his fancy we cannot say, but what we know of heavenly hierarchies we later men have learned from Milton, and what he saw he spoke, and what he spoke in sounding verse lives for us now and sways our reason, and controls our fancy, and makes fine art of high theology. End of A Scene of Medieval Christmas by John Addington Simmons A Simple Bill of Fare for a Christmas Dinner by Helen Hunt Jackson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Simple Bill of Fare for a Christmas Dinner All good recipe books give bills of fare for different occasions. Bills of fare for grand dinners, bills of fare for little dinners, dinners to cost so much per head, dinners which can be easily prepared with one servant, and so on. They give bills of fare for one week, bills of fare for each day in a month to avoid too great monotony in diet. There are bills of fare for dyspeptics, bills of fare for consumptives, bills of fare for fat people and bills of fare for thin, and bills of fare for hospitals, asylums, and prisons, as well as for gentlemen's houses. But among them all, we never saw the one which we give below. It has never been printed in any book, but it has been used in families. We are not drawing on our imagination for its items. We have sat at such dinners. We have helped prepare such dinners. We believe in such dinners. They are within everybody's means. In fact, the most marvelous thing about this bill of fare is that the dinner does not cost a cent. Ho, oh, all ye that are hungry and thirsty and would like so cheap a Christmas dinner, listen to this. Bill of fare for a Christmas dinner. First course. Gladness. This must be served hot. No two housekeepers make it alike. No fixed rule can be given for it. It depends, like so many of the best things, chiefly on memory. But strangely enough, it depends quite as much on proper forgetting as on proper remembering. Worries must be forgotten. Troubles must be forgotten. Yes, even sorrow itself must be denied and shut out. Perhaps this is not quite possible. Ah, we all have seen Christmas days on which sorrow would not leave our hearts or our houses. But even sorrow can be compelled to look away from its sorrowing for a festival hour, which is so solemnly joyous as Christ's birthday. Memory can be filled full of other things to be remembered. No soul is entirely destitute of blessings, absolutely without comfort. Perhaps we have but one. Very well, we can think steadily of that one, if we try. 
but the probability is that we have more than we can count. No man has yet numbered the blessings, the mercies, the joys of God. We are all richer than we think, and if we once set ourselves to reckoning up the things of which we are glad, we shall be astonished at their number. Gladness, then, is the first item, the first course on our bill of fare for a Christmas dinner. Entrees Love, garnished with smiles. Gentleness, with sweet wine sauce of laughter. Gracious speech, cooked with any fine savory herbs, such as drollery, which is always in season, or pleasant reminiscence, which no one need be without, as it keeps for years, sealed or unsealed. Second course, hospitality. The precise form of this also depends on individual preferences. We are not undertaking here to give exact recipes, only a bill of fare. In some houses, hospitality is brought on surrounded with relatives. This is very well. In others, it is dished up with dignitaries of all sorts, men and women of position and estate for whom the host has special likings or uses. This gives a fine effect to the eye, but cools quickly and is not in the long run satisfying. In a third class, best of all, it is served in simple shapes, but with a great variety of unfortunate persons, such as lonely people from lodging houses, poor people of all grades, widows and childless in their affliction. This is the kind most preferred, in fact never abandoned by those who have tried it. For dessert, mirth in glasses. Gratitude and faith beaten together and piled up in snowy shapes. These will look light if run overnight in the molds of solid trust and patience. A dish of the bonbons, good cheer and kindliness, with everyday mottos. Knots and reasons in shape of puzzles and answers. The whole ornamented with apples of gold in pictures of silver, of the kind mentioned in the book of Proverbs. This is a short and simple bill of fare. There is not a costly thing in it, not a thing which cannot be procured without difficulty. If meat is desired, it can be added. That is another excellence about our bill of fare. It has nothing in it which makes it incongruous with the richest or the plainest tables. It is not overcrowded by the addition of roast goose or plum pudding. It is not harmed by the addition of herring and potatoes. Nay, it can give flavor and richness to broken bits of stale bread, served on a doorstep and eaten by beggars. We might say much more about this bill of fare. We might perhaps confess that it has an element of the supernatural, that its origin is lost in obscurity, that although, as we said, it has never been printed before, it has been known in all ages that the martyrs feasted upon it, that generations of the poor, called blessed by Christ, have laid out banquets by it, that exiles and prisoners have lived on it, and the despised and forsaken and rejected in all countries have tasted it. It is also true that when any great king ate well and throve on his dinner, it was by the same magic food, the young and the free and the glad and all rich men in costly houses, even they have not been well fed without it. And though we have called it a bill of fare for a Christmas dinner, that is only that men's eyes may be caught by its name, and that they, thinking it a specialty for festival, may learn and understand its secret, and henceforth, laying all their dinners according to its magic order, may eat unto the Lord. End of A Simple Bill of Fare for a Christmas Dinner by Helen Hunt Jackson Recording by Maria Casper The Star by Florence M. Kingsley 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The Star Once upon a time, in a country far away from here, there lived a little girl named Ruth. Ruth's home was not at all like our houses, for she lived in a little tower on top of the great stone wall that surrounded the town of Bethlehem. Ruth's father was the hotel keeper. The Bible says the innkeeper. This inn was not at all like our hotels either. There was a great open yard, which was called the courtyard. All about this yard were little rooms, and each traveller who came to the hotel rented one. The inn stood near the great stone wall of the city, so that as Ruth stood one night, looking out of the tower window, she looked directly into the courtyard. It was truly a strange sight that met her eyes. So many people were coming to the inn, for the king had made a law that every man should come back to the city where his father used to live, to be counted, and to pay his taxes. Some of the people came on the backs of camels, with great rolls of bedding, and their dishes for cooking upon the back of the beast. Some of them came on little donkeys, and on their backs too were the bedding and the dishes. Some of the people came walking, slowly. They were so tired. Many miles some of them had come. As Ruth looked down into the courtyard, she saw the camels being led to their places by their masters. She heard the snap of the whips. She saw the sparks shoot up from the fires that were kindled in the courtyard, where each person was preparing his own supper. She heard the cries of the tired, hungry little children. Presently her mother, who was cooking supper, came over to the window and said, Ruthie, thou shalt hide in the house until all those people are gone. Dost thou understand? Yes, my mother, said the child, and she left the window to follow her mother back to the stove, limping painfully, for little Ruth was a cripple. Her mother stooped suddenly and caught the child in her arms. My poor little lamb, it was a mule's kick just six years ago that hurt your poor back and made you lame. Never mind, my mother. My back does not ache today, and lately when the light of the strange new star has shone down upon my bed, my back has felt so much stronger, and I have felt so happy, as though I could climb upon the rays of the star, and up, up into the sky, and above the stars. Her mother shook her head sadly. Thou art not likely to climb much, now or ever. But come, the supper is ready. Let us go to find your father. I wonder what keeps him. They found the father standing at the gate of the courtyard, talking to a man and woman who had just arrived. The man was tall, with a long beard, and he led by a rope a snow-white mule, on which sat the drooping figure of the woman. As Ruth and her mother came near, they heard the father say, But I tell thee that there is no more room in the inn. Hast thou no friends where thou canst go to spend the night? The man shook his head. No, none, he answered. I care not for myself, but my poor wife. Little Ruth pulled at her mother's dress. Mother, the oxen sleep out under the stars these warm nights, and the straw in the caves is clean and warm. I have made a bed there for my little lamb. Ruth's mother bowed before the tall man. Thou didst hear the child. It is as she says. The straw is clean and warm. The tall man bowed his head. We shall be very glad to stay. And he helped the sweet-faced woman down from the donkey's back, and led her away to the cave stable, while the little Ruth and her mother hurried up the stairs that they might send a bowl of porridge to the sweet-faced woman, and a sup of new milk as well. That night, when little Ruth lay down in her bed, the rays of the beautiful new star shone through the window more brightly than before. They seemed to soothe the tired, aching shoulders. She fell asleep and dreamed that the beautiful, bright star burst, and out of it came countless angels who sang in the night. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, good will to men. And then it was morning, and her mother was bending over her and saying, Awake, awake, little Ruth, mother has something to tell thee. Then, as the eyes opened slowly, 
the angels came in the night little one and left a baby to lay beside your little white lamb in the manger that afternoon ruth went with her mother to the fountain the mother turned aside to talk to the other women of the town about the strange things heard and seen the night before but ruth went on and sat down by the edge of the fountain the child was not frightened for strangers came often to the well but never had she seen men who looked like the three who now came towards her the first one a tall man with a long white beard came close to ruth and said canst tell us child where is born he that is called the king of the jews i know of no king she answered but last night while the star was shining the angels brought a baby to lie beside my white lamb in the manger the stranger bowed his head that must be he wilt thou show us the way to him my child so ruth ran and her mother led the three men to the cave and when they saw the child they rejoiced with exceeding great joy and opening their gifts they presented unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh with wonderful jewels so that ruth's mother's eyes shone with wonder but little ruth saw only the baby which lay asleep on its mother's breast if only i might hold him in my arms she thought but was afraid to ask after a few days the strangers left bethlehem all but the three the man whose name was joseph and mary his wife and the baby then as of old little ruth played about the courtyard and the white lamb frolicked at her side often she dropped to her knees to press the little woolly white head against her breast while she murmured my little lamb my very very own i love you lammy and then together they would steal over to the entrance of the cave to peep in at the baby and always she thought if i only might touch his hand but was afraid to ask one night as she lay in her bed she thought to herself oh i wish i had a beautiful gift for him such as the wise men brought but i have nothing at all to offer and i love him so much just then the light of the star which was nightly fading fell across the foot of the bed and shone full upon the white lamb which lay asleep at her feet and then she thought of something the next morning she arose with her face shining with joy she dressed carefully and with the white lamb held close to her breast went slowly and painfully down the stairway and over to the door of the cave i have come she said to worship him and i have brought him my white lamb the mother smiled at the lame child then she lifted the baby from her breast and placed him in the arms of the little maid who knelt at her feet a few days after an angel came to the father joseph and told him to take the baby and hurry to the land of egypt for the wicked king wanted to do it harm and so these three the father mother and baby went by night to the far country of egypt and the star grew dimmer and dimmer and passed away forever from the skies over bethlehem but little ruth grew straight and strong and beautiful as the almond trees in the orchard and all the people who saw her were amazed for ruth was once a cripple it was the light of the strange star her mother said but little ruth knew it was the touch of the blessed christ child who was once folded against her heart end of the star by florence m kingsley Thurlow's Christmas Story by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. 1. Being the Statement of Henry Thurlow, Author, to George Carrier, Editor of The Idler, a weekly journal of human interest. I've always maintained, my dear Carrier, that if a man wishes to be considered sane and has any particular regard for his reputation as a truth-teller, he would better keep silent as to the singular experiences that enter into his life. I have had many such experiences myself, but I have rarely confided them in detail, or otherwise, to those about me, 
because I know that even the most trustful of my friends would regard them merely as the outcome of an imagination unrestrained by conscience, or of a gradually weakening mind subject to hallucinations. I know them to be true, but until Mr. Edison or some other modern wizard has invented a searchlight strong enough to lay bare the secrets of the mind and conscience of man, I cannot prove to others that they are not pure fabrications, or at least the conjurings of a diseased fancy. For instance, no man would believe me if I were to state to him the plain and indisputable fact that one night last month, on my way up to bed shortly after midnight, having been neither smoking nor drinking, I saw, confronting me upon the stairs, with the moonlight streaming through the windows back of me, lighting up its face, a figure in which I recognized my very self in every form and feature. I might describe the chill of terror that struck to the very marrow of my bones and well-nigh forced me to stagger backward down the stairs, as I noticed in the face of this confronting figure every indication of all the bad qualities which I know myself to possess of every evil instinct, which by no easy effort I have repressed heretofore, and realized that that thing was, as far as I knew, entirely independent of my true self, in which I hope at least the moral has made an honest fight against the immoral, always. I might describe this chill, I say, as vividly as I felt it at that moment, but it would be of no use to do so, because, however realistic it might prove as a bit of description, no man would believe that the incident really happened. And yet, it did happen, as truly as I write, and it has happened a dozen times since, and I am certain that it will happen many times again, though I would give all that I possess to be assured that never again should that disquieting creation of mind or matter, whichever it may be, cross my path. The experience has made me afraid almost to be alone, and I have found myself unconsciously and uneasily glancing at my face in mirrors, in the plate glass of show windows on the shopping streets of the city, fearful lest I should find some of those evil traits which I have struggled to keep under, and have kept under so far, cropping out there where all the world, all my world, can see and wonder at it, having known me always as a man of right doing and right feeling." Many a time in the night the thought has come to me with prostrating force. What if that thing were to be seen and recognized by others, myself, and yet not my whole self, my unworthy self, unrestrained, and yet recognizable as Henry Thurlow? I have also kept silent as to that strange condition of affairs which has tortured me in my sleep for the past year and a half. No one but myself has until this writing known that for that period of time I have had a continuous logical dream life, a life so vivid and so dreadfully real to me that I have found myself at times wondering which of the two lives I was living and which I was dreaming, a life in which that other wicked self has dominated and forced me to a career of shame and horror, a life which, being taken up every time I sleep, where it ceased with the awakening from a previous sleep, has made me fear to close my eyes in forgetfulness when others are near at hand, lest, sleeping, I shall let fall some speech that, striking on their ears, shall lead them to believe that in secret there is some wicked mystery connected with my life. It would be of no use for me to tell these things. It would merely serve to make my family and my friends uneasy about me if they were told in their awful detail, and so I have kept silent about them. To you alone, and now for the first time, have I hinted as to the troubles which have oppressed me for many days, and to you they are confided, only because the demand you have made that I explain to you the extraordinary complication in which the Christmas story sent you last week has involved me. You know that I am a man of dignity, that I am not a schoolboy and a lover of childish tricks, and knowing that your friendship at least should have restrained your tongue and pen when, through the former on Wednesday, you accused me of perpetrating a trifling, and to you excessively embarrassing practical joke, a charge which at the moment I was too overcome to refute, and through the latter on Thursday you reiterated the accusation, coupled with a demand for an explanation of my conduct satisfactory to yourself or my immediate resignation from the staff of the idler. 
To explain is difficult, for I am certain that you will find the explanation too improbable for credence, but explain I must. The alternative, that of resigning from your staff, affects not only my own welfare, but that of my children, who must be provided for, and if my post with you is taken from me, then are all resources gone. I have not the courage to face dismissal, for I have not sufficient confidence in my powers to please elsewhere to make me easy in my mind, or, if I could please elsewhere, the certainty of finding the immediate employment of my talents which is necessary to me, in view of the at present overcrowded condition of the literary field. To explain, then, my seeming jest at your expense, hopeless as it appears to be, is my task, and to do so as completely as I can, let me go back to the very beginning. In August, you informed me that you would expect me to provide, as I have heretofore been in the habit of doing, a story for the Christmas issue of The Idler, that a certain position in the makeup was reserved for me, and that you had already taken steps to advertise the fact that the story would appear. I undertook the commission, and upon seven different occasions set about putting the narrative into shape. I found great difficulty, however, in doing so. For some reason or other, I could not concentrate my mind upon the work. No sooner would I start in on one story than a better one in my estimation would suggest itself to me, and all the labor expended on the story already begun would be cast aside, and the new story set in motion. Ideas were plenty enough, but to put them properly upon paper seemed beyond my powers. One story, however, I did finish. But after it had come back to me from my typewriter, I read it and was filled with consternation to discover that it was nothing more nor less than a mass of jumbled sentences conveying no idea to the mind. A story which had seemed to me in the writing to be coherent had returned to me as a mere bit of incoherence, formless, without ideas, a bit of raving. It was then that I went to you and told you, as you remember, that I was worn out and needed a month of absolute rest, which you granted. I left my work wholly and went into the wilderness where I could be entirely free from everything suggesting labor and where no summons back to town could reach me. I fished and hunted, I slept, and although, as I have already said, in my sleep I found myself leading a life that was not only not to my taste but horrible to me in many particulars, I was able, at the end of my vacation, to come back to town greatly refreshed, and as far as my feelings went, ready to undertake any amount of work. For two or three days after my return, I was busy with other things. On the fourth day after my arrival, you came to me, and said that the story must be finished at the very latest by October 15th, and I assured you that you should have it by that time. That night I set about it. I mapped it out, incident by incident and before starting up to bed had actually written some twelve or fifteen hundred words of the opening chapter. It was to be told in four chapters. When I had gone thus far, I experienced a slight return of one of my nervous chills, and on consulting my watch discovered that it was after midnight, which was a sufficient explanation of my nervousness. I was merely tired. I arranged my manuscripts on my table so that I might easily take up the work the following morning. I locked up the windows and doors, turned out the lights, and proceeded upstairs to my room. It was then that I first came face to face with myself, that other self, in which I recognized developed to the full every bit of my capacity for an evil life. Conceive of the situation if you can. Imagine the horror of it, and then ask yourself if it was likely that when next morning came I could, by any possibility, bring myself to my work table in fit condition to prepare for you anything at all worthy of publication in the idler. I tried. I implore you to believe that I did not hold lightly the responsibilities of the commission you had entrusted to my hands. You must know that if any of your writers has a full appreciation of the difficulties which are strewn along the path of an editor, I, who have myself had an editorial experience, have it, and so would not, in the nature of things, do anything to add to your troubles. You cannot but believe that I have made an honest effort to fulfill my promise to you. But it was useless, and for a week after that visitation was it useless for me to attempt the work. At the end of the week, I felt better, and again I started in, and the story developed satisfactorily until it came again. 
That figure which was my own figure, that face which was the evil counterpart of my own countenance, again rose up before me, and once more was I plunged into hopelessness. Thus matters went on until the 14th of October, when I received your peremptory message that the story must be forthcoming the following day. Needless to tell you that it was not forthcoming, but what I must tell you, since you do not know it, is that on the evening of the 15th day of October, a strange thing happened to me, and in the narration of that incident, which I almost despair of your believing, lies my explanation of the discovery of October 16th, which has placed my position with you in peril. At half-past seven o'clock on the evening of October 15th, I was sitting in my library trying to write. I was alone. My wife and children had gone away on a visit to Massachusetts for a week. I had just finished my cigar and had taken my pen in hand when my front doorbell rang. Our maid, who is usually prompt in answering summonses of this nature, apparently did not hear the bell, for she did not respond to its clanging. Again the bell rang, and still did it remain unanswered, until finally, at the third ringing, I went to the door myself. On opening it, I saw standing before me a man of, I should say, fifty-odd years of age, tall, slender, pale-faced, and clad in somber black. He was entirely unknown to me. I had never seen him before, but he had about him such an air of pleasantness and wholesomeness that I instinctively felt glad to see him, without knowing why or whence he had come. "'Does Mr. Thurlow live here?' he asked. "'You must excuse me for going into what may seem to you to be petty details, but by a perfectly circumstantial account of all that happened that evening alone can I hope to give a semblance of truth to my story.' and that it must be truthful, I realize as painfully as you do. I am Mr. Thurlow, I replied. Henry Thurlow, the author, he said, with a surprised look upon his face. Yes, said I, and then, impelled by the strange appearance of surprise on the man's countenance, I added, don't I look like an author? He laughed, and candidly admitted that I was not the kind of looking man he had expected to find from reading my books, and then he entered the house in response to my invitation that he do so. I ushered him into my library, and after asking him to be seated, inquired as to his business with me. His answer was gratifying, at least. He replied that he had been a reader of my writings for a number of years, and that for some time past he had had a great desire, not to say curiosity, to meet me and tell me how much he had enjoyed certain of my stories. I'm a great devourer of books, Mr. Thurlow, he said, and I have taken the keenest delight in reading your verses and humorous sketches. I may go further and say to you that you have helped me over many a hard place in my life by your work. At times when I felt myself worn out with my business or face to face with some knotty problem in my career, I found much relief in picking up and reading your books at random. They've helped me to forget my weariness or my knotty problems for the time being, and today, finding myself in this town, I resolved to call upon you this evening and thank you for all that you have done for me. Thereupon, we became involved in a general discussion of literary men and their works, and I found that my visitor certainly did have a pretty thorough knowledge of what has been produced by the writers of today. I was quite won over to him by his simplicity, as well as attracted to him by his kindly opinion of my own efforts, and I did my best to entertain him showing him a few of my little literary treasures in the way of autograph letters, photographs, and presentation copies of well-known books from the authors themselves. From this we drifted naturally and easily into a talk on the methods of work adopted by literary men. He asked me many questions as to my own methods, and when I had in a measure outlined to him the manner of life which I had adopted, telling him of my days at home, how little detail office work I had, he seemed much interested with the picture. Indeed, I painted the picture of my daily routine in almost two perfect colors, for when I had finished, he observed quietly that I appeared to him to lead the ideal life, and added that he supposed I knew very little on happiness. The remark recalled to me the dreadful reality, that through some perversity of faith I was doomed to visitations of an uncanny order which were practically destroying my usefulness in my profession and my sole financial resource. Well, I replied, as my mind reverted to the unpleasant predicament in which I found myself, I can't say that I know little unhappiness. As a matter of fact, I know a great deal of that undesirable thing. 
At the present moment, I am very much embarrassed through my absolute inability to fulfill a contract into which I have entered, and which should have been filled this morning. I was due today with a Christmas story. The presses are waiting for it, and I am utterly unable to write it. He appeared deeply concerned at the confession. I had hoped, indeed, that he might be sufficiently concerned to take his departure, that I might make one more effort to write the promised story. His solicitude, however, showed itself in another way. Instead of leaving me, he ventured the hope that he might aid me. "'What kind of a story is it to be?' he asked. "'Oh, the usual ghostly tale,' I said, with a dash of the Christmas flavor thrown in here and there to make it suitable to the season. "'Ah,' he observed, "'and you find your vein worked out?' It was a direct and perhaps impertinent question, but I thought it best to answer it, and to answer it as well without giving him any clue as to the real facts." I could not very well take an entire stranger into my confidence and describe to him the extraordinary encounters I was having with an uncanny other self. He would not have believed the truth, hence I told him an untruth and assented his proposition. Yes, I replied, the vein is worked out. I have written ghost stories for years now, serious and comic, and I am today at the end of my tether, compelled to move forward, and yet held back. That accounts for it, he said simply. When I first saw you tonight at the door, I could not believe that the author who had provided me with so much merriment could be so pale and worn, and seemingly mirthless. Pardon me, Mr. Thurlow, for my lack of consideration when I told you that you did not appear as I had expected to find you. I smiled my forgiveness, and he continued, It, it may be, he said, with a show of hesitation, it may be that I have come not altogether inopportunely. Perhaps I can help you. I smiled again. I should be most grateful if you could, I said. But you doubt my ability to do so, he put in. Oh, well, yes, of course you do, and why shouldn't you? Nevertheless, I have noticed this. At times, when I have been baffled in my work, a mere hint from another, from one who knew nothing of my work, has carried me on to a solution of my problem. I've read most of your writings, and I've thought over some of them many a time, and... I have even had ideas for stories which, in my own conceit, I have imagined were good enough for you, and I have wished that I possessed your facility with the pen that I might make of them myself what I thought you would make of them, had they been ideas of your own. The gentleman's pallid face reddened as he said this, and while I was hopeless as to anything of value resulting from his ideas, I could not resist the temptation to hear what he had to say further. His manner was so deliciously simple and his desire to aid me so manifest. He rattled on with suggestions for a half hour. Some of them were good, but none were new. Some were irresistibly funny and did me good because they made me laugh, and I hadn't laughed naturally for a period so long that it made me shudder to think of it, fearing lest I should forget how to be mirthful. Finally, I grew tired of his persistence, and, with a very ill-concealed impatience, told him plainly that I could do nothing with his suggestions, thanking him, however, for the spirit of kindliness which had prompted him to offer them. He appeared somewhat hurt, but immediately desisted, and when nine o'clock came, he rose up to go. As he walked to the door, he seemed to be undergoing some mental struggle, to which, with a sudden resolve, he finally succumbed, for after having picked up his hat and stick and donned his overcoat, he turned to me and said, Mr. Thurlow, I don't want to offend you. On the contrary, it is my dearest wish to assist you. You have helped me as I have told you. Why may I not help you? I assure you, sir, I began when he interrupted me. One moment, please, he said, putting his hand into the inside pocket of his black coat and extracting from it an envelope addressed to me. Let me finish. It is the whim of one who has an affection for you. For ten years, I have secretly been at work myself on a story. It is a short one, but it has seemed good to me. I had a double object in seeking you out tonight. I wanted not only to see you, but to read my story to you. No one knows that I have written it. I had intended it as a surprise to my, well, to my friends. I had hoped to have it published somewhere, and I had come here to seek your advice in the matter. It is a story which I have written and rewritten and rewritten time and time again in my leisure moments during the ten years past, as I have told you. It is not likely that I shall ever write another. I am proud of having done it, but I should be prouder yet if it, if it could in some way help you. I leave it with you, sir, to print or to destroy, and if you print it, 
To see it in type will be enough for me. To see your name signed to it will be a matter of pride to me. No one will be ever the wiser, for as I say, no one knows I have written it. And I promise you that no one shall know of it if you decide to do as I not only suggest but ask you to do. No one would believe me after it has appeared as yours, even if I should forget my promise and claim it as my own. Take it. It is yours. You are entitled to it as a slight measure of repayment for the debt of gratitude I owe you. He pressed the manuscript into my hands, and before I could reply, had opened the door and disappeared into the darkness of the street. I rushed to the sidewalk and shouted out to him to return, but I might as well have saved my breath and spared the neighborhood, for there was no answer. Holding his story in my hand, I re-entered the house and walked back into my library, where, sitting and reflecting upon the curious interview, I realized for the first time that I was in entire ignorance as to my visitor's name and address. I opened the envelope, hoping to find them, but they were not there. The envelope contained merely a finely written manuscript of thirty-odd pages, unsigned. And then I read the story. When I began, it was with a half-smile upon my lips and with a feeling that I was wasting my time. The smile soon faded, however. After reading the first paragraph, there was no question of wasted time. The story was a masterpiece. It is needless to say to you that I am not a man of enthusiasms. It is difficult to arouse that emotion in my breast, but upon this occasion I yielded to a force too great for me to resist. I have read the tales of Hoffman and of Poe, the wondrous romances of de la Motte Fouque, the unfortunately little-known tales of the lamented Fitz James O'Brien. The weird tales of writers of all tongues have been thoroughly sifted by me in the course of my reading. And I say to you now that in the whole of my life, I never read one story, one paragraph, one line that could approach in vivid delineation, in weirdness of conception, in anything, in the quality which goes to make up the truly great story, that story which came into my hands as I have told you. I read it once and was amazed. I read it a second time and was tempted. It was mine. The writer himself had authorized me to treat it as if it were my own had voluntarily sacrificed his own claim to its authorship that he might relieve me of my very pressing embarrassment. And not only this, he had almost intimated that in putting my name to his work I should be doing him a favor. Why not do so then, I asked myself, and immediately my better self rejected the idea as impossible. How could I put out as my own another man's work and retain my self-respect? I resolved on another and better course to send you the story in lieu of my own, with a full statement of the circumstances under which it had come into my possession, when that demon rose up out of the floor at my side, this time more evil of aspect than before, more commanding in its manner. With a groan I shrank back into the cushions of my chair, and by passing my hands over my eyes tried to obliterate forever the offending sight. But it was useless. The uncanny thing approached me, and as truly as I write, sat upon the edge of my couch, where for the first time it addressed me. Fool, it said, how can you hesitate? Here is your position. You have made a contract which must be filled. You are already behind and in a hopeless mental state. Even granting that between this and tomorrow morning you could put together the necessary number of words to fill the space allotted to you, what kind of a thing do you think that story would make? It would be a mere raving like that other precious effort of August. The public, if by some odd chance it ever reached them, would think your mind was utterly gone. Your reputation would go with that verdict. On the other hand, if you do not have the story ready by tomorrow, your hold on the idler will be destroyed. They have their announcements printed, and your name and portrait appear among those of the prominent contributors. Do you suppose the editor and publisher will look leniently upon your failure? Considering my past record, yes, I replied, I have never yet broken a promise to them. Which is precisely the reason why they will be severe with you. You, who have been regarded as one of the few men who can do almost any kind of literary work at will, you, of whom it is said that your brains are on tap, will they be lenient with you? Bah! Can't you see that the very fact of your invariable readiness heretofore is going to make your present unreadiness a thing incomprehensible? 
Then what shall I do? I asked. If I can't, I can't. That is all. You can. There's the story in your hands. Think what it will do for you. It is one of the immortal stories. You've read it then? I asked. Haven't you? Yes, but... It is the same, it said, with a leer and a contemptuous shrug. You and I are inseparable. Aren't you glad? It added, with a laugh that grated on every fiber of my being. I was too overwhelmed to reply, and it resumed. It is one of the immortal stories. We agree to that. Published over your name, your name will live. The stuff you write yourself will give you present glory, but when you've been dead ten years, people won't remember your name even, unless I get control of you, and in that case, there is a very pretty, though hardly a literary record in store for you. Again it laughed harshly, and I buried my face in the pillows of my couch, hoping to find relief there from this dreadful vision. Curious, it said. What you call your decent self doesn't dare look me in the eye. What a mistake people make who say that the man who won't look you in the eye is not to be trusted, as if mere brazenness were a sign of honesty. Really, the theory of decency is the most amusing thing in the world. But come, your time is growing short. Take that story. The writer gave it to you, begged you to use it as your own. It is yours. It will make your reputation and save you with your publishers. How can you hesitate? I shall not use it, I cried desperately. You must consider your children. Suppose you lose your connection with these publishers of yours. But it would be a crime. Not a bit of it. Whom do you rob? A man who voluntarily came to you and gave you that of which you rob him. Think of it as it is, and act. Only act quickly. It is now midnight. The tempter rose up and walked to the other end of the room, whence, while he pretended to be looking over a few of my books and pictures, I was aware he was eyeing me closely, and gradually compelling me by sheer force of will to do a thing which I abhorred. And I, I struggled weakly against the temptation, but gradually, little by little, I yielded, and finally succumbed altogether. Springing to my feet, I rushed to the table, seized my pen, and signed my name to the story. There, I said, it is done. I have saved my position and made my reputation and am now a thief. As well as a fool, said the other calmly. You don't mean to say you are going to send that manuscript in as it is. Good Lord, I cried. What under heaven have you been trying to make me do for the last half hour? Act like a sane being, said the demon. If you send that manuscript to Courier, he'll know in a minute it isn't yours. He knows you have it in amanuensis, and that handwriting isn't yours. Copy it. True, I answered. I haven't much of a mind for details tonight. I will do as you say. I did so. I got out my pad and pen and ink, and for three hours diligently applied myself to the task of copying the story. When it was finished, I went over it carefully, made a few minor corrections, signed it, put it in an envelope, addressed it to you, stamped it, and went out to the mailbox on the corner where I dropped it into the slot and returned home. When I had returned to my library, my visitor was still there. Well, it said, I wish you'd hurry and complete this affair. I am tired and wish to go. You can't go too soon to please me, said I, gathering up the original manuscripts of the story and preparing to put them away in my desk. Probably not, it sneered. I'll be glad to go too, but I can't go until that manuscript is destroyed. As long as it exists, there is evidence of your having appropriated the work of another. Why can't you see that? Burn it. I can't see my way clear in crime, I retorted. It is not in my line. Nevertheless, realizing the value of his advice, I thrust the pages one by one into the blazing log fire and watched them as they flared and flamed and grew to ashes. As the last page disappeared in the embers, the demon vanished. I was alone and throwing myself down for a moment's reflection upon my couch, was soon lost in sleep. It was noon when I again opened my eyes, and ten minutes after I awakened, your telegraphic summons reached me. Come down at once, was what you said, and I went, and then came the terrible denouement, and yet a denouement which was pleasing to me since it relieved my conscience. You handed me the envelope containing the story. Did you send that? was your question. I did, last night, or rather early this morning. I mailed it about three o'clock, I replied. I demand an explanation of your conduct, said you. Of what? I asked. 
Look at your so-called story and see. If this is a practical joke, Thurlow, it's a damned poor one. I opened the envelope and took from it the sheets I had sent you, twenty-four of them. They were every one of them as blank as when they left the paper mill. You know the rest. You know that I tried to speak, that my utterance failed me, and that, finding myself unable at the time to control my emotions, I turned and rushed madly from the office, leaving the mystery unexplained. You know that you wrote, demanding a satisfactory explanation of the situation, or my resignation from your staff. This, carrier, is my explanation. It is all I have. It is absolute truth. I beg you to believe it, for if you do not, then is my condition a hopeless one. You will ask me, perhaps, for a resume of the story which I thought I had sent you. It is my crowning misfortune that, upon that point, my mind is an absolute blank. I cannot remember it in form or in substance. I have racked my brains for some recollection of some small portion of it to help make my explanation more credible. But alas, it will not come back to me. If I were dishonest, I might fake up a story to suit the purpose, but I am not dishonest. I came near to doing an unworthy act. I did do an unworthy thing, but by some mysterious provision of fate, my conscience is cleared of that. Be sympathetic, Carrier, or, if you cannot, be lenient with me this time. Believe, 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 I implore you. Pray let me hear from you at once. Signed, Henry Thurlow. 2. Being a note from George Carrier, editor of The Idler, to Henry Thurlow, author. Your explanation has come to hand. As an explanation, it isn't worth the paper it is written on, but we are all agreed here that it is probably the best bit of fiction you ever wrote. It is accepted for the Christmas issue. Enclosed, please find check for $100. Dawson suggests that you take another month up in the Adirondacks. You might put in your time writing up some account of that dream life you are leading while you are there. It seems to me there are possibilities in the idea. The concern will pay all expenses. What do you say? Signed, yours ever, G.C. End of Thurlow's Christmas Story by John Kendrick Bangs Recording by Colleen McMahon The Christmas Pie by Anonymous This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Christmas Pie They may talk as they list of their pies and their patties, their hoe cake and oat cake, galettes and gateau. Their mince pie of all cakes the aristocrat is, the best of the lot as each epicure knows. Tis lined with prime beef, with good fruit for relief, nutmeg and currants and spices e now, well seasoned, the season will do it fair reason, e'en majesty honors the mince pie I trow. Tis the pie of old Christmas, both savory and stable, unworthy to pine neath confectioner's yoke, most warmly tis welcome to every table, which hails Merry Christmas with good cheer and joke even the humblest cottage will postpone its potage for once in the year to rejoice in the pie and little jack horner who sat in a corner could very well all of its beauties decry ay the twelfth cake so proud the admired of the crowd need crow not so loud or the pie that we laud though its sugar crush sheen with lord's commons and queen are characters which we can fairly applaud between me and you it derives half its goo from the fun that surroundeth on festival night but the choicest of spirits will ne'er deem its merits above the prime mince pie the schoolboy's delight and though our land hath with adversity striven and stoutly must strive to the last crack of doom though famine's foul car o'er one island hath driven and flings o'er the other forebodings of gloom yet still let us hope that from heaven's high cope fair plenty may come on the pinions of spring that cirrus shall nourish and commerce shall flourish and england her heart hymns of jubilee sing end of the christmas pie by anonymous